the lady's spell. Written by Fanny Finch and published by Starfall Publications. Manifestos of Love Series Book One. Available on Amazon and free with Kindle Unlimited. Enjoy. Chapter One. Clara Dorset, 1801. Have you not heard? Heard what? Clara asked her friend as she reached across the table and lifted her teacup to her lips. These afternoon tea parties had become so full of gossip as of late. Clara had often gritted her teeth as she listened to such talk. You've not heard who is returning to town? Oh, it must excite you, for it has excited every other lady in town, I am sure of it. Miss Withers was excitable herself as she began to cut cake for her guests, so eager in her task that she added more than one slice of cake to each plate without noticing. Clara bit her lip to stop herself from laughing. Pushing back the few loose locks of her light brown hair, she angled away from the table where the fine ladies sat and sought out another in the room. Sitting by the door, along with the other maids, was one of her closest friends in the world, Betchy. The ladies' maid caught Clara's eye, and as Clara cast her gaze up to the heavens, as if pleading for help to be free of all this gossip, Betchy giggled and covered her lips hiding her smile from the other maids. Are you certain he is to return? Miss Harriet Pilkington asked, leaning so far forward that she bumped Clara's arm. Clara sat back trying to get out of the way, realising she had missed part of the conversation in her effort to communicate with Betsy across the room. Who is coming to town? I am, quite certain, Miss Withers declared buoyantly, sitting so tall that her pointed chin looked all the more angular. Clara could see Miss Withers was quite enjoying being the centre of attention, as she had such tasty news to share. I heard it from his parents. There can be no denying that he is to return. All at once, the five other ladies around the table tittered and began to whisper. Clara chewed her lip, holding her tongue, for she was rather reminded of the hens clucking on one of her father's tenants' farms. The ladies tittered but didn't seem to say much. I'm not quite one of them, am I? It was a fear Clara had always had. Her father said she lacked confidence, but her brother Daniel had said more than once she was merely shy. Either way, Clara preferred her own company and the company of those she could trust, such as Betchy, who was now making faces at her across the room in order to distract her from the gossip. Clara lifted her teacup to her lips and hid her smile behind the porcelain rim. Lady Clara, are you not intrigued by the idea? Miss Pilkington asked at her side, with her grey eyes going wide. I thought he was your friend once. My friend. Clara realised she should have probably paid attention before, for she was lost now. Who exactly are we talking about? Goodness. Have you forgotten your friend already since he left? Ha! Ah. Miss Pilkington laughed boldly before she seemed to think better of opening her mouth so wide and instantly covered it. Clara knew that feeling, fearing you were being judged for a slip in composure. Self-consciously, she adjusted the cuffs of her long-sleeved gown and rearranged the cutlery beside her cake plate so everything was sitting as it should. I would have thought you impatient to see your friend again. What friend are we speaking of? Clara asked now determined to join in the conversation properly. The future Baron of Aldington, of course. Horatio Fitzroy, Miss Withers explained, flapping her hand in Clara's direction as if she was a fool for not paying attention earlier. Oh! Clara held herself very still, with her fingers tightening around her teacup. Mr Horatio Fitzroy. It had been a few years since she had seen him for he'd attended university and then travelled to the continent for a grand tour. She'd heard much of him from his parents, for they were good friends with her own parents, but she had not seen him since the days they had been children together. Thrust in each other's company when their parents called on one another, the friendship had started out tentative, for they had been so young. Clara could still remember the first day they had met, for she had been playing with her peg dolls when her brother had broken one of them. Seeing her cry, 
Horatio had endeavoured to fix the toy for her. From that moment on, they had been good friends, until the day he left. Are the two of you not friends? Miss Withers asked, her dark brows pinning together. I understood from the gossip that you were. We were, Clara said coolly, finding she bristled at the idea people had gossiped about her. But I have not seen Mr Fitzroy for many years now. In truth, I do not really know who he is any more. She shrugged off the idea, not wanting the ladies who were looking at her with eager expectation to ask her more questions about him. I will not partake in gossip. I have heard many things about him, a lady said from across the table, bending her head forward the way a blackbird would, cocking its head to the side, listening carefully. How many of these things are true, Miss Campbell? Miss Withers asked dismissively, clearly thinking that she was the authority on gossip. Who can say for sure? Miss Campbell shrugged her shoulders and leaned over her teacup, lowering her voice as if she were to talk of the greatest scandal, even though the group was quite alone in the room apart from their maids. I hear he has made something of a name for himself on his grand tour. My cousin met him when they were overseas. What sort of name? Clara asked, trying not to sound overly interested. He is quite the rogue, Miss Campbell said with a delighted giggle. I hear there was not a lady in Paris who wasn't charmed by him. Handsome, they say, and so charming that ladies would swoon at his feet. Clara sat very still with her mouth hung open as her heart began to thud harder in her chest. She could still remember the last time she had seen Horatio. She had been but fifteen at the time, and he had come to say goodbye, kissing her hand in parting. That kiss had meant so much to her. Many nights had she stayed awake, thinking of such a kiss. My foolish heart will not be so foolish this time, she reprimanded herself. Maybe once she let her childish fancy for Horatio run away with her, but she would not allow her heart to do anything so careless again. She'd keep her heart locked tight in her chest, as if it was bound there by brambles, untouchable and likely to injure. A rogue? My goodness! Miss Pilkington gasped. Are there any scandals that we know of? None specifically, Miss Campbell went on. Yet my cousin did say he was known to spend his time in the company of many ladies. As all the ladies at the table giggled at the idea, delighted by the gossip, Clara could not join in the laughter. It seemed the Horatio she had once known was now much changed. The boy who had been quite wild, running across the estate with her, riding with abandon and fervour, was now a gentleman who preferred to turn a lady's head. I wonder how many ladies he's persuaded to share his company. Clara couldn't explain her envy as she downed her teacup. After all, she had not seen Horatio for four years. By now, surely her heart was safe from him. I must admit a fascination for the gentleman, Miss Pilkington confessed, leaning so far forward on the table that Clara was forced to lean back again, making room for her. Clara felt small indeed as she sat in her chair, almost forgotten about because of the way Miss Pilkington had inadvertently pushed her cake plate to the side. Clara caught it before it could fall off the table. A fascination? For a cad? Miss Withers asked. Of course, Miss Pilkington nodded. Is there not something alluring about a gentleman who knows how to make a lady smile? At her provocative words, they all laughed, other than Clara. Once again, she stayed quiet and busied herself with stabbing what was left of her cake with a little too much harshness. Lady Clara, Miss Withers turned toward her. Does this gossip not intrigue you? She whispered, for Clara's ears only. The Baron's son is to return. We have so few entertaining gentlemen in these parts, and certainly few rogues. No doubt he will turn many a lady's head, if not everyone's. That's what worries me. The thought made Clara sit tall in her seat, unnerved at how much hearing of Horatio's character had frightened her. We shall see, she said simply, and placed her empty teacup down on her saucer, ready to depart. If you would excuse me, I really must return home. As Clara stood to her feet, her eyes drifted over the others at the table. 
She observed Miss Pilkington's smoky grey eyes and the power they had over any observer. Then her gaze slipped to the dark beauty of Miss Withers and the black hair that shined in the summer light. It was hardly the first time Clara felt as if she didn't belong amongst them, never as captivating as them. There were protests from her friends and lamentations for her to stay, but Clara politely turned them all down and left, collecting Betsy on her way, who had hovered by the door. Once they were outside, they walked home, for Clara wished to enjoy the outdoors, rather than be stuck in a carriage for their journey. As they walked, the sun creeped higher in the sky, showing that winter was breaking at last. Where frost had dappled the ground that morning, it had melted into puddles, and the green shoots of daffodils and tulips were poking through. Clara inhaled the sweet scent of the blooms as she strode ahead down the nearest path, with Betsy hurrying to catch up with her. Goodness, we are walking quickly today, Betsy said, hastening to keep pace with her petite stature. Did you not enjoy your tea, my lady? I cannot say that I did. Clara's words made Betsy's freckled nose wrinkle. I thought at one point you found it quite amusing, Betsy said with a small laugh. Next time I shall endeavour to make more faces at you across the room. Surely that will make you smile. Ha! I look forward to it, Clara said with eagerness. Pulling her gloves onto her hands, she took Betsy's arm and linked it with her own. I do not know, Betsy. It is merely that sometimes when I am with such ladies I feel as if... As if what? Betsy urged her on. As if I do not belong. Clara grimaced with the words. It was something she had often felt, as if she didn't see eye to eye with some of the ladies, especially Miss Pilkington. More than once had Clara examined her face in the mirror, judging that she did not have the dark beauty of Miss Withers, nor the gentle elfin features of Miss Pilkington. I rather suspect it is a fear everyone has in their life, at some point or another. Betsy's words caught Clara's interest. Look, there, my lady. She suddenly pulled Clara to a stop and pointed to the stream that banked alongside the road they were walking down. Clara's lips flickered into a smile as she observed a family of ducklings swimming, following their mother. Look at the smallest one, Betsy whispered, gesturing to the back of the group. The smallest duckling was struggling to keep up with its siblings, clearly swimming hard, with its tiny beak outstretched, but making little progress. Just as golden and as beautiful as the others, but he feels left out. I take your point. Clara pulled Betche on, tugging on her arm. Perhaps we all do feel like it at some point, though she feared she suffered that sensation more than others. Yet, there was something today that unsettled me more. Ah, did it have something to do with all the talk of Mr Fitzroy? Betsy's voice was light, alluding to the fact that there was more unsaid here. At Betsy's perceptive question, Clara angled her face forward, rather hoping the brim of her bonnet hid her expression. When he was mentioned, I could see you looked quite uncomfortable, my lady. Well, it is good to know my feelings are so easy to read on my face. Clara said with sarcasm, earning a soft laugh from her maid. Not at all. It is simply that I know you so well, Betsy assured her. Is it not a good thing, though, my lady? I thought Mr Fitzroy was a good friend of yours. Are you not looking forward to seeing him again? That I do not know. Clara chewed the inside of her mouth so much in her nerves that she broke the skin. Bawling a fist at her side, she urged her body to stop hurting itself before she found the courage to speak her true mind. What the ladies had to say of him worried me, that I must confess. What did they have to say? Betsy asked. Clara's furrowed brow urged Betsy on to explain what she had heard. Beyond a few words, I could not catch all of the conversation. They spoke of Mr Fitzroy being a rogue. Clara shook her head, baffled by the idea. The boy I knew would never be such a man. She hesitated, struggling with her words. He was kind, quite wild in nature when it came to exploring and adventure, but he was also respectful, constantly respectful. He had this habit of being able to guess my thoughts even before I had spoken of them. She smiled at the idea, 
before it faded. I cannot imagine that boy becoming a cad who charms the ladies of Paris. She spoke with a little resentment. Maybe the gossip isn't true or exaggerated, Betsy said with clear hope and a spring to her step. I remember when I first came to work with you. I saw you once with Mr Fitzroy before he left. You two looked so happy together. I made a wager to myself then that the two of you would wed some day. Did you really? Clara turned to her friend with a confused laugh. Nothing has ever been spoken of between us that would suggest anything more than friendship. Perhaps not, but an observer can spy an affection even when it's not spoken of. Betsy smiled and glanced Clara's way. Clara pretended a sudden fascination in the magnolia trees nearby that were just beginning to bud. Perhaps it is destiny, Lady Clara. Destiny? She thought the concept of a fixed future an odd idea. He is returning. That indeed could be destiny. I wish I had your superstitious heart. Clara said with a little envy. I am afraid I feel too practical or cynical at this moment. Choose whichever word you think more appropriate. She found she could not hold on to any romantic notions, not after what she'd heard of Horatio. I fear that my meeting with Mr Fitzroy again may be a great disappointment indeed. Chapter Two Clara. Goodness, Clara, you are usually not so eager to attend a ball. I find I am in the mood for one this evening. Clara tried to subdue her excited manner as she walked the corridors of the fine house, moving alongside her mother and father who were arm in arm. Whereas her father, the Duke of Gordon, looked forward, her mother, Marianne, kept glancing at Clara. Her dark brown eyes that were so like Clara's own were rather narrowed, as if examining her in great detail. You are staring, mother. Why do you stare? Clara asked playfully, trying to disarm her mother. You are not usually so fond of these events, that is all. Marianne shrugged. You once described it to Daniel as being put on display, like a fine china ornament on a mantelpiece. More than once have I seen you stay by Daniel's side all night, not wishing to be there. Yes, well, Daniel does make these events more enjoyable. Clara missed her brother in that moment. Had he not been visiting the continent on his own and much-anticipated grand tour, she would have taken comfort in him escorting her tonight. When her nerves got the better of her, Daniel never seemed to mind. He would never comment on it, as their father had a habit of doing on occasion. It is springtime, that is all, and we haven't had a ball for a while. I'm quite looking forward to it. That's the spirit, Clara, her father said with keenness, evidently pleased to see her at last looking forward to such events. Marianne was clearly not so convinced now, and kept glancing towards Clara's way every few minutes. As they stepped through the double doors, leading to the ballroom, Clara's eyes danced around the room searching for one person in particular. Is he here? With her gaze darting between the dancers, who trotted like deer at one end of the room, toward the tables stacked so high with crystal glasses they were in danger of falling over, she searched for Mr Fitzroy. There were gentlemen dressed grandly for the occasion in fine black tail suits with cravats bearing so many ruffles, it was a wonder the gentlemen could see over them and into the room at all. The ladies rather reminded Clara of the birds in springtime for so many wore feathers standing proudly in their hair. Just as the birds would flutter their feathers to earn a male's attention, the ladies here fluttered fans in their faces and batted their eyelashes. Clara groaned inwardly and looked away from the ladies, knowing she did not have the skill to look so coy and pretty, just by fluttering a fan in front of her face. Mr Pilkington, her father said, bowing in greeting to their guest, Thank you for our invitation this evening. Thank you for coming, Mr Pilkington declared, bowing swiftly to the Duke. He was the father of the woman Clara called a friend, Miss Harriet Pilkington, though in truth she wasn't sure how much they really knew each other. Please make yourselves comfortable. There are drinks and food will be served shortly. The dancing is lively 
and we have even hired violinists from Shaftesbury. How wonderful, Marianne said on cue. We also will be graced with some special guests this evening, Mr Pilkington went on. Baron and Baroness Aldington are to bring their son, Mr Fitzroy. I understand he has just returned from his grand tour. We'll look forward to seeing him again, the Duke said with ease. As he led them away, Clara was aware that her mother's gaze shifted to her, even keener than before now she'd heard Mr Fitzroy was to be there. Clara purposefully looked anywhere other than at her mother. Shall we find ourselves a drink? Yes, let's, Clara said swiftly, trying to distract her mother. As they hovered by a table full of crystal glasses and the Duke began to pour out three golden cups of punch, Clara's eyes wandered again, unable to settle. How interesting we shall see Mr Fitzroy again tonight, Marianne said, addressing her husband more than Clara. He was always such an affable boy. Yes, indeed. He'll be a man now, though, the Duke reminded her. Clara, have you heard much of him since you last saw him? Marianne's pertinent questions weren't helping Clara's nerves. Beneath her white gloves, a clamminess began to creep into her palms. No, she lied, and took a big gulp from her punch glass. Only that which you have told me from what his parents have said. As her father drew her mother into a conversation on the number of people there that night, Clara felt at liberty to look away. This time, she was not disappointed in her search. Entering the ballroom were two people she recognised well, Baron and Baroness Aldington. They greeted their host with warmth, just as a gentleman entered the room behind them. At once, Clara recognised him. It's Horatio. The green, far-apart eyes were just the same, though they now receded in a more masculine face, with a dappling of bristles on his chin. The black hair she had seen so often, dark as a raven's feathers, was still there, but tonight it was excessively coffed. When he was young, and they went ridding together, it had been wild, curling at the ends in the breezy. He's so tall. Clara tried not to think of how his figure had changed so much, for it made that clamminess in her palms grow even worse. He was tall indeed, with his head height above most in the room, and he bore an athletic figure, with the slim-fitting tailcoat showing the broadness of his shoulders. He was smiling as he looked around the room. It was an easy and charming smile, one that lit up his features before his father begged his attention, and he turned to greet his host with a rather flamboyant bow. Clara's hand tightened around her punch glass to see the flamboyance, for it was not what she had expected of him. Clara, will we see you dancing tonight? her father asked, clearly none the wiser to where she had been staring or what she had been thinking of. Dancing. Well, I... Clara paused, shifting her attention to her parents. Dear Gregory, Marianne said softly, you know our Clara is nervous when it comes to such things. You should not push her. I didn't push, I asked. Gregory defended with an easy laugh. You're a fine dancer, Clara. You forget, I've seen you practising over the years in our music room. I know you can dance even if you don't believe it. Maybe I'll dance tonight. Her words prompted both Gregory and Marianne to stare at her, wide-eyed. We shall see. The two of them exchanged a look, smiling warmly. Clara chose not to look across the room in Horatio's direction, fearful she'd give away her hope that maybe if she had to dance, he would be the one to ask her. Then let us find you a dance partner. Gregory put his glass down on the table beside him and rubbed his hands together. Oh no, father, please do not usher me on to any unsuspecting gentleman. He would be quite cornered. Clara said in panic. Nonsense! Any gentleman will be thrilled to dance with you. Gregory walked away, clearly seeking out a suitable gentleman. Mother, Clara whispered in a hiss, moving to her side. I know, I know. Marianne tried to ease her panic with a raised hand. He's just trying to help you, dear. I do not need help. Last time you came to a ball, you spent most of the night in the corner of the room. 
Marianne reminded her with a small smile. I was happy in the corner, Clara pointed out. Who is happy in a corner? Marianne asked, a laugh escaping her lips. Me. You can observe the world from there without anyone noticing you. It's quite an interesting place to be. Clara could see her mother did not believe her, though, for one of her brown eyebrows lifted into a perfect arch. Oh, mother, I cannot stand this. She looked away to see her father waving at her across the room, clearly trying to get her attention. Determined not to be forced into a dance with a stranger, she walked away. Where are you going? To the privy, Clara lied. To anywhere else. She strode through the ballroom, creeping between groups that barely took notice of her. Glancing behind her, she saw her father still intently talking with a gentleman. Not looking where she was going, Clara was completely unprepared for the body that was suddenly in front of her. They collided together, their arms bouncing off one another. Clara stumbled back, in danger of falling over and barely stopping herself, as she looked up to see who she had collided with. Oh, God's wounds, it's Horatio. Clara, he declared suddenly, a smile appearing on his lips so fast it was a wonder to see. Gosh, I suppose I should call you Lady Clara these days. We are not children running around your estate hunting for butterflies any more. His words were so easy, so reminiscent of the past, that Clara found herself laughing. Did we do that once? I can't even remember. I can remember vividly, he said, tilting his head back and sighing as if reliving that moment. I don't think we caught any. They laughed together before Clara recalled exactly who she was talking to. Horatio was not just an old friend, but the son of a baron. There should be a more formal greeting. I should probably call you Mr Fitzroy these days as well. She hastened to curtsy, and he bowed, though he had an amused look in his eyes the whole time. Seeing how handsome he had become and standing this close, Clara was certain her heartbeat was out of control. By blood, what is wrong with me? I thought my childish fancy of him would be gone by now. It sounds strange to be called that by you. He stood straight and stepped a little closer toward her, dropping his voice to a whisper. It's been a few years, hasn't it? Just a few. You have changed much. He gestured to her. Clara at once felt self-conscious, laying her white-gloved hands to her stomach as she glanced down at her gown. She had chosen the dress with a lot of care this evening. The pastel blue dress was made of silk, with a white chiffon overskirt, hemmed at the edge with lace. She rather hoped it flattered her figure, but she feared it was not as fine as other ladies' dresses here tonight. I hope that is a good thing. Clara reached for some humour, prompting Horatio to laugh. You look fine indeed, he said with ease. Though I can still recognise you. Tell me, have I changed much? He held out his arms and turned in a quick circle, clearly waiting for her approval. You are certainly taller, she acknowledged. Ha! He laughed deeply, tipping his head back with the movement. High praise indeed. No compliment for your old friend. You are fishing for one, I see. She pointed at him in warning, and he laughed even more. Perhaps a little, but I can't resist a little mischief. There was something in his manner that she hadn't expected. After all the gossip she'd heard, Clara had feared he would not be the boy she had known. Somehow, he would be transformed to the charismatic rogue the ladies had spoken of. Though the man before her certainly was charming, there was no falseness to his manner, nor was there an excessiveness that was uncomfortable. He talked to her as if the years had not passed between them. He is still Horatio. You and I must talk more, he said with eagerness. When someone passed by them, he stepped closer to her, avoiding a collision with the stranger. Clara felt a heat bleeding into her cheeks at his close proximity. I long to hear how you have spent your years. And I wish to hear of your grand tour, too. I fear I'll bore you for talking too much of it. If I do, simply give me one of these. He put upon a false yawn. I'll take the hint, then. She laughed with him so suddenly that her nerves began to dissipate. 
Ah, Mr Fitzroy, it is good to see you again. Mr Pilkington appeared at their side. The moment they were interrupted, Clara felt her nerves return, for either side of Mr Pilkington were his daughters. May I introduce my daughters to you, Miss Harriet Pilkington and Miss Lettice. They were very beautiful. It was something Clara couldn't help noticing. Miss Pilkington's delicate features were exquisite, as if painted by an artist, and Miss Lettice had such bold blue eyes one could not help staring. Charmed indeed. Horatio picked up their hands, each in turn, and bestowed a kiss. What a pleasure it is to meet such beautiful ladies here tonight. The gentlemen in this town must be constantly spoiled by the good company. The way he acted made Clara stare at him, wide-eyed. It was as if he had transformed into another being the moment they had arrived. The ladies giggled behind cupped hands demurely. Miss Pilkington fluttered a fan, hanging the fan rather close to the neckline of her gown to draw attention to her bosom. Clara had to hold in her groan, wanting to mock the obvious attempt to get a gentleman's attention until she noticed Horatio staring. Good God, it's actually working. I hope you have come eager to dance tonight, Mr Fitzroy, Mr Pilkington said, clearly with a goal in mind. My daughters were just talking of being in want of a good dance partner. Nothing I like more than a good dance, and I hope I shall be blessed with many fair dances from such good ladies tonight. He bowed his head in acknowledgement of both ladies. Clara stepped back. She felt as if she had disappeared to Horatio and the others, no longer enough to be seen. But first I must ask another. Horatio turned his eyes on her just before she could leave. Lady Clara, would you care to dance the first with me? Clara swallowed, not sure what to think. She had hoped for such a dance, had she not? Had she not long ed for it? She could well imagine the thought of placing her hand in his would make her heart tremble in her chest, fluttering like a bird's wing. But then her eyes landed on the two Miss Pilkingtons. He was so excessive with them, even flirtatious. Those are the ladies he truly wishes to dance with. He only asked me out of duty, as we are old friends. Alas, I'm afraid I'm a poor dancer, Clara said hurriedly and gestured to the other ladies. Thank you for watching. Before we continue into the story, do us a favor. Like this video and hit the subscribe button because it helps very much with YouTube's algorithm. Thank you again. Now back to our story. Choose a better partner, Mr. Fitzroy. We can talk again another time. Before any more could be said, Clara retreated, crossing the room quickly toward where her mother stood. I was wrong. He has changed after all. Chapter 3 Horatio What did you make of the ball last night then, Horatio? His father's question earned his attention. Sat beside his father and opposite his mother in the carriage, as it swayed from side to side on their journey, Horatio's mind had been quite lost in thought of the ball the night before. Intriguing? Interesting indeed. Horatio spoke with enthusiasm, turning his back on the window, through which he could see the sky darkening as the sun set, and moved his focus to his parents. We didn't disappoint after the grand events of Paris and Venice, his mother said with a deep laugh. She was known for her rather husky voice, and such deep laughs always came from her. Sometimes I fear you were quite spoiled by your travels. I will not deny they were wonderful and I certainly saw some things that could make an interesting tale or two. Not all of them have to be told, son. His father elbowed him subtly, and they shared an amused grin. Patrick Baron Adlington had been on his own grand tour when he was young, so before Horatio had left on his, Patrick had issued a few warnings. Sometimes parties and assemblies on the continent could be wild, and tales from these nights did not have to be repeated. Have no fear, mother, Horatio said, turning his focus to Eleonora across the carriage. I enjoyed last night very much. His mind was on all the ladies he had met. For such a small town in Dorset, he'd thought Wareham would not have such grand parties, but he'd been wrong. There were many indeed attending the event, and more than one beauty that had turned his head. There were fine eyes, elegant figures, and sweet smiles to think of. 
then there was another to think of too. Clara, his old childhood friend, had changed a lot in the time he'd been gone. Well, I'm glad we can give you a good social calendar now you have returned. Eleonora fussed with her police, making it sit just right. A dinner at the Duke of Gordon's house the night after a ball? A fine thing indeed. We know the family so well by now. It's a wonder you continue with the formalities of titles, Horatio observed. He'd often wondered at the necessity of all the titles, when the Duke and Duchess practically felt like an aunt and uncle to him as he was growing up. It is necessary, his mother reminded him, her blue's eyes wide. You will have to address Lady Clara too by her title these days. I did indeed last night, Horatio assured her, thinking of Clara and when they had met. You saw her last night? his father asked in surprise. Lady Clara has a habit of not standing in the centre of a room at such a ball. Why ever not? Horatio asked with interest. She's not one for being the centre of attention, Eleanor explained with a soft tone, finishing fiddling with her pelisse. Well, we quite literally bumped into each other last night. We talked as if we had never been away, Horatio said, sitting forward, suddenly taken up with energy now he was talking of Clara. Do you not think she has changed much over the years? You forget, we see her most days. Eleonora seemed unaffected by the idea. To us, her change has been gradual. She's very changed. I remember a young girl, slight in stature, rather red in face and not one so much for propriety. She'd sooner be walking through the fields with mud up her skirt than wearing a grand gown. Horatio spoke of the memories with fondness. Those memories of Clara were some of the happiest times from his childhood. She'd still sooner walk through fields, Patrick said, leaning forward to the window as they approached the Duke's house. Travelling down the drive, the manor slowly came into view. Though I take your point, she's grown into quite a beauty. She has, Horatio agreed. There had been many beauties last night at the ball, but Clara was the one who had surprised him the most. With her cinnamon-coloured hair and the escaped wisps curling madly, there had been a temptation to run his fingers through those curls. Her brown eyes were bold in her face these days, and there was a pleasant glow to her skin with rouged cheeks. Well, perhaps Lady Clara can persuade you to stay longer with us now that you have returned, Eleonora declared, moving to the door of the carriage. Patrick stepped down first and turned to help Eleonora. I beg your pardon, Horatio said in surprise, jumping to follow his mother. Oh, Horatio, a mother can't help longing for her son to settle nearby, can she? She asked, taking his arm with her own as they walked toward the house. Is it absurd for me to hope for grandchildren too someday? Maybe you and Lady Clara. Mother. Horatio stopped walking earning his mother's fixed attention, whilst Patrick walked on, heading for the door. Before you make the insinuation aloud, let me halt you there. I have no intention to marry. None, Eleonora said, her lips quivering. Not at the moment, no. As for marrying Lady Clara. He laughed at the idea. How could I consider the idea? She was my closest friend growing up. No, it could not be done. I've heard of many friendships that have been ruined by an attempt to court. Have you two finished your little argument? Patrick called from the door. We're already late. He knocked on the door, waiting for them to join him. Horatio spied the disappointment in his mother's face. As she loosened their arms, she moved to her husband's side and pinned a wraith of false smile in place. I'm sorry to disappoint her, but it is the truth. Horatio couldn't deny that his life on the continent had opened his eyes to many things. He may have charmed the occasional lady at university, but the continent had introduced him to a world of many ladies at a time. Spending an evening in so much good company was a pleasure he did not want to be without. He couldn't imagine any single lady changing his mind on that point. The door opened and the butler beckoned them inside, taking Horatio's frock coat and his mother's pelisse. As they walked into the hallway, the family ushered to greet them. The Duke and Duchess of Gordon stepped forward first, taking their friends' hands in greeting. 
When Clara appeared at the bottom of the stairs, Horatio jerked his head twice to look at her. Tonight, she was wearing a pristine ivory gown, so fitted to her figure that it accented her slender curves. Once again, the cinnamon-hued hair seemed ready to escape its updo, tempting with curls. Think not of the lady's beauty. After all, it's Clara. Well, come through, come through, the Duke said with eagerness. Our meal is prepared, so I hope you are hungry. Horatio followed the others into the dining room and sat opposite Clara, noticing that she seemed to avoid his gaze for a minute or two. It was not the Clara he had met the night before, the one so easy to talk in his company that he had quite forgotten. They were at a ball for a few minutes. As their parents lapsed into conversation, Horatio did not want the silence to continue any longer. He leaned a little over the table, determined to capture her attention. Do we have chance to talk of the years that have passed now? He asked, waiting as those dark eyes flicked up to meet his. Just remember our agreement. If I bore you, you must yawn so I know to stop. He was delighted when her lips curved into a small smile. You might entertain, not bore. Ha! I would be a proud man indeed to think myself such entertaining company. He gestured to her as they began their food. First, tell me of yourself, C. I mean, Lady Clara. He corrected himself before he could make the error. She looked amused at the idea, then reached for her glass, suddenly not as stiff as she had been but a few seconds before. I am afraid I have not changed much since you have gone. I will have very few stories to tell, she said, taking a sip. Do you still ride and walk every day? he asked. Every day, she confirmed, much to my mother's worry. She cast a wary look across the table to her mother, lowering her voice, but the four parents were far too absorbed in their own conversation to take any notice. When I was a child, she feared I'd become feral. I remember that, Horatio said with a laugh. One day when you and I came into the house, covered head to toe in mud for we had fallen in the stream, she started to clean you with everything she could get her hands on. A handkerchief for your face, a sheet for your arms and a brush for your shoes. You squirmed the whole time and wriggled like a worm. I remember that too. She giggled at the idea and topped up her glass before topping up his. So you still explore? I do. Though I am making a study of nature too these days. Her words intrigued him, making him lean forward a little more. My father has been kind to buy me books on birds. It quite fills my days. Oh, it does, the Duchess suddenly called up, clearly having caught part of their conversation. You should see her aviary. She's growing quite a collection every day. Yes, thank you, Mother. Clara lowered her voice and blushed a little. Horatio was quite distracted by that blush, thinking of the pleasant tinge it turned her cheeks. What of you? I reckon you have grander tales than mine, she motioned to him. Tell me of your travels to the continent. I saw such natural wonders that it might have even satisfied your hunger for nature, he said with a chuckle. She seemed intrigued, abandoning her food and looking up to meet his gaze. The black forest near the Rhine was a spectacle. What an eerie name, her eyes went wide. Aptly named. You walk in and it feels as if you are walking with shadows alongside you. Or maybe ghosts, she said playfully pulling a chuckle from him. Maybe so, he nodded. There were the Alps, too, the snow-capped mountains of France. More snow than we have probably ever seen here. More snow than the day you and I played hide-and-seek in the woods here? You hid in the snow, she reminded him with raised eyebrows. Though I seem to remember you regretted it. I could not find you for so long that when you did appear, your teeth were chattering and your lips were blue. Gosh, I'd forgotten that. He was baffled at the memory that stirred within. He could still remember Clara pulling him free from the snow, her gloved hands in his offering a little warmth compared to the ice. Even more snow than that day. You look out to the Alps, and it is as if you have been shrunk down to the size of a robin, 
for the hills are so vast and you are so surrounded by icicles, you can see it all in incredible detail. What a place to go. Clara appeared in awe, her pink lips parted. When Horatio found himself looking at those lips, he had to snap his gaze away. I am different with her. The realisation came rather suddenly. By now, with any other lady, he would have flirted and given some obvious compliment to make her blush, but not with Clara. Abruptly, he felt like the boy he had not been for many years. Would you ever like to see such things yourself? He asked, watching as she paused with her food. Gentlemen are fortunate they can go on grand tours. Goodness knows why our parents trust you and my brother to go when I am not trusted. Her jibe made him laugh deeply before his ear was caught by the conversation beside him. Oh yes, two visitors this morning she had, the Duchess of Gordon said, gesturing to her daughter beside her. It was a compliment, was it not, Clara? What was that, mother? She turned her attention to the Duchess. I was just telling the Baroness about your callers this morning. Two gentlemen from the ball last night, two, the Duchess said with delight. That, and you spent most of the evening in one corner again, Clara, the Duke said with a soft laugh. Maybe it's about time you didn't stand so much in the corner after all. Father, please, Clara spoke quietly with a little embarrassment. Horatio could not understand why she felt the need to stay close to the walls at such an event. He never did such a thing, for there was joy to be had in dancing and walking amongst the guests. You had callers? Horatio said, surprising himself with the question. She did? The Duchess clearly answered before Clara could. Lord Warrington from Corfe and Mr Nesbitt from Poole. They were quite taken with you, were they not? I think it was the idea of a dowry that interested them more than anything else. Clara's jest made them all laugh, and they returned to their conversation, but Horatio couldn't settle. He'd met Lord Warrington at the ball the night before and had thought him a rather scrawny man, with little interesting conversation to offer. He also seemed quite fixed upon his cleanliness, going so far as to dab his lip three times with a serviette, after having one morsel of food. Clara needs a gentleman who longs for adventure, not one who will stay at home fussing over his handkerchief. Horatio stared at Clara for some time, uncertain why the thought of Lord Warrington and this other gentleman visiting her bothered him so much. So, Mr Fitzroy, she began again, now the parents were looking elsewhere. What else can you tell me about the Grand Tour? Did you see Paris and Venice? I hear from the gossip that you were quite popular there. Huh? Is that what is said of me? He laughed at the idea. Perhaps I was. The number of ladies he'd had trying to get his attention was a pleasant reminder. Then his eyes landed on Clara, and he found himself longing to talk of something else. There was as much fun to be had, though, in what one could explore in the day, rather than the parties in the evenings. She smiled a little at his words, and Horatio couldn't help regaling her with tales of all that he had seen. Long after dinner had finished, and the clock struck eleven, his parents stood to their feet, ready for departure. Horatio looked to the clock in surprise, for the evening had passed very fast indeed. Chapter 4 Clara Betchy, what do you think? Clara tapped the glass window, beyond which a bonnet rested on a shelf. It was a beautiful bonnet, and rather more flamboyant than one Clara would usually opt for, with lots of white ribbons and an embroidered pattern to the brim. She tried not to think about why she was looking at such ostentatious bonnets these days, yet the thought crept through nevertheless. I just want to be noticed, don't I? By Horatio. It had been two days since he and his family had come for dinner, and she had not stopped thinking of him in that time. Over dinner, he'd been more like the boy she had known once again. By the end of the evening, she had been forced to accept that no matter who he was with, other ladies with her, he was Horatio. He was the man who had a habit of making her heart beat harder, 
and her cheeks blush pink. Betchy! Realising she had not had an answer, she turned to see that her maid was no longer facing her. Clara could only see the back of Betchy's head and the blonde curls that escaped her bonnet as she stared across the street at something. What do you stare at so avidly? Clara moved to stand beside her, looking across the street. Nothing. Betchy tried to tear her gaze away, but it clearly didn't last long before she was staring again. Clara followed that look, spying at once just what Betchy was looking at, or rather, whom. There was a gentleman standing on the far side of the street, possibly a valet, judging by his clothes and the way he carried boxes, showing his master was purchasing some new items. With dark blonde hair and a rather hawkish nose, it was plain in what direction he was looking in too. He was staring straight back at Betchy. Goodness, you two are subtle, Clara said, teasing her friend. Do you know the gentleman? No, not at all. I've never seen him before. Betchy turned her gaze away. I should not stare so, should I? He seems to have no qualms on the matter, Clara pointed out, rather delighted to see the way her friend grew flustered, fidgeting with her gloves, taking them off and putting them on again. The valet across the street shifted the boxes in his hand and waved at Betchy. When she tried to do the same, she promptly dropped one of the gloves she had been fidgeting with. Oh, Lord, what will he think of me? Betchy panicked. Clara couldn't hold in her laugh as she bent down to pick up the glove and passed it back to Betchy. A carriage passed down the middle of the street, blocking the view of the valet for a few moments. I rather suspect he is as intrigued by you as you are him, Clara said slowly. Care to tell me why you are staring? Her playfulness earned a hurried sigh from Betchy. How could anyone not stare? Is he not handsome? Betchy exclaimed in a harried whisper. Yes, he is quite handsome. Then you should be staring too, Betchy said with humour. I'll try to avoid it. Clara laughed at the idea, knowing that she had a staring habit of her own at present, but at least her inducement was not around today. She had stared enough at him over dinner, so much that she had feared he would notice her gawking. As the carriage moved away from the middle of the street, it revealed that the valet was no longer alone. His master must have returned, and Clara recognised at once who it was, even without having to see his face. Horatio's tall figure had emerged from a shop, with the brim of his top hat obscuring his face for a few seconds. I do not believe it, Clara muttered, staring at Horatio across the street. The valet must have pointed out Betchy to his master, for Horatio's head turned in their direction. Tipping his top hat back a little, his eyes found Clara's across the street. God's wounds, Betchy! Could you not have found any other valets in this town attractive? Clara whispered in panic. I hardly knew, did I? Betchy said in a rush. They are coming over! Clara stepped back, noting how Horatio beckoned his valet forward, and the two went to cross the road. Is that not a good thing? Betchy asked. I'm deliriously happy in this moment. She held firmly onto Clara's arm, not letting her escape. Yes. Well, at least the gentleman you long to see has been staring back at you. Clara fell silent in a hurry, and Betchy had not time to answer, for Horatio and the valet appeared in front of them. Lady Clara, Horatio said in greeting and bowed to her. Mr Fitzroy. She hastened to curtsy. I believe we are all in anticipation of an introduction, so allow me to start. Horatio was clearly unafraid to bring the elephant in the room to the foreground as he gestured between Betchy and the valet. This is my valet, James. He gestured to the young man beside him, who hastened to bow, with his eyes clearly set on Betchy, never wavering. This is my lady's maid, Betchy, Clara said, finishing the introduction. Betchy curtsied but said nothing. As the two continued to look at one another, Clara stared at Horatio and narrowed her eyes, rather hoping he could read on her face what she thought of this rather hurried introduction. Ahem! Horatio cleared his throat, making the two staff snap their gazes away from one another. Lady Clara, 
You are here to wander town for a while. Perhaps I could join you. He strode out at once, beckoning her to do the same. James, please follow. I may be in need of you. The valet took the hint at once and fell in step behind them with Betchy beside him. Horatio urged Clara on a little, so that they walked through town with some space between them and their staff. This is hardly subtle, is it? Clara whispered to him, elbowing him to get his attention. Oomph! He pretended to rub a sore spot on his ribs. You've grown stronger, Lady Clara. At her look of panic back to Betchy, he tapped her arm soothingly. Worry not. Besides, what were we supposed to do? The two of them were staring so openly at one another in the street, they were making people talk. At least this way, they have chance to talk with one another. It just all feels so forced. Clara grimaced and glanced back again. Continue to look at them and you'll only make them feel more self-conscious. His words urged her to snap her head forward. Leave them be for a while, my lady he said with ease. You might be surprised what could happen when there's a spark between two people and they're allowed to talk alone. At his words, Clara swallowed nervously. She knew what could happen. She had felt how the spark could spread until her very being was excited by Horatio's presence. But the difference was that spark was only felt by her. The gentleman beside her was clearly unaware. In truth, I had quite finished my walk around town, but I'm happy to go over my same footsteps again, Horatio said with a small laugh. You can put up with my company for a few minutes, can you not? He asked teasingly, to which she narrowed her eyes at him. Ha! Huh, why do I feel as if you disapprove of me today? It's just so forward. She gestured to the pair behind them that were now locked deep in conversation. If Betchy and James were supposed to be considered chaperones for Clara and Horatio walking together, then they were clearly poor fits for the roles, for they barely looked ahead of themselves. Sometimes one must be forward to get what they want. Horatio shrugged with the words. Something in what he said made Clara flinch. Yes, I've heard you can charm many a lady these days. She tried to keep any disapproval out of her voice. May I suppose this is because of this forwardness? You are laughing at me, he observed, gesturing to her. Perhaps a little. Then do laugh at me by all means, he encouraged her on. But I shall say this, he bent toward her, whispering in her ear a little. Happiness can be found in being forward. I'll encourage my valet to be the same, if he continues to be so struck by your maid. She shook her head at him, noting that he was once again not the Horatio she knew. He talked of charming ladies as if it were a pastime, a hobby, rather than an affair of the heart. Let us talk of something else for a while. She pushed on with their walk, passing the tall town buildings and entering the market. Stalls were set up, busy with people and wares. Some catcalled, trying to sell fruit onto passers-by, whilst others sat patiently, counting out their money. Do you intend to stay long in Wareham? she asked needing to find any other topic to talk of other than Horatio and his ladies. I have no intention to leave for the moment, though I know my mother would like me to make a home nearby. He gestured to the town around them. It's rather hard to settle in one place, though, when you have been on the move so constantly. Really? I would have thought you would be glad of the rest. No, indeed, not when there's another adventure to be had. He clapped his gloved hands together, showing that the mere idea of adventure excited him. Surely you would take the chance if it was offered to you. I have never known anyone so keen to explore as you. I explore nearby fields and woods. I do not go to the Black Forest and the Alps, she reminded him, watching as he cut playfully in front of her, reaching for a stall. Maybe someone should take you, he said with enthusiasm. They could show you the world. If only, she whispered, so only she could hear the words. Horatio now had his back to her as he examined what was on a stall. He selected something, then handed over some change, before turning back to face her and proffering something forward. What's this? For you, 
His words urged her to look down at the cinnamon roll he had placed in her hand, before reaching behind him and selecting one for himself. The gesture was done with such easy kindness that Clara smiled a little. Even when she was reminded of his cavalier ways when it came to ladies, he still had the capacity to show such kindness to her. Thank you, she murmured as they walked on, both taking bites of their cinnamon rolls. After a minute or so, Clara glanced at James and Betchy, who were following them at a distance. How caught up in conversation do they look? Horatio asked, moving close to her side. He came so near that she jumped, startled at the proximity and the deep scent that had accompanied him, a scent of sandalwood. Very much so, she confirmed. Her eyes danced across Betchy's face, noting how her freckled nose had turned a little pink and she kept fidgeting constantly. I have never seen Betchy so taken with a gentleman before. Perhaps she is on a path for true love. True love? Ha! What a notion! Horatio's deep laugh made Clara dart her head toward him. You laugh at the idea? The idea? No, for I have seen it acted on many stages. He continued to smile as they walked on. I watched Romeo and Juliet drive one another to death for it. If such a thing does exist, then surely it makes fools of us all. What an awful view of the world. Clara turned to him in surprise. You belittle it. No, I am merely practical. He shrugged, clearly unaware of the effect his words had on Clara. He doesn't believe in love. Goodness, what a fool I am to have developed this fancy for a gentleman who can't even gift his heart to another. Shakespeare's example surely shows us that it does us little good. Would you want Juliet's end? he asked with amazement. Certainly not. She shook her head. Yet I believe in love. If you do not believe in love, what do you believe in? Fondness, certainly, and the enjoyment of another's beauty. I have seen such things many times. He walked on, urging Clara to pause a little before she followed him. You think only of beauty? Clara scoffed at the idea. Was it not Shakespeare himself who said that love looks not with the eyes but with the mind? She caught him up, watching as he turned to look at her with a raised eyebrow. You know the poetry. I enjoy the plays and clearly have more time for them than you do. She shook her head at him, finishing her cinnamon roll. She suddenly found she did not wish to stay talking to Horatio, for it was making her heart sink in her chest by the second. I believe love to be real. Perhaps it is, but I do not believe all of us have the capacity to feel it. I say, I have not seen this market in years. Look how it's grown. He spread his arms at the vastness of it. We should explore. But you might have to stop me from buying something off every stall, for wanting to please the stallholders. Or even with James to help me, I will not be able to carry everything home. As he hurried off to the next stall, Clara couldn't smile, despite his good humour. He doesn't think of love, but of beauty. Clara looked down at her own body and raised a gloved hand to her cheek before she let it fall. Never had she felt like such a fool before. She was fond of a man who not only could not gift his heart to another, but would only turn his head for someone who was truly beautiful. She stepped beside a puddle in the cobbled street and stared down at her murky reflection, finding the reality of what she saw there sinking in. I'm not enough to turn his head. Chapter 5 Horatio A happy hum filled the air, singing such an uplifting tune that as Horatio began to dress for the ball, pulling his shirt over his head, he turned his head back and forth, looking for the source of the sound. When James stepped out from the cupboard, humming away and unfolding a cravat, Horatio laughed freely. For a minute there, I thought there was a stranger in my chamber, he said, as he tucked his shirt into his breeches. A stranger? James broke off in his humming to walk toward Horatio. Where? He turned on the spot, looking to all corners of the room, making Horatio laugh even more. I have never seen you like this before, James. 
Horatio took the proffered cravat from his valet and began to tie it around his neck. Look at you, you're distracted in your work, barely concentrating on what you're doing and humming. I have never known you to hum. Hence my suspicion that there was a stranger in my chamber. He gestured at James's happy smile, which faltered for a second. Now. Why on earth should that smile drop just because I am commenting on it? I guess I am a little distracted, sir. James sighed deeply and returned to the cupboard, searching out a tailcoat. I confess, someone has been on my mind these last couple of days. Pray let me guess. Horatio felt mischievous as he paused with the cravat, angling his head to catch the eye of his valet through the reflection in the mirror before him. Is it the new maid here? The one who tried to corner you last week in the kitchen? James' panicked and pale expression prompted him to laugh deeply another time. No? Not her? Of course not. James shook his head. I was lucky the cook came when he did. She was most insistent, that maid. So I shall have to guess again. The lady who visits the stable to care for the horses when they're sick, is it her? Horatio's question made James sigh deeply, for the lady in question was at least twice the young valet's age, though it never stopped her eyes wandering over James. Horatio had noticed more than once since James's time as a valet that ladies had a habit of letting their gazes linger on him. It was similar to how Horatio was watched by the ladies of the ton, James was watched by the staff. Not her, either. Strangely enough, no. James returned from the cupboard, carrying a waistcoat and a tailcoat. There is another, completely on my mind. Then it must be that young maid we saw the other day in town when I came across Clara. I mean, Lady Clara. Horatio corrected himself quickly, avoiding James's gaze by staring in the mirror as he fidgeted with the buttons of his waistcoat. He knew it was no great matter really to call Clara by her Christian name. After all, for years he had done such a thing, but times had changed. People might comment if he continued to do so. Yes, it is, sir. Betchy, I confess I cannot stop thinking of her. As James turned away to hunt out a pair of boots, Horatio watched his valet. The happy hum returned to the air, and James seemed to spring across the room with a lightness to his step rather than walking or trudging to do his duties. Good Lord, you are struck indeed. Horatio was amazed, his jaw hanging slack. If I believed in such things, I'd say Cupid has shot you with an arrow straight to your heart. You do not believe such things, sir. James's voice echoed from the cupboard. No, indeed. Horatio dismissed the idea finishing with the last of his waistcoat buttons and tucking his cravat into the embroidered golden material. If he does exist, then he's a mischievous little goblin hiding round corners, prepared to cause uproar by making two people infatuated with one another. Ha! Huh? Your words suggest that you have never felt his arrow. James returned, offering the boots, and Horatio nodded his thanks. No, I have not, and I am glad for it. Horatio dismissed the idea at once. He couldn't imagine the thought of being so preoccupied with one lady when there were many in this world. His time on the continent had been fun indeed, and though he had been a gentleman with every lady he had met, he'd had his amusement too. He couldn't deny there was a certain allure to not being restrained by marriage. There was freedom, excitement and attraction in pursuing the ladies he met during the evenings at assemblies and masquerade balls. You are struck indeed, though, it cannot be denied, Horatio observed, turning his focus on his friend. You have not stopped humming all evening. Abruptly, James broke off. No, no, there's no need to stop, though I might implore you to choose another tune for a while, so that we will not grow bored of your first tune. My apologies, sir. I guess I am happy. James shrugged with such an easy contentment to his features that Horatio felt a twinge of envy as he looked at the valet. There was an excitement that had taken over the valet, one Horatio had not known. I ran into Betchy again today, and I confess, I have never had this feeling before. 
You barely know the lady, Horatio pointed out distractedly, pulling on his boots. It is true. James picked up the second boot before Horatio could reach for it and buffed it a little more with a cloth. Yet so far, everything I know about her intrigues me. Have you not had that before, sir? This intrigue, this interest? Of a kind. Horatio chose not to elaborate as James returned the boot to him. He'd been intrigued enough to spend time with ladies behind closed doors, bending the rules a little, but not to pursue one for courtship. If I didn't know any better, James, I'd say you are quickly on your way to a courtship. James didn't object to the idea. He merely picked up the tailcoat from where Horatio had left it on a nearby chair and shook it out, making sure there were no creases in the cotton. Good Lord, you are, Horatio murmured in amazement. Before we know it, you'll be in here every morning singing the princely lover's garland. I'll never have any peace. His buoyant tone showed he was in jest. I'll just have to point out the folly of your ways to make sure you are still grounded. Folly, James said distractedly. Yes, James, for this... Horatio paused and held up the tailcoat as James passed it back to him. It does not really go with the rest of the clothes you have given me, does it? They laughed together as they stared at the blue tailcoat. With Horatio wearing dark green breeches and a golden waistcoat, it would be an odd match. Ah! Remind me to tease you in such a fashion, sir, when your head is turned and you make such a fool of yourself. James returned to the wardrobe and picked out a second tailcoat. Me? Make a fool of myself? I frequently do such a thing, I'm sure. I have no great pride to think I'm ignorant of such a flaw, but to make a fool of myself because of a woman? Hmm. He paused, his brows creasing together. I am not so sure that will ever be my weakness. Truly, sir, James proffered the second tailcoat to him. This one was dark green to match his breeches, and Horatio pulled it on hurriedly, checking his appearance in the mirror by turning back and forth. You cannot picture yourself with one lady only? One lady? Certainly not. Horatio laughed, shaking his head. I choose to avoid being like Romeo or Othello or any other romantic figure, thank you. They all made sorry ends. You might be watching the wrong plays about love, sir, James said playfully. Ha! Huh. Perhaps you are right. Horatio stayed staring in the mirror as James hurried across the room to the toilette case. There was something about the words that had lingered with Horatio, urging his gaze to meet his own in the mirror. One lady only. The last few years, he hadn't considered marrying at all, not once. The conversation he'd had with his mother a few days before had reiterated as much but there was one thing in particular that Horatio could not deny to himself. It was the fact that over the last few days, he kept finding himself thinking of one lady. The feeling crept up on him in moments of peace and quiet. He could be reading a book, assisting his father with the tenants, or even trying to drift off to sleep when thoughts of the lady appeared. Clara I suppose I wasn't always like this, Horatio murmured aloud speaking more to himself rather than to James at all. When I was very young, there was a lady I thought I might marry some day. Who was that, sir? James returned to his side and offered the scent bottle he'd collected from the toilet case. Horatio checked the scent before he applied it. A mixture of sandalwood and pine, he dabbed it to his wrists. Lady Clara. His words prompted James's eyebrows to shoot up so high they nearly disappeared into his hairline. Any more surprised and you would have fallen over. Horatio returned the scent bottle to him. Feeling a little self-conscious at the confession, he waited for James to cross the room. When there was some distance between them, Horatio continued, talking more to his reflection in the mirror. We spent every day together. I suppose it was a natural thing to assume. He petered off, thinking of one of the last days he and Clara had spent together before he had gone travelling. They had been exploring the Duke's estate grounds with a maid hurrying behind them, for they had just been deemed old enough by their parents that they required a chaperone. 
Determined to escape that chaperone, he had taken Clara's hand and they had run off into the woods together, causing mischief. The poor maid had been ready to pull her hair out by the time she found them, but not before he and Clara had gotten into something of a pickle in the woods together. So trapped by brambles, they'd had to help each other out of the thorns and practically fell into one another's arms. It was youth's first excitement of being near a lady. It was a natural feeling. They had been close in those moments, and that excitement had rippled through him, making him wonder if one day they could be married. Yet you do not think of marrying Lady Clara any more, sir. James's question brought Horatio back to the moment. All of a sudden, that heat beneath his skin vanished, and the memory of being surrounded by the brambles, with young Clara so close her hands were upon his, all disappeared. Clearing his throat, Horatio stood straight, hoping the blush would fade quickly from his cheeks. Not any more, no. Horatio stepped away from the mirror, now ready for the ball. I do not think of marriage at all. Certainly not yet anyway. There is too much fun to be had in the world, and I am not about to end that. As for Lady Clara, it was a boy's fancy what I felt for her, nothing more. Can feelings be brushed under rugs so simply? James asked as he packed the scent bottle away in the toilette case. If they are not great feelings, then yes, I suppose they can. Horatio nodded, hovering by the door. Perhaps you are the lucky one, James. You have met a lady, and are so struck by her that it has affected your manner, your every move, and your voice. You are humming today, but I guess you will be whistling tomorrow, then singing the day after. That is, if I can see the lady again, James murmured hurrying to tidy the room. Horatio watched his valet in thought, determined to help him. He wished for James to have his happiness, even if it wasn't a happiness that Horatio could so easily understand. He resolved deep down to do what he could to advance James's cause, maybe even by making attempts to see Lady Clara, in order to bring James and Betsy together. At the thought of Lady Clara, Horatio flinched and stood taller. What is wrong with me? He pictured the way she had looked the other night at dinner, sat with him and speaking so freely that it was as if the pocket watch in his waistcoat had turned back its hands to years before. They were young again and completely at ease with each other. Maybe there is one regard in which I was wrong when I talked of Lady Clara. In a way, she's still under my skin. He couldn't put his finger on the reason for it, but there was something about her that was hard to stop thinking about. No matter how many times he told himself it meant nothing, the thought of her kept coming back, regardless. Everything all right, sir? James said, lifting his head to eye Horatio carefully. He'd clearly spied Horatio hovering by the door to the chamber, not quite leaving yet. Yes, all is fine. Horatio sighed deeply, trying to organise his train of confused thoughts. Maybe there is a way we can encourage you and Betchy to see one another again. Perhaps there is something I can do to help. His words prompted James to light up, the smile so broad that his face changed completely. We shall see. I could spend more time with Lady Clara, for instance, and it would draw the two of you together. He clasped his hands with the idea and then rubbed his palms together, thinking of all the things he and Clara could do. They could go riding and exploring, as they had used to do. You might risk someone thinking the two of you are courting, sir, James warned cautiously. There is no need to worry about that. Horatio shook off the idea. Lady Clara and I will not court. Such a thing could ruin our friendship. I've seen many a man attempt to make more of a friendship and spoil it in result. I will not make the same mistake. No, James, fear not, for I have a plan. I will see Lady Clara more, but it is for you I do this. With a little luck, we'll have you and Betsy courting within the month. Chapter 6 Clara Clara fidgeted as she stared in the mirror, looking at the way the gown fitted to her figure. It was a dress she had often worn in the past for such events as the ball she was to attend that evening. But now she was second-guessing herself. Perhaps it was too plain. 
Maybe she should wear something else altogether more captivating. The more she thought, the more confused she became and turned in a circle in front of the mirror, watching the way the skirt billowed out with the movement. Pale pastel blue in colour, it was a simple and yet elegant dress, cinched high on the waist and falling to the floor in delicate blue silk overlaid with white lace. With fingers fidgeting, she kept flattening out the lace overlay, wondering if she should change. What do you think of the gown, Betchy? Clara called, turning her head to look through the candlelight. Betchy appeared not to hear her. Down on her knees before the cupboard placed in the corner of Clara's room, Betchy was pulling out shoes, clearly struggling to find the partner to the white pump she had in her hand. Betchy! Clara called. Still the maid did not answer. She was singing a happy song under her breath, apparently none the wiser to the fact Clara had spoken at all for she was so distracted by her song. A sailor's life is a merry life. He robs young girls of their heart's delight. Her voice was pleasant, filling the air with such a merry tune that Clara smiled as she approached her maid and stood behind her. Playfully, she folded her arms, staring down at the maid. Ahem. Clara's clearing of her throat made the maid jump. Betchy squealed and clutched her chest, nearly falling forward onto the pile of shoes she was making. Oh my goodness, my lady, you made me jump out of my skin. My apologies. You were rather in your own world and I could not resist. Clara offered a hand to help Betchy back out of the pile of shoes. Tell me, Betchy, what has you so distracted and singing such happy tunes? I'd like to partake in your happiness and sing too, if I may. I have a confession, Betchy whispered as she stood to her feet, despite the fact they were the only ones in the room. I saw that young man again today. James, Mr. Fitzroy's valet. Oh, you did? Clara tried to keep any strangeness out of her tone at the mention of Horatio's name. The thought of his handsome face flashed before her mind's eye, but any thrill she might have felt at that look disappeared when she remembered what he had said about love in the market. He is not a man that will give his heart easily. Goodness. I have not known this feeling before. Betchy fluttered with the shoe in her hand, waving it as a lady of the ton might wave a fan in front of her face to cool down. Clara laughed and took the shoe out of her hand before replacing it with a fan from the wardrobe. This might work a little better. Oh, thank you. Betchy took the fan. I could have done with this today. When I saw him in town, I blushed so much he must have been able to see it. I was as red as a tomato. I am sure of it. Your blush is a sweet one, Clara assured her, taking her place at the cupboard in the hunt to find the partner for the shoe. I do not doubt your new friend was quite entranced by that look. He'd be a fool not to be. You are too kind to me, my lady. Betchy abruptly closed up the fan. What am I doing? I should be hard at work. Please. Let me return to my hunt for the shoe. No need, I have found it. Clara pulled the pump free and stood to her feet, slipping the shoes on. Do not feel bad for being lost in thought over your bow. My bow? Betchy giggled at the words as she followed Clara across the room, moving to a vanity table. He is not that... Not yet, Clara corrected. Give it time, and he will be, if the young man has any good sense. Distractedly, she lifted up different necklaces and pairs of earrings, holding them to her face, uncertain which to wear. By the fourth set, she held up. Betchy took them out of her hands. I may be mistaken, but something tells me your mind is preoccupied tonight. Is there something upsetting you? No, not at all. Clara tried to ignore the rather perceptive gaze of her friend. As Betchy chose one of the necklaces for her to wear, fastening it around her neck, Clara kept her eyes down on the vanity table. I am merely happy for you. Clara forced a smile, feeling guilty indeed. The truth was that she was delighted for her friend. Betchy was one of her greatest friends in this world, and she wanted her maid to be happy. But there was a part of her that felt ugly this evening, and that ugly feeling kept growing. I should not be envious. I should simply be happy for Betchy. 
That kernel of envy had begun, though, and no matter how many times Clara willed it away, it remained there, niggling at her. She found herself jealous of Betchy's happiness and hopes. Betchy had seen a gentleman across the street she liked, and two meetings later she was singing as happy as a blackbird in the dawn light. If she continued in this vein, it would not be long before Betchy declared herself to be in love. Clara, on the other hand, was forced to accept that the gentleman she had known for many years would never look at her as she did him. He had closed his heart off to love. At least, that was the implication he had made, and any woman who could change his mind would certainly have to be more than Clara was. There you are, all set, my lady. At Betchy's words, Clara stood from the stool and moved to her floor-length mirror, looking at her reflection. The time she spent standing there must have captured Betchy's attention, for more than once did the maid try to walk away, before returning to stand behind Clara. Shall I ask what is truly bothering you? Pray do not. Clara sighed deeply. Raising her hands, she used her fingers to pull at her cheeks a little, wondering what she would look like if her face sat a little different. She also pressed her nose, thinking how well it could have looked if it was a little slimmer. Why are you prodding at your face as if it is clay? Betchy asked, reaching round her to pull down her hands. You'll mess with your rouge. She used her fingers to smooth the rouge once more, before stepping back with a satisfied smile. There, that is better. Clara bit her lip, holding in the sigh that threatened to escape her. That is better. That is what she said. It wasn't quite the praise of beauty, nor the acknowledgement of any fine features at all. It was simply an acceptance that the rouge had helped to improve things. Truly, something does seem wrong, Betchy said with a kind voice. Will you not tell me what it is? It is no matter. Clara forced a smile. I am simply being foolish, caught up in my own thoughts. Ignore me. She shrugged and stepped away. Perhaps the ball this evening will cheer my spirits. Yes, indeed, Betchy hurried across the room, collecting a fan and a silk pelisse that she threaded around Clara's shoulders. Surely there is one there tonight who can make you smile. Oh, not this again. Clara sighed deeply. We should not speak of Mr Fitzroy so. Her words made Betchy's smile vanish. I thought you were fond of him, my lady. I am. I mean, I was... I... She struggled to know what to say and shook herself, as if she could shake off the very thought of Horatio. Fondness shouldn't matter. He is a friend, that is all. That is all he will ever be, clearly. That is strange. Betchy walked with her to the chamber door. Because I now know what it is like to look at someone with fondness and admiration. I know that look, the one where it is hard to blink for want of staring. It is all-encompassing. I could have sworn you have that look in your eyes sometime, my lady. Her mischievous smile made Clara pause at the bedchamber door. You are too perceptive, my friend, she winced. Merely perceptive, surely not too much, Betchy declared with a laugh. You were the one who confessed to a previous attachment to Mr Fitzroy. I am simply suggesting that the attachment may not be a thing of the past. Clara's hand on the door loosened. She abandoned her attempt to open it and turned her focus on Betchy. I wish you were not so perceptive, Betchy. Her words made Betchy light up, her eyes wide. This is not a good thing to find myself so attached. Why ever not? Betchy asked, her brows abruptly furrowing. Mr Fitzroy seems a fine gentleman. And one who is rumoured to be something of a rogue, who has known many ladies, many indeed, and will hardly settle for one. Goodness, if such a man is to settle for one lady, then she must be something special to turn his head, mustn't she? Clara broke off sharply, realising how much she had become carried away. Forgive me, I... I talk too much sometimes. Nonsense, Betchy laughed off the idea. Never apologise for being yourself around me. Her eyes widened. I like to think I have the privilege of knowing you better than most, and I'd like to point out, my lady, that if you are right in that Mr Fitzroy will need someone special to turn his head, who better than you? 
Don't tease me, Betchy. I'm not teasing you. Betchy spoke with seriousness, shaking her head. I am your friend, as well as your maid, and I would not lie to you on this score. Clara slumped against the door, looking down at the gown she was wearing. Part of her wished to believe Betchy, but there was another altogether more overwhelming part that spoke with a defeated tone. This voice put herself down consistently. I wish I could believe you were right, she murmured. Yet I have heard much of the way ladies talk of Mr Fitzroy. You should hear how Miss Harriet Pilkington speaks of him. Oh, my goodness. You would think he was a deer, and she was the hunter. I believe she may have set her cap at him. And why should that matter? Betchy asked, moving her hands to her hips. Miss Pilkington does not have the history with Mr Fitzroy that you do. History? Clara laughed at the idea. Betchy, you make it sound as if we had a courtship once. We were never so close. We were friends and nothing more. Never say never. Betchy stood in front of her and adjusted a few loose hairs from her updo, making them curl by her ears. Now, I believe you are more than enough to catch Mr Fitzroy's eye, and you should believe me, for I am never wrong on this score. Never wrong? Clara laughed at her friend's confidence. Last year you were certain our scullery maid was to run off with the stable boy. I was nearly right. She ran off with the stable master instead. Clara's words made them both laugh heartily together. She was glad for the distraction and the chance to laugh, deep from her gut. Well, I am nearly right most of the time, but on this matter I'm confident. Betchy nodded. You should trust me, my lady. If you are fond of Mr Fitzroy, then you should not do yourself a disservice. I am sure you will catch his eye. Now, do me a favour and smile before you go. Clara put upon such a false smile that Betchy grimaced. Maybe work on that on the journey. Clara laughed another time and wished Betchy a good evening before she left the chamber. Hurrying down the stairs to where her parents awaited her, she hovered on the bottom step, waiting for her parents to acknowledge her presence. Ah, there you are, Clara. Gregory turned and smiled at her. That is a fine gown. Thank you, father. Clara stood a little taller, feeling a little more confident, until her mother turned to her. Marianne issued no such compliment but moved to Clara's side and fussed with the loose hairs, just as Betchy had done before, but with a little more animosity. Mother? Is something wrong? Nothing. Marianne's nose wrinkled nevertheless. Your hair has a tendency to be quite wild these days, Clara. That is all. Thank you for the compliment. Clara's wry words seemed to pass Marianne by. Well, let us leave then, Gregory urged them both toward the door. We do not want to be late for this ball. As the door opened and Gregory hurried out with Marianne on his arm, Clara hesitated. Standing by the hall mirror, she made an appearance of adjusting her pelisse over her shoulders, but in actual fact she was staring at her face and the flyaway wisps that Marianne had been attempting to tame. She couldn't help feeling there was a reason why her mother had not complimented her, and equally a reason why her father had limited his compliment to her gown. Sure, Betchy. Of course I'm enough to catch Mr Fitzroy's eye. Her sarcastic thoughts merely left her more miserable. As she walked out of the door, she attempted to lift her chin tall, but it kept slipping every now and then. As she climbed into the carriage and Marianne began to fuss with the way the dance card rested on Clara's wrist, she began to feel even worse. Appearances are everything at these sorts of events, Clara. Everything must appear just so. I know. She sighed with the words, that is what worries me so much. Is all well, Clara? Gregory asked after some minutes of silence. You seem quite withdrawn this evening. Perfectly well, thank you. Clara forced a smile and tried to burst off her nerves, thinking herself a fool. How was she supposed to enjoy the evening if she simply concerned herself with her own self-pity? She resolved to make herself smile this evening and find some enjoyment, whether Horatio was a part of that joy or not. 
Chapter 7 Horatio Ah, look who has arrived, Horatio. His mother was trying to capture his attention so much that she waved her hand in front of his face. He had to lower the claret glass in his hand, fearful of having it knocked to his nose and tipped down his tailcoat. Mother, I'm a man, not a swarm of bees. You do not need to wave at me so. His words prompted his father to laugh nearby, but Eleonora continued on, as if he hadn't spoken at all. Look who it is. She pointed to the door of the ballroom. Horatio looked where she was pointing, though he was distracted. The ballroom was full of ladies tonight many of which kept smiling at him, encouragingly. It promised to be a fine evening, and with so many ladies wearing fitted gowns, fluttering their fans in front of their eyes and teasingly hovering their dance cards in front of him, it should be interesting indeed. She looks fine tonight, don't you think? Eleonora elbowed Horatio, trying to get an answer from him. Who are we looking at? Oh, Horatio, are you so blind that you cannot see your friend, Lady Clara? Eleonora gestured once more across the room. Horatio at last saw Clara, though he tried not to make much of a reaction as he did so. She had entered on the arm of her father, and as he greeted their hosts, she was distracted, with her eyes tilted upward to the grand array of decorations in the room. Tulip flowers were wrapped around pillars and the balustrade of a mezzanine a level where violinists played their serene music. Clara seemed entranced by this music, listening with her head angled to one side. Yes, I can see her. Horatio found it rather difficult to take his eyes away now he had seen her. There was something in the way she smiled as she listened to the music and how her eyes danced over the people that made him long to be by her side. Doesn't she look beautiful this evening? Eleonora said leadingly. Mother. I know what you are doing. His voice grew wary. What am I doing? Eleonora asked, a tone of innocence in her voice. Horatio turned narrowed eyes on his mother. I thought we had this conversation the other day. Lady Clara is my friend and nothing more. His words were about to prompt a response. Eleonora's lips parted and her cheeks flushed, clearly ready to argue with him when his father took Eleonora's arm. Dear, let us dance, Patrick said swiftly. Now, Eleonora was flummoxed. You hardly ever wish to dance these days. I find myself suddenly taken up by the idea. He didn't give her chance to argue and drew her away, nodding to Horatio in understanding as he passed. Horatio chuckled at his father's quick work and would have to thank him later. Despite his wish to argue with his mother on how Clara was merely his friend, as Horatio topped up his claret glass, his eyes kept returning to Clara in the room. When two gentlemen approached her, eagerly trying to get her attention, he spilt his claret over the nearest drinks table. Damn, what is wrong with me? He hastened to mop up the spilt red liquid, though as he worked his eyes were on Clara across the room. Surely she didn't intend to dance with one of these gentlemen. One was far too much of a dandy for her, and the other was likely to fall over his own feet and trip her up too. As one took her hand, intending to lead her to the dance floor, Horatio lost his restraint. Placing his glass down on the table, he crossed the room, intending to intervene, but he was too slow. By the time he reached her point in the room, Clara was on the dance floor, and the dandy had captured her attention completely. A fop of a man. The insults that formed in Horatio's head hardly made sense to himself, but he didn't hold back. He merely kept thinking such things repeatedly as he gazed at Clara. As she began to dance, he wondered why she had refused to dance with him the first night. She had claimed she wasn't much of a dancer, and granted she was a reserved dancer, but she had an elegance to her movements that not every lady had. I would have enjoyed such a dance, I am sure of it. Mr. Fitzroy, you look quite lost in thought. The voice broke him out of his stare. He had to snap his gaze away from Clara, looking to the lady that had approached at his side. It was Miss Harriet Pilkington, who hastened to curtsy and fluttered her fan in front of her. She kept that fan rather close to the neckline of her gown, rather than near her face, 
clearly trying to draw his gaze in one particular direction. He could have laughed at the obvious intention to allure him, but he merely smiled. I'm afraid I was quite lost. Horatio glanced briefly in Clara's direction, wondering why it bothered him so much to see her dancing with the dandy. She deserves a better dance partner, that is all. One might say you are lost in admiration, Miss Pilkington teased him. Pray tell, who are you staring at? She stepped close, under the pretense of trying to see where he was looking, but he could see what she was really doing. She came so near she was trying to draw him into scenting her perfume. It was rather too flowery for his taste and excessive in its use of lavender, but he couldn't deny standing so close to the lady had its charms. She had a beauty to her, even if it was not Clara's kind of beauty. Why am I comparing her to Clara? You wish to know who I am staring at? He laughed. I am fond of gossip, Mr Fitzroy. She giggled, as if with innocence. I do not doubt many here tonight will be fascinated to see who you dance first with tonight. She eyed him carefully, offering a smile. You are leading me, Miss Pilkington. Perhaps a little, she confessed. Yet my dance card is empty for the first number. Then how could I miss this opportunity? He took the dance card from her wrist, playfully leaning toward her as he wrote his name upon the first dance. As he finished, he glanced up to the dance floor, aware that every few seconds he seemed to be looking at Clara's way. What is wrong with me this evening? Shall we? Miss Pilkington asked, gesturing to the dance floor. Let's. He drew her forward, making a quick decision as he did so. Little good could come from staring at Clara so much. For what purpose did it serve? It would only confuse him, much more than it already had. As he bowed to Miss Pilkington and she curtsied, Horatio made a promise to himself. I will not look at Clara and her suitors another time tonight. She is my friend and nothing more. She will enjoy her evening and I will enjoy mine apart from her. Clara, I am pleased to see you have been dancing tonight, Clara. The words startled her. Clara had found a quiet corner to herself. There was a cluster of chairs in a marble alcove in the corner of the room, and she was sat in one of them with a glass of champagne that she frequently lifted to her lips. The chair beside her was suddenly occupied by her father. It gladdens my heart to see you dancing. Pray, tell me you enjoyed yourself, he asked. A little. She smiled for her father, not willing to tell him why she had retreated to this alcove. A part of her had hoped that if she had danced tonight, maybe Horatio would have asked her to dance again, seeing she was open to the idea this evening. As it was, he hadn't looked at her once. From the moment she had come off the dance floor from her first dance, she had looked for him, but his attention was taken up elsewhere. It was not only plain for her to see, but so obvious that she'd heard others gossip in passing about the rogue Mr Fitzroy and just how many ladies he was charming tonight. Pray dance again, Gregory pleaded and patted her shoulder. Do not drink so many of those either. His words made her pause with the champagne saucer hovering on her lips before he stood to his feet and walked off, leaving her alone again. Despite his words, she downed what was left in her glass rather glad for the distraction the alcohol afforded her. Involuntarily, her eyes searched the room and she found Horatio. He was dancing another time with Miss Pilkington, which made it his second dance of the night with her. He'd danced with five different ladies at least, each of whom had bustled off the floor with a joyous manner, blushing deeply and standing so close to him that Clara felt heated just watching them. Bet she was wrong. The thought cut through Clara as she looked down at the empty glass in her hand. It was plain that she was not special enough to catch Horatio's eye, quite literally it seemed. They had been in the same room all night and he hadn't looked at her once, let alone come over to talk to her or ask her to dance. Their evening spent together with their parents, where they had talked so easily with one another, now seemed like a creation of her imagination rather than reality. Oh my goodness! Another plopped into the chair beside her. Miss Pilkington 
must have finished her dance with Horatio, for she flung herself down with a dramatic tone, giggling away and waving her hands in front of her face. Your friend certainly is a charmer, is he not, Lady Clara? she asked. That giggle began to grate on Clara's nerves. It sounded more like the cackle of a jackdaw than a laugh at all. Yes, so I hear. Clara was non-committal in her answer as she turned to the lady that she had so often called a friend. You seem to be a favourite of his tonight. Two dances, can you believe it? He asked me for two dances. She sat tall in her chair with her hands to her chest. My father did tell me I had caught his eye, but I did not dare believe it. Oh, my friend, may I tell you a great secret? Well, I... Oh! Clara didn't have chance to refuse, for Miss Pilkington had grabbed her arm and tugged her forward. The two ended up leaning together, in danger of both falling out of their chairs as Miss Pilkington whispered to her conspiratorially. I believe that I will not be hoping in vain when I think of the gentleman. She continued with that increasingly insufferable giggle. Is it wrong, my friend, to hope to catch the eye of a gentleman such as Mr Fitzroy? Oh, my heart, I am having palpitations because I am so excited. Here, hold my hand, that will calm me. Clara had no choice in the matter. Miss Pilkington grasped her hand so tightly that her fingers were sore. Rest yourself, Clara adopted a kindly tone. It is good to see you so excited, but remember what gossip we heard. She tried to offer a warning. The ladies say he is a rogue, that one night he gives his attention to one lady, and the next night he thinks of another. Perhaps so, but what is so wrong with longing for a gentleman of experience? Ha! Her words made Clara blush deeply. You are happy for me, are you not? She said softly. I would hate to think I had trodden on any toes, Lady Clara. Why would you think that? Clara bit her lip, not wanting to give anything away. Well, you were friends once. I did wonder if perhaps you intended for there to be something more at any point. The plain way in which Miss Pilkington spoke made Clara's heart sink in her chest. It was easy to see that Miss Pilkington didn't ask out of fear of hurting a friend. She looked far too eager for an answer, for she was looking to root out gossip. I know the two of you seem far apart after all. He is so handsome and quite the centre of attention, whilst you prefer corners of rooms such as this one, do you not? The subtle insult cut Clara to the core. The words could have been brushed off, but it was the mischievous smile on Miss Pilkington's lips that showed her real intention behind the words. She meant to put Clara down. She sat very still, her hand limp in Miss Pilkington's own. Yet there is no accounting for the human heart, is there? Miss Pilkington continued on when Clara made no effort to answer her. You may care for him despite the difference between you. If you are seeking gossip, then I am afraid I will disappoint. Clara retracted her hand from Miss Pilkington's. I wish you a good evening, Miss Pilkington. If you are in favour tonight, as you hope to be, perhaps Mr Fitzroy wishes to dance with you again. I'd hate for you to waste your time with me. Her wry words didn't appear to affect the lady beside her at all. Nevertheless, Miss Pilkington clearly understood she was being dismissed and stood to her feet. Yes, you are right. Perhaps he hopes for a third dance. Maybe he even wishes to speak to me. I'll have to make sure he knows my father is here. With these words, Miss Pilkington hurried off, not once glancing back to look at Clara. Insufferable, Clara muttered, sitting back in her chair and staring down once more at the empty glass, wishing there was more to drink inside it. It was plain that Miss Pilkington had wanted to do nothing more than crow about how she was the centre of Mr Fitzroy's attention. Perhaps she is no real friend to me at all. Clara's thought was soon answered, for a little later she saw Miss Pilkington whisper to some of their mutual friends and point in Clara's direction. Realising she had been isolated and was alone in the corner of the room, Clara stood to her feet and walked away. As she went to pour herself a second champagne, she looked for Horatio once more, but found he was as distracted as he had been all evening. He was dancing with another of her friends now, Lady Caroline Walters, 
and seemed so charmed that he couldn't take his eyes off her face. Lady Caroline was a beauty indeed, with captivating green eyes and auburn hair so bold, it was as if she had flames of fire growing from her. She cut a dashing figure across the floor too, dancing so freely that many turned to stare at her. Clara's eyes drifted down to her rather plain pastel blue gown. Little wonder he has not looked at me all. Chapter 8 Clara Have some self-control, you fool, Clara muttered to herself as she waited in the sitting room for their guests to arrive. It had been two days since the ball, and once again Baron and Baroness of Aldington were to visit for dinner along with their son, Horatio. Tonight, I will not be distracted by handsome looks and kind words. I know the real Horatio now, and he is a charmer and a rogue, nothing more. She nodded to herself and turned to face the door, just as the sound of a carriage was heard beyond the window. Flanked by candles, the sitting room was flooded with golden light that glinted off the crystalware nearby. That light seemed magnified when the door opened and their guests arrived, with Gregory and Marianne hurrying them inside. Dinner will be ready shortly, Gregory said, clearly part way through a conversation with the Baron and his wife. Come, let me fetch you your usual drinks, and we can talk of the ball the other night. I see your son was quite the favourite of the evening. He was, wasn't he? the Baroness said with a great smile. I do not yet know a lady who has turned him down. Clara thought she groaned inwardly, but to her dismay, the sound escaped her. Fortunately, only her mother standing beside her was the one to hear, and Marianne looked at her wide-eyed. What's all this about me? Horatio asked as he stepped through the door, clearly having finished passing his frock coat to the butler. Clara this time didn't allow her mind to think of his handsome face or the charming way he laughed off the lady's attention. She thought of the claret glass her father passed her instead and sipped from it. You know what we are talking of, the Baroness waved him off. You indulge in being the centre of attention far too much. Nonsense, it's simply because I know I'm unworthy of it so I take the opportunity to laugh at people's folly for giving their attention to me. His wit made them all laugh, apart from Clara. She was careful to take a seat a little distance from the parents, at the far side of the room. On a table beside her was a book she was planning on reading, so she could avoid talking to Horatio. But to her surprise, he came and sat beside her, without hesitation. It left her with only the time to pick up the book, though she was unable to open it. Ah, he has noticed I exist tonight. A book. Surely you do not intend to read tonight. He took the book from her hands. Why not? she asked. I have been enjoying my book. Hmm. He frowned as he looked down at the book. The Lady Clara I know would rather have an adventure than read of it. Well, what adventure can I have here in this room with you? She pointed out and reached forward trying to take the book back from him. He clearly heard something in her words that she did not, for his eyebrows raised and he looked at her with a mischievous smile. Many adventures indeed, Clara, he said, taking the book out of her reach. Oh, you are flirting with me now, she accused, making a grab for the book but failing. I couldn't resist. You were the one who made it so easy. Besides, he held the book behind his back so she couldn't get it. I stand by my declaration. We could have many adventures indeed. She blushed at his words and shook her head, laughing deeply. They both fell quiet as Gregory came over, offering a glass of claret to Horatio before he retreated to the other side of the room. Still, I'd rather you talk to me than read your book all evening, Horatio said, turning to face her with enthusiasm in his movements. You wish to talk to me? she said dubiously. Could you ever doubt it? Hmm, she pretended to be deep in thought, tapping her chin. Once more she was shocked how easy it had been to fall into conversation with Horatio, as if there were no barriers between them. I seem to remember a recent event where you were quite unbothered by my company. We did not speak all night. Ha, huh. 
You speak of the ball, he asked, leaning toward her. She saw the opportunity and reached forward, trying to take her book. May I point out that you did not come to speak to me either? It was rather difficult to speak to you when you danced every dance. You only came off the dance floor to breathe. She was about to get hold of the book when his hand found hers. That sudden touch made her gasp as he pulled her hand away. He quickly released her hand and moved the book further behind him. I was enjoying dancing. You should dance more yourself, he gestured to her. You might enjoy it. I was in need of a good dance partner. She held her hand out to him. Now pray, hand me my book. You only needed to intimate you wished for a dance. I would have happily asked to be your dance partner. He winked at her, prompting her to narrow her eyes. I am not one of the ladies you can charm with your simpering smiles and winks, Horatio. Her curtness must have been the thing to make him laugh, so deeply that she was shocked, for she had feared he would have been angry with her. Indeed you are not. Let us talk of something else then, and I promise to be myself. He shook himself. What was that? You shook like a dog shedding water. She gestured to him. That was me getting rid of the other side of my personality. Now I am the man you know again. He smiled and leaned back on the settee, turning to face her completely. Let us talk of your adventures recently. My adventures? I thought we had been over this. You were the one who had ventured off to the continent. I have no such tales to tell. She sat back, sipping her wine. Not one? he asked, his brow furrowed to a notch. Is there nowhere you have been, as of late, somewhere beyond the estate walls? Well, there is perhaps one place. She sat forward a little, startled to see he matched her stance, moving so close that she could smell his cologne. The scent of pine and sandalwood filled her nostrils. Somewhere we have been before. Do you remember a place called Corfe Castle, not far from here? How could I forget it? he asked, his lips spreading into a smile. You and I ran away there one day when we were younger. Your father was the one to find us in the castle ruins, just before it was getting dark. We said it felt like a magical place, she reminded him. The top of the world, he agreed, mimicking the words they'd said back then. You climbed onto a ruined wall, and I had to catch you when you fell. You did not, she objected. I did too. He nodded. Then you ran away from me quite quickly after that, saying we were being inappropriate. We had no chaperone, she reminded him. We've never liked having a chaperone. He shook his head. I'd always rather talk freely with you, Clara. Trying to charm again. She saw her opportunity and reached behind him for the book. This time she managed to get hold of it and held it up in triumph. Speaking the truth. He didn't look away from her eyes with the words. The sincerity had her pausing and her grasp falling limp on the book. He snatched the book from her before she could stop him. Oi, she murmured. I would be disappointed to sit here with you and watch you read when we can talk like this instead. Would you not rather talk with me, Clara? I mean, Lady Clara. He cursed under his breath. I cannot get used to using your title, can I? It seems you cannot, Mr Fitzroy. She used his title, showing she had no problem with his own. If I cannot read my book, what shall we do to pass the time? We shall talk and do something else. He tossed the book down and grasped her hand, pulling her to her feet. Clara glanced briefly to their parents, where Marianne and the Baroness looked their way, watching them closely. Horatio led her to the card table at the side of the room before he released her hand. The last time we played, you won every game. He waved a finger at her. I hope you'll take pity on me and at least let me win one game tonight. That would be making things too easy, she said in challenge, picking up the pack of cards. My lady, are you well? Betsy's question had Clara turning away from the vanity mirror and looking at her friend. They were in her chamber with just one candle beside them. The dim orange light made it rather difficult to see Betsy's features, but she could just about see the furrowed brows. 
I do not know. I cannot explain it. Clara shook her head. This evening has quite baffled me, that is certain. Baffled you? Why? Betty stopped taking down the updo Clara's rather wild hair had been persuaded into and grabbed a nearby stool. She drew it beside Clara and sat down, so they were at eye level. What has happened? Mr Fitzroy and his family came round this evening, did they not? They did. Oh, Betchy, he makes no sense to me. Clara waved a hand dismissively in the air and sat back. Before this evening, I was so certain I knew who Horatio was. I thought that any time he'd been with me was perhaps something of an act, and the real him was this roguish character that dances with eight women in one night and gives consequence to proud ladies like Miss Pilkington. And he is not? Betchy asked, her small smile just visible in the candlelight. I do not know any more. Clara shook her head. Tonight, he was as he was before again. With me, it's as if he is a different man entirely. He is more like the boy I knew, merely matured into a man. Then we go to balls and that man vanishes into a charmer. Goodness, I declare I do not know which is the act and which is the real man any more. Both could be the real man, Betchy said warningly, chewing her lip. I pray that is not true. Clara reached for a second candle and lit it using the first, watching as the tallow stick took light and filled the air with its soft lavender scent from the leaves that had been wound into the tallow. I fear I have a confession to make, Betchy. What is it? she asked, her tone soft. Tonight, I felt as if my heart was on a precipice. Clara thought herself a fool, yet she went on regardless. I felt so close to Horatio, as if we were not only the greatest of friends, but something more. I fear I'm losing my heart to him. You are in love with him? Surely not. Clara shook her head. But perhaps some day I could be. I feel in danger of it. Yet my heart is only at risk with the man who came here tonight laughing with me and talking of adventure. My heart is simply numb when it comes to seeing the man who would rather charm every other woman in the room but me. I'd say any woman would feel the same. Betche leaned forward and took her hand. My Larry, if you feel so strongly for Mr Fitzroy, would it be so wrong to say something? Say something? Oh no, I could not. She stood to her feet and dropped Betche's hand, turning in a circle. How could I? The other night at the ball I was as invisible to him as a fly on the wall. No, I couldn't say anything to him. Not when he sees me as nothing more than a convenient friend to be picked up and put down at will. I am sure that is not how he sees you. Yet the lack of enthusiasm in Betchy's voice told Clara everything she needed to know. It was a possibility, and Betchy couldn't be confident it was not the case. Clara moved to stand in front of her mirror, the second candle now adding some more light so she could see something of her figure reflected. I just feel as if I am not enough. She confessed her deepest fear aloud. Maybe if I was something more. I do not know, maybe more beautiful, more confident, a better dancer, maybe even talented in some way. Maybe then he would notice me. I like you as you are. Betchy's words made Clara smile and turn to her friend. You are kind to me. Yet, if you feel so strongly about this, then there is something that can be done, she said. The words slowly and moved to her feet. What? Clara asked. Betchy walked toward her, so nervous that her hands fidgeted together. I have heard of a lady in town who helps women. The words came slowly. Helps them how? Clara's words were quiet, as she observed the way Betchy bobbed on her toes, unable to settle. She's a healer, but she also helps women in need. I've heard she's made potions to make women more beautiful, and tonics to give ladies confidence. All such things are simple concoctions, she says, a matter of herbs. The words escaped Betchy in a rush. To change a woman? Well, that sounds quite mad. Clara laughed a little at the idea, 
though it died quickly enough. I should not change myself, should I? Not for any man. Yes, I quite agree. Betchy nodded with vigour, but they both fell quiet swiftly. Clara considered the idea, turning to look at herself in the mirror. She couldn't deny the idea of being more beautiful appealed, as did the thought of having more confidence. Anything at all could help her in capturing the attention of Horatio. Then a thought struck her, as if she had been hit by a lightning bolt. No, I will have no need for such services, Clara shook her head. I do not need to manipulate matters. I will simply be happy with the lot I've been dealt in life. She forced a smile. Maybe in time I will lose any hope that I have placed on Horatio. I, I, as you wish, my lady, but let me know if you change your mind. Betchy returned to the vanity table, hurrying to put away some things, but Clara didn't move just yet. She turned and looked at her reflection one last time in the mirror, deep in thought. I wonder who this... Chapter 9 Horatio Well, I know where you'll be spending your time, Horatio teased James at his side as they approached the garden party together. The event had been organised by Horatio's parents, meaning James could stay quite easily at the end of the garden, where a table had been set up for ladies' maids and footmen to attend and share a drink. Hmm, James said distractedly, hurrying out of the door, his head already turned toward the table in high expectation. Ha! I'm just a blurry shape to you now, aren't I? Your mind is elsewhere, completely. He waved a hand in emphasis in front of his valet's face, watching as James laughed at himself and shook his head. I know, I know, he muttered, chuckling. It's a little absurd, isn't it? Yet I can't help it. Ah, there she is. His laughter died and he took a deep breath as they stepped out onto the garden terrace. Horatio followed James's stare, looking to the table at the far end of the terrace, set for the maids and footmen to take their tea. It was not as grand as the tables that had been set out for the guests, but Horatio supposed he should be at least content that his parents had bothered to arrange anything for the staff at all. He'd been to many events in the past where no such consideration had been given. Maids and footmen were expected to wait by carriages or hover in the kitchens, where they had to hope the cook would be able to spare something for them if they were thirsty or hungry. Betchy, Clara's maid, was amongst the bustle around this table. Busy pouring herself tea, she seemed equally eager to look for someone. She clearly sought out James, for when she saw him, her eagerness to raise a hand and wave resulted in her spilling her tea over the rim of her cup and burning her hand. God's wounds, Horatio muttered, to affect a lady so much that she no longer knows what to do with herself. It must be a nice feeling. It is, rather, James confessed. It's nice to know I'm not the only one who feels as if he's acting a fool. Have a good time, sir. You too, though I do not think I need to give the well wish. As Horatio watched James hurry off to join Betchy, who was now hastening to mop up the tea from her hand, he sighed a little, staring at the two of them. I know what it is like to have a woman hang on my very words, charmed, interested, yes, but that... The more he stared at Betchy and James together, the more certain he was he'd never experienced an emotion quite like the one they were sharing. There was a deeper connection and a more intimate longing to be beside one another. As James reached her, Betchy smiled and he reached for her hand, mopping up the tea for her. What has you so distracted then today? A familiar voice disturbed Horatio's thoughts and he looked round to see that one of the guests from the main tables had wandered over to join him. Would it by any chance be my lady's maid and your valet? Clara's voice was teasing as she moved to his side. In her hands, she carried a teacup and saucer and lifted the cup to her lips, taking a small sip. The moment he saw her, Horatio felt a smile tug at his lips. There was something about Clara's presence since he had returned that made him feel lighter and infinitely happier. I was just thinking, he moved to her side as they both stared at the others, meaning he could whisper, how joyous they look. You'd think they were the only two people in the garden. It is love, Clara said with a shrug. 
I hear it can make one do foolish things. Such as pouring tea over oneself, Horatio teased, and she narrowed her eyes playfully. Or tripping up, she pointed out as James managed to trip over his own feet as he helped Betsy and nearly fell on the table beside him. Horatio and Clara laughed together before he encouraged her to turn away with him. Let's give them their privacy. Together they walked toward the main party. Across the veranda, circular tables had been set out, covered in white lace tablecloths. The Delftware porcelain had been laid out for the occasion, in blue and white colours, the blue paint so bright it was as if drops of the sky had fallen to the tables. On top of cakes plates and stands, a myriad of cakes and types of bread sat, ready to be eaten. Around the tables people sat and stood, eager in conversation. When Miss Pilkington and a few other ladies looked Horatio's way, he found his pace faltering, coming to a complete stop. Is something wrong, ho? Clara caught herself stopping too and closing her eyes. Ha! I knew I was not the only one struggling with formal addresses. He gestured to her with amusement. You nearly called me by my Christian name, Lady Clara. Perhaps I did. She shook her head at herself. Sometimes it feels easy to be as we were before. I know what you mean, he whispered, and drew her to the nearest table beside them, avoiding the group of ladies that were staring his way. Abruptly, he didn't want to be near them. He couldn't put his finger on what had changed. Yet for some reason after seeing James with Betsy, Horatio wasn't in the mood for surface charisma and charm just to see a lady smile. He'd rather have a real conversation that could truly bring him happiness. He'd rather stay with Clara. He took a seat and gestured for her to sit beside him. You wish me to sit here? Clara asked, her eyebrows raising as she did so. Of course. What is so shocking about that? I cannot be the only one to have notice it the lady is that covet your attention so much are batting their eyelashes hoping you will join their table, she whispered mischievously as she took her seat. He chuckled at her words and shook his head. I don't remember saying I wished to join them. I'd rather sit with you today. He could have sworn at his words her smile grew a little broader. He reached for one of the teapots and poured out a cup of tea for himself before topping up her cup too. I should feel honoured. There was intrigue in her tone. You are in the mood to be mischievous, he said, pointing a finger at the playful smile on her lips. Perhaps I am. She nodded her head at the other ladies once more. I thought you rather enjoyed their attentions. What man doesn't like the attentions of a lady, he whispered. Oh, proud indeed, she laughed, reaching for one of the cakes and offering him a slice first. A little. He sighed with the words. One of my many faults. Many? You think you have many faults? she asked, her brows furrowing together. I do not doubt I do. He turned completely on the chair, fixing his attention on her. You must know who I really am by now, Clara, better than anyone. This time he didn't correct himself to use her title. I like to think I do, she whispered, though her eyes didn't meet his, for she had busied herself with the cakes. You are perhaps a little proud. See, I knew it. He snapped his fingers, as if he had won some prize with the words. Yet you have surprised me today. Her eyes flicked to the ladies before returning to meet his. I didn't think you'd sit with me when you could sit with them. There was something in the words that cut through his playfulness. He lifted his teacup to his lips and took a gulp, distracting himself. When he burnt his tongue, he winced, still watching her closely. What did that mean exactly? Fear began to overtake him as he stared at Clara. It came with the realisation that she was the closest friend he had, not only here in Dorset, but anywhere. Not at university nor even on the continent had he been with anyone who knew him so well or felt he could be himself with. She was something special to him. There was a connection between them that no other could feel. He rather imagined some thread connected them, perhaps tied from her wrist to his, invisible to the naked eye but there nevertheless. 
The fear came with the thought that maybe she didn't realise how much he valued her friendship above all others. I would rather be here as I said, he spoke simply, smiling once more. Now, what shall we talk about today? Perhaps your horse rides as of late. Have you been back to Corfe Castle? I have, she nodded. It has not changed much since we went as children, but you should see it again. They've let the grass grow wild and the meadow flowers are coming up too. There is something ethereal about the place now. I'd like to see it again. We should go sometime, together. The idea seemed wonderful to him. It had been so long since he'd been to Corf, and he could remember feeling at the top of the world when he was there. Clara's smile broadened into something, an emotion he could not quite put his finger on. Was that an expression of hope? Utter happiness, perhaps? Clara, I... He had softened his words, hoping to tell her something of how much her friendship meant to him, when a shadow passed over the two of them. He broke off abruptly, looking up to see Miss Pilkington by their side. There you are, Mr Fitzroy. She stepped toward him, a hand upon his shoulder. His eyes looked at the touch, thinking that he should be thrilled. Ordinarily, he liked such stolen touches. They were an indulgence at such a public event, but this one left him feeling empty. The other ladies and I have been desiring you at our table. Surely you will join us. Your mother tells us you have great stories to tell from the continent. Well, I... Horatio paused, looking to Clara beside him. Any semblance of a smile that she'd had before was now gone. She busied herself sipping tea and avoided his gaze completely. Perhaps in a short while. Oh, please do not disappoint us, Miss Pilkington said sweetly. I am sure Lady Clara could spare you for a few minutes, could you not? She appealed directly to Clara. Of course, Clara nodded. Go as you wish to, Mr Fitzroy. He sighed deeply and stood to his feet, carrying his teacup and saucer with him. As you wish, Miss Pilkington. He offered to follow her with a rather forced smile, but when he was only two steps away, he looked back at Clara. Her eyes didn't follow him, and she kept her focus purely on her cake plate in front of her. He couldn't help feeling he'd made a mistake. Parting from Clara's side made him feel bereft. I should have stayed. Clara. Clara downed what was in her teacup, the sadness blooming in her stomach. She rather hoped if she ate and drank quickly, she could escape this garden party just as fast too. When her eyes crossed the garden, though, and she looked to Betchy, she realised she could not escape yet. Betchy and James were standing together by the servants' tea table, so close to one another that it might certainly raise a few eyebrows, though they were so lost in conversation they didn't appear to notice. Clara knew at once she couldn't take her friend away from such a happy moment, even as Clara felt quite miserable. Sitting back in her chair, Clara looked round, her eyes dancing between the tables and the potted palms nearby on the veranda, searching for Horatio. He was a short distance away, standing at the table occupied by Miss Pilkington, Miss Withers and Lady Caroline Walters. Horatio must have made some sort of jest, for they all giggled demurely, lifting fans to hide their lips. Miss Pilkington laid a hand to his arm as she laughed too, and the jealousy spiked within Clara. It was an ugly feeling, one that had her shoulders sinking and her eyes dwelling on the lady's virtues. Lady Caroline was easily the most beautiful, with the bold auburn hair that took the form of any updo she persuaded it into. She turned more than just Horatio's head, who was smiling at her now. The greyness of Miss Pilkington's eyes was a different allure altogether, a smoky one that had Clara lifting a silver spoon from beside her, trying to gauge her reflection within its shimmering belly. Her reflection was upside down, and far from the fine features that the other ladies possessed. Her hair was wild and reluctant to be persuaded into its updo, with wisps hanging down in tendrils. Her eyes were dark, rather the colour of mud, and there was nothing special in them. Had she been alone, she would have been tempted to pull and poke at the skin around her eyes, seeing if she could make it any different. 
but she was far too much in public for that. Quietly, she discarded the silver spoon beside her, choosing not to look at herself again. She supposed this was a habit she'd had for a long time, a need to every now and then look at her reflection, an action that never gave her pleasure. She could remember doing it from a young age. The first day she had stared so long in a mirror had been a day where many children had gathered at her father's house to celebrate Yuletide. Daniel had been there and had barely left Clara's side, and Horatio was too, along with lots of girls and boys from the town. One of the girls had taken a disliking to Clara. Her name was Miranda, who had long since moved away from the town. But the words she had uttered that day to Clara had stuck with her. She had called Clara ugly and prodded at her cheek. Daniel had snatched the girl's hand away and stood between them, accusing Miranda of being jealous, but Clara had seen it for what it really was. Miranda had been thrilled to see the Duke's daughter was an ugly little thing. All afternoon she'd called Clara ugly with witch-like features. It didn't seem to matter how long ago that memory had occurred. It stayed with Clara. I am still that same girl, am I not? With the witch-like features, it is just that I am older now. Oh, what a charming event this is, Marianne gushed, suddenly appearing at her side. You seem to be enjoying yourself, Mother. Clara forced a smile onto her lips as she poked and prodded at her cake. Naturally. The Baroness always holds such interesting events. Marianne poured herself a cup of tea. Finding Clara's empty, she topped up hers too, disappointing Clara a little. She planned on finishing that one just as quickly as the one before it, so hopefully she could leave in the not-too-distant future. The company is so fine here, do you not think? Yes, I do. Clara's eyes lifted to Horatio across the garden, though she tried to hide it from her mother. To her surprise, Horatio was looking her way. Her heart ached in her chest for a second as he smiled at her. Oh, he's looking at me. Yet the moment did not last. Lady Caroline called his attention away and his eyes went to her. His body turned so much that his back was soon facing Clara. The disappointment bloomed in her chest and her shoulders slumped. Sit up straight, dear. One will think you're sick. Marianne's words prompted Clara to sit taller, though she couldn't fix the saddened expression on her face. How come you are not sitting with your friends? She gestured to Miss Pilkington and the others. I do not know. I find I have no wish to today. She didn't wish to explain to her mother that she feared Miss Pilkington in particular was no real friend to her at all, not after what had been said between them at the ball a few days before. You were speaking to Mr Fitzroy a few minutes ago, Marianne said with interest as she sipped her tea. I would have thought that would have put a smile on your face. He is my friend. Clara sighed deeply and turned to her mother, noting the way Marianne watched her closely. The skin around her eyes crinkled a little. Worried her mother was developing suspicions of what she truly felt, Clara sought out a different subject. When is Daniel coming home? Your brother is enjoying himself, Marianne shrugged. I wouldn't expect him back any time soon from the continent, dear. I might not expect it, but I hope for it. Clara felt rather alone, despite the busyness of the veranda. At least if Daniel returned, she would have one good friend there with her. Gentlemen enjoy their time on the continent. It gives them freedom. Marianne laughed at the idea. Take Mr Fitzroy, for instance. Why, I would not be surprised if he intended to return to the continent or even travel our country more and explore. When he talks of his adventures, those fine eyes of his light up. Yes, they do. Clara began to chew the inside of her mouth, pushing her cake away for she had no interest in it any more. Perhaps he does not intend to stay in Dorset. Perhaps not. Yet I notice this idea makes you sad. Marianne leaned toward her, those eyes calculating once more. Care to tell me why that is, dear? I have simply enjoyed being with my friend again. I'll be sorry to lose him. Clara prayed it sounded convincing, 
and soon enough her mother retreated, sitting straight in her chair once more and nodding. Yes, of course, Marianne nodded. Clara kept the truth well hidden, lifting her teacup to mask any tightness there might have been around her lips as she gritted her teeth. It is jealousy, I feel, pure and simple. He'd rather travel and charm ladies as he is doing so now than stay here and talk to me. The words came with certainty, for despite his declaration to stay and talk to her that day, he'd been drawn away by Miss Pilkington. Chapter 10 Clara The scent of roses and lavender filled the air as Clara bathed, with her hair in wet tendrils bobbing on the surface of the water and the palms of her hands pressing to the walls of the copper bathtub. One day had passed since the garden party, and Clara was struggling to raise a smile. It didn't seem to matter how many times she urged her head to rule her heart, telling herself it was absurd to be so miserable over a man that didn't intend to return her feelings. Still, her heart won out, and misery seemed ever-present. Closing her eyes, she dipped under, letting the warm and soapy water cover her face and her body. She hovered there for a second in the water, trying to think of nothing else except bathing, before she rose above the water, sitting tall. Her hair became plastered to her neck, and looking down, she saw her hands were red and the fingers were puckered, like dried dates. I bet I'm a sight for sore eyes now. She turned away from the mirror she knew was nearby, not wanting to look at her reflection within it. Her hair would be a mess, her face red, and the dark eyes probably even duller than usual, thanks to her poor night's sleep. My lady? Is all well? Betchy's voice called from the other side of the screen in the guard robe. Yes, Clara said, choosing not to elaborate. She moved the water over her body, then stood to her feet, reaching for the cotton towel that Betchy had left on a stand nearby. As she began to dry herself, she heard Betchy's light voice, for she was singing happily once more. Where's all the joy and mirth made this town a heaven on earth? Oh, they're all fled with thee, Robin Adair. Clara smiled a little to hear the tune. It was a love ditty, Irish in origin and Betchy had sung it so much as of late that Clara had expected her to change the name Robin to James. Once Clara was covered by the towel, she stepped out from behind the screen, hearing Betchy still singing as she hastened to her duties. It is good to see you so happy, Clara said kindly as she walked to another screen where Betchy had the clothes set up. Thank you, Betchy giggled, but when Clara didn't match the sound, that giggle quickly fell. Clara passed behind the screen, removed the towel and passed a chemise over her head, where Betchy quickly joined her, helping her to dress. Equally, I am saddened to see you not so happy, my lady. I wish you would tell me what upsets you so. Nothing but my own foolish ideas, I assure you. Clara forced a smile as Betchy threaded her into a corset. There's nothing to be done about it, only a rap on my own knuckles for my foolishness. This is about Mr. Fitzroy? Betchy asked slowly. It is. Clara fell silent as she finished dressing. Betchy didn't push her, not until she was completely dressed. She urged Clara to sit by the fire where she began to dry her hair, combing through the tendrils as she sat so close. Betchy pulled a mirror close and propped it on a small table, preparing to fix Clara's hair into an updo shortly. The sight of her own reflection had Clara stilling, no longer running her fingers through her wet tendrils. The lavender scent of her hair mixed with the ash of the fire made an unpleasant fragrance that matched Clara's disappointment as she looked at herself. Her face was red from the shower, the rather elfin-like ears fortunately hidden by the wet hair. The eyes were nothing special, just dark and saddened. She prodded her cheeks once, wishing they glowed more as other ladies' cheeks did. Oh, I am worried for you. Betchy abruptly sat down in front of Clara, blocking out the view of the mirror. I've never seen you like this before. Goodness, something must be done. I wish to see you happy again. You are kind to me. Clara returned to combing her hair in front of the fire flames, 
trying to dry it as an idea occurred. What I would give to look a little different. Perhaps if I was not as I am, I might at least have the chance of catching Horatio's eye. Maybe there is something you could do, Clara whispered. Anything. Say what it is and I will jump to it in an instant. Her words prompted Clara to smile, seeing the excitement in Betchy's manner that practically made her bob where they sat together on the hearth rug. You mentioned before that you knew a healer in town. Clara began slowly and chewed her lip at the end of the sentence, wondering if she was doing the right thing. You said she could make tricks, tonics and the like. She can, Betchy nodded, her brows creasing a little. You wish to know more of them? You mentioned she could help a woman become more beautiful. Clara swallowed around a sudden lump in her throat, feeling her nerves so palpable at speaking of such things, her hand nearly shuddered on the comb. You talked of a tonic for confidence, too. Yes, I have heard of such things, Betchy said uncertainly. Why do you ask? It would be interesting to know more about them. Clara could see her words were not enough, for Betchy paused, her head tilted to the side. It was as though she was some bird in the garden, watching Clara with interest, her head bobbing in short, sharp movements. I see I will have to confess what I am feeling. Clara decided it was better to do it fast, to get it over with before her embarrassment grew too much. I am well aware of what I look like, Betchy. I think you are beautiful. Now, I know you are being kind. She cut off her friend mid-sentence, though the words were so gentle that Betchy didn't look shocked. I see my reflection every day. It has been my constant companion, and I do not like what I see. She lowered the comb from her hair, abandoning the endeavour to dry it. Softly, Betchy took the comb from her hand and moved around Clara, combing the knots for her. Perhaps you and I see different things when we look at you, Betchy said, her voice delicate and light. As I said, you are kind to me. Clara had a view of her reflection again in the mirror. She closed her eyes, shutting it out. I would be interested to know what this healer could do. The combing paused momentarily. Then perhaps we could talk to her. Betchy spoke with a little more confidence now. I've heard much talk about her in town. If you are interested to hear what she could do, what she could make for you, then perhaps we could write to her. Write, Clara whispered, her eyes opening. Yes. I hear she handles communications with her customers via an old oak tree on the edge of town. They exchange notes by hiding them in a hole in the tree. If you are truly interested. Betchy added the latter sentence with a little more wariness in her tone. I am, Clara nodded. I'm no fool, Betchy. I know no matter what good a healer can do, no tonic could transform me into a great beauty overnight. I do not believe in magic or any other such superstition. Yet if she could do something for me, something that would not make me grimace every time I looked at my reflection, then I would be a little happier. That is what I want. Betchy finished combing her hair and moved around her again, sitting back on the hearth rug. To see you happy, as you wish, my lady. I am sure I can make preparations for you to talk to this healer. You should put the matter into your own words, though, in this letter and I'll ensure it is delivered. Thank you, Betchy. Clara smiled a little, feeling an ounce of hope had been placed on her shoulders. A short while later, with her hair having dried by the fire and Betchy having gathered the locks into an updo, Clara sat by her writing bureau in the corner of her chamber. Betchy worked behind her, tidying up the space as Clara bent over the paper with her quill bouncing between her fingers. What to write? What to write? This thought came repeatedly, whirring around her head so that soon enough she had three different drafts, all of which she had torn up into balls of paper and tossed into the nearest copper bin, placed under her bureau. As she dipped the quill into the inkstand beside her, Betchy appeared and placed a hand to the paper. May I make a suggestion? Please do, Clara encouraged her on. I feel as if I have forgotten how to string two words together. 
Good Lord, what has become of me? I think they call it being lovesick, Betsy said sweetly, a small smile on her lips. It makes us all do odd things. Perhaps so, Clara nodded. She certainly felt a little sick at times. Her heart had placed so much hope and longing on a man that her head knew was foolish to care for. That constant argument inside of her made her feel ill every now and then. What was your suggestion? Write something from the heart, Betchy urged, nodding down at the paper before her. If what I hear of this healer is true, she has done many good deeds in town. She's charitable and kind, be honest with her, she will know how to help then. Yes, perhaps you are right. Thank you. Clara waited, though, until Betchy had wandered off to resume her tidying, before she raised her quill to paper. Something about the prospect of being completely honest made the words pour out of her, though she prayed no other would ever read this letter other than the healer. At the top of the letter, she wrote the name given to the healer. She didn't doubt it was a pseudonym used by the woman to avoid her true identity being known around town. The fact she exchanged letters with customers in a hole in an oak tree was another argument for her wish to remain unknown. Dear Bonadier, Clara paused for a minute, thinking of the name the healer had adopted. It was the Roman name for the goddess of health, protection, and women. It was an apt name indeed, if what Betchy said of her was true. I find myself writing to you as one in need today. I heard of your good works through my lady's maid, Betchy, and she assures me that you are the one in town who could help me. She has also urged me to speak to you the whole truth of my problems, in the hope you will understand my woes completely. I confess I am no fine thing to look at, ma'am. I have seen my reflection every day and been saddened by it. In my life, I have been happy to sit in corners of rooms and even stay quiet when sat amongst friends, for I know I am not one who should be the centre of attention. Yet lately, I have found my desires changing. I am sure this will be of no great surprise to you when I say, things have changed because of a gentleman. There is one whom I admire greatly. We have been friends, good friends, for many years, and now he has returned to the town. I find that my heart is at risk greater than it ever was before. Without being able to control myself, I feel I am falling in love with him. Yet when I am around him, he does not see me as I see him. He's drawn away by other women so easily, as he is fond of attention. What I long for is the chance to stand in front of him, comfortable with who I am. Perhaps if I was more beautiful, had something of a glow about me, I would feel confident enough to ask him to stay by my side. I know it is a foolish hope. I am not asking for you to make a man fall in love with me for I know such things are impossible. I merely plead for your help so that I feel comfortable in myself and happy around him. I am tired of fearing looking in my mirror. If you are able to help, please write a reply and leave it where we will deposit this letter, in the oak tree in town. Thank you for any help you might be able to give. Yours faithfully, Lady Clara Lewis. Finishing the letter, she hurried to seal it, melting the red wax that she burned in a candle flame. The red wax shone on the closed envelope as it began to dry, dulling every few seconds. My lady, my lady! Betchy's voice was suddenly excitable, hurrying near. Clara pushed the letter away, rather glad she had sealed it quickly so that Betchy would not read it. As close as she was to Betchy, it revealed the innermost secrets of her heart. That was hard to show anyone. What is it, Betchy? Clara called as Betchy appeared back in the bedchamber door. I didn't even notice you had left the room. I heard sounds downstairs. Messages have been delivered. Betchy waved an envelope in her hand, then pressed it close to her chest. I have a message, she said excitedly, and bounced on her toes. My goodness, he has written to me. Clara smiled broadly at her friend. She knew Betchy could read and write, for Clara had taken pains to ensure her lady's maid was given the opportunity to learn some years ago. It was a pleasure for her to see that James had the same fortune. Open it then, 
she pleaded with Betchy, moving to stand. What does your beau say? Betchy peeled back the letter, her cheeks blushing crimson as she read it. Clara waited patiently. When Betchy was done, she waved the letter in the air, so excitable that she could barely stand still. He asks to see me for a walk tomorrow in town, oh my heart. She placed the letter on her chest once more. I do not think I can bear this excitement. I feel so light, so happy. Goodness knows why he even looks at me. Such a man as he could have any woman. It shows his good taste. Clara calmed her friend by placing her hands on her shoulders. The way things are going, Betchy, you will be married by the end of the year. Chapter 11 Horatio I'm sorry, James. Ask me that again. I was distracted. Horatio felt something of a mess as he pulled on his tailcoat, trying to concentrate on his reflection in the mirror. The tailcoat was a fine one, and the waistcoat was a good match. He was ready for the day, yet no matter how much he tried to focus on such a thing, it soon slipped away, like sand through his fingers. Why can I not stop thinking of Clara? All night thoughts of Clara had plagued him. In his dreams, he'd kept seeing her again at the table at his mother's garden party. Sometimes she had stood up and walked away from him in that dream. Other times when Miss Pilkington tried to lure him away, he had stayed saying outright he wished to be with Clara for longer. In the end, the dreams had taken something of a strange turn. They'd shifted from reality and had become something rather fantastical. He and Clara had been walking together through the ruins of Corf Castle before she had run away from him. It was some sort of torment, for each time he had caught up to her and nearly managed to take her hand, she had danced away again and hidden behind some of the ruined walls. It was a dream of angst, for he so badly wanted to be beside her, yet couldn't quite reach her. When he eventually had found her hand in his and pulled, tugging her so that she fell toward him. Those brown eyes wide, he'd woken up with a sudden start. I was asking, sir, if I may change my day off to tomorrow instead of Sunday. James's words caught Horatio's attention. This time he shifted his focus purely to the valet who brushed down the back of Horatio's tailcoat, checking there was no dust upon it. Yes, of course, if you wish. Why is that? Horatio turned away from the mirror, looking at his valet. I have written to Betchy, James confessed with a smile. I asked her to come for a walk in town with me tomorrow, and I'm waiting for her reply. If she says yes, and you do not mind me changing my day off, then I hope to go. Of course you can, Horatio laughed with the words and stepped away, fiddling with the cuffs of his jacket. It's great to see you so enamoured, James. You should be happy. Horatio would have given James anything he wanted at that moment. James had been a good friend to him over the years, and Horatio always wished he could do more for him. To see his friend happy in love would certainly be a good start. Mind you, you look very happy now, he teased, gesturing at James's face. I confess I am. James hurried to take away Horatio's nightshirt. I have never known this feeling before. Have you, sir? What feeling is that? Horatio asked. Where you cannot stop thinking of a lady. James looked down at the nightshirt. Horatio was thankful for it, as it meant his valet didn't see the way he nearly tripped over the rug beneath him, not looking where his feet were going as his head snapped up. Cannot stop thinking of a lady. Clara walked into his mind again. He thought of her smile and the way she would often hang her head forward, a little nervous perhaps and hiding her face. Then he thought of the dream at Corf Castle and not being able to find her. He cleared his throat and shrugged. No, I have not known that feeling. The lie felt heavy on his tongue. What's going on with me? It's quite all-encompassing, James explained as he went to put the nightshirt away. I'll be glad to see her tomorrow. Yes, you must go and see Betchy. Horatio moved to his window and looked out over the estate. Something stirred inside of him. Along with the admiration he felt for James, there was a kernel of envy there. The fact James knew what he wanted so well and was determined to go after it, Horatio thought was a rare thing. 
In that moment, he wished to know what it would feel like to pine for a lady and have her long for your company too, just as James was with Betchy. The image of Clara walked into his mind again, but he pushed it away. Just because he'd had a night full of dreams about her, and he certainly had an affection for her, it didn't mean there was anything deeper there. She was his good friend, after all. It wasn't as if he was going to dream of her every night. When will you see Betchy again after tomorrow? Horatio asked, his eyes tracing over the distant horizon. He had a plan to go riding today and hoped to explore soon. Now he was older, the wilderness of the surrounding areas might look a little different to the last time he had seen them. I do not know. We will take what time we can, but... James paused, urging Horatio to look over his shoulder at his valet. I do not wish to speak out of turn. Since when have I ever cared about that? Horatio asked, shrugging. You can always speak freely with me, you know that. Very well. We do not have a lot of free time, James said slowly, his expression still uneasy. I attend to you and Betchy attends to Lady Clara. We must take a few stolen minutes together and be content with it. As James turned his back, hurrying to his tasks in the room, Horatio felt guilt bleeding through his stomach. It was rather like someone had punched him in the gut, even though he knew James meant no slight by it. Over the years it was something Horatio had observed a lot, especially on the continent. There seemed to be an unfairness to the world depending on the matter of one's birth. Just because Horatio was born the son of a baron, he had lots of free time to go exploring and do what he liked with. James was not afforded such freedoms because he was the son of a butler. The world seems a cruel place. Maybe some day the hierarchy will not be so fixed. Horatio stepped away from the window, scratching the back of his neck in thought. He could give James lots of time off in order to see Betchy, but soon enough it would raise eyebrows. Horatio could already picture his parents referring to it and suggesting his valet was slacking. James was a hard worker, and he didn't want such criticism falling upon him. Then another idea began to develop. Horatio looked back to the window and the horizon beyond. His eyes danced from the lake at the edge of his father's estate to a forest nearby, and how the dark green clumps banked against the distant hills. His explorations didn't have to be alone. He could have company as he went riding. I have an idea I'd like to suggest to you, James. Horatio's words called James to his side. Yes, sir. What if I was to invite Lady Clara to ride with me a few days each week? The prospect made him smile at once. That way you and Betchy could stand as chaperones and see each other lots. What do you think? He turned his eyes to James, watching as the young man's eyes lit up. The skin at the tops of his cheeks crinkled with the movement. You would do that, sir? For me? His tone was one of amazement. Of course, it is hardly a sacrifice. Horatio laughed and clapped James on the shoulder warmly. I will spend the time in the company of my friend, and you will be able to see the lady you are quickly falling in love with. He moved to the edge of his room, reaching for where he kept ink and paper on a writing bureau. Love? James spluttered, rather repeating the error Horatio had made earlier and tripping on the corner of the rug placed in the middle of the room. Maybe I should get rid of that rug. I do not doubt you are on its path, Horatio said, pulling out some clean paper. You talk of little else other than this lady, and you can barely say her name without smiling. That is not true. At James's refusal, Horatio's eyebrows raised in challenge. Betchy. He fought the smile, but it happened anyway. Ha! Horatio waved the paper in his direction. God have mercy, James said, turning on the spot. Cupid has been up to mischief with me, hasn't he? I'd say so. He struck you square through the heart with one of his little arrows. Horatio pulled out the chair at his writing bureau and addressed his letter to Clara. Perhaps this is what my dream meant. I'm hoping to spend more time with her. Such a longing makes sense. I enjoy her company more than any other ladies. I will write to her now to arrange matters. Fear not, James. We'll have you seeing your love many times a week if we're lucky. 
As Horatio handed his letter to the butler to be posted to Clara, he overhead his father's voice nearby. Stepping away from the front door, he peered down the corridor, seeing the door to his father's study was open. Inside, Patrick was talking with his steward, Mr. Mavers. The two seemed to be in intense discussions about the estate, prompting Horatio to wander toward the study and lightly knock on the door. Ah, Horatio. Patrick looked up, a smile appearing on his face. Am I interrupting? he asked lightly, looking between the two of them. Not at all. We were just discussing plans for the tenants. Come in, come in. Patrick beckoned him in as he stood to his feet from behind his desk. I'd be glad of your view too. He urged Horatio to look down at a map in front of him. What do you think? We're hoping to build new cottages here for the tenants and demolish these old ones. They're run down, quite dangerous in places, and it would create new farmland too. Horatio paused, staring at the plans, unsure what to answer. For so many years now he had hoped to please his father with his education. There was a pressure that hung over his head at times, reminding Horatio that some day he would be a baron, and when he took that position, he hoped his father would rest easy, knowing that the barony was in capable hands. Well, Horatio paused, some of the tenants might not be pleased, especially if they have been there for so long. That is my worry, Mr Mavis said slowly. I am suggesting we open a discussion with the tenants about the proposal. Yes, I think that wise, Horatio agreed, aware that beside him Patrick didn't nod as well. Ah, maybe that was the wrong answer. Would you excuse us for a minute, Mr Mavers? I'd like to talk to Horatio about something. Of course. Mr Mavers bowed politely and left the room. Slowly Horatio turned to face his father, waiting for him to speak. Come now, father, we both know you wish to disagree. There's no need to dally, he urged his father on. Hmm. Patrick smiled despite the grunting sound and returned to his seat. You'll have to make these difficult decisions too someday, Horatio, when you take my place. Horatio sighed deeply, not liking the idea of his father's distant death coming into conversation. We don't like talking about death, father, he reminded Patrick, prompting his father to nod. I don't like it any more than you do, but we must speak of it. Patrick sighed too and pointed a finger at the map. Being a baron and having tenants sometimes means making decisions which are not popular but are wiser. Look at these cottages. They are a hundred years old. Yes, I remember seeing them on my ride the other day. He'd ridden with Patrick out across the estate to check on the tenants. The cottages had seemed old indeed. This one on the end is dangerous. As much as the tenants do love living there, what kind of landowner would I be if I let them stay in a place that was so hazardous? Patrick shook his head and grimaced. I cannot do that. It would be risking their lives. I have a small amount of work being done on the cottage now to try and protect it, but it will not solve the problem. It will only delay it from falling down. My builder tells me the problem is structural and spreading to the other cottages. They need new housing. Horatio nodded and reached for a seat nearby, understanding his father's position now. You must make such decisions when you are barren, Patrick said again, pointing at him. Not happy decisions, but necessary ones. Anything else I should be aware of before I become Baron of Aldington? The list is getting rather big, he said playfully. You must travel, my boy. He took on a tone that mimicked his father, watching as Patrick smiled. See the world, learn from it. Go to university too and make sure you are not too wild. I'm not sure you adhered to that last one, Patrick said, a smirk on his lips. I did, mostly. His words made them laugh together. What of the drawings I made you in Venice and the study I made of the landowners in Italy? I'm applying myself, father, as you wish me to do. I promise you, when I take the position, a long while off yet, as I hope you are not going anywhere. They shared a stern look. I will be ready for it. I know, Patrick said softly. I know you will be. I just want to make sure I can still teach you things whilst I am here. 
he stood to his feet and began to roll up the map. You'll make a good baron some day, Horatio. The words made a little warmth spread in Horatio's chest. He sat very still, not wanting to show just how much the words meant to him. You'll just have to have a good baroness by your side too. Patrick's words were easy, almost thrown away as he turned and put the maps away. I beg your pardon, Horatio practically stammered with the words. A baroness? Yes. Patrick smiled and folded his arms as he turned back to face Horatio. I know what you said to your mother the other week, about not being in a rush to marry, but I hope you will someday. Remember, you'll need an heir. He turned to tidying away more maps and charts, but Horatio couldn't assist. He was sitting very still with his lips parted as he stared at his father. You need to pick your jaw off the floor, son. It's just I... Horatio paused, closing his mouth. Marriage. I haven't given much thought to it. His cravat felt abruptly tight, and he pulled at it, loosening it. That's all right. Patrick seemed unperturbed by the idea. Many marriages are arranged. We could look into one for you and find you a suitable partner. Arranged? Find one? Horatio spluttered, sitting forward. This is not like seeking out a pet, father. This is about a marriage, a partner for life. Many marriages are arranged, Horatio, Patrick said again, casting his eyes to the ceiling as if pleading to the heavens for help in this discussion. I can bring some suggestions to you. We'll see. Yet Horatio's words seemed to go unnoticed. Suddenly Patrick started talking of ladies he both knew and didn't know as possible matches. There's Miss Pilkington, of course, who you have danced with much as of late, Patrick began, shuffling his papers. She'll have a decent dowry, and she seems to have an affection for you too. Father, this is all a bit fast, isn't it? Horatio stood. Also, no, Miss Pilkington may be attentive, but she... She what? Patrick asked, his eyes on the papers. She lacks something. Horatio struggled to put into words what it was. Something about the idea of marrying Miss Pilkington made his stomach curdle. He did not like the idea at all. She may not be the cleverest of ladies, nor witty, not like Lady Clara, but she has respect. Patrick's mention of Clara had Horatio backing up. He fell into the chair behind him, his knees catching the edge of the seat. Don't think of that dream again. Even as he thought of the plea, he saw Clara running through Corfe Castle and him being unable to catch her. There's Lady Mary Stubbs, but she may have turned her attention elsewhere. It's a shame because she has an excellent dowry, Patrick said in a rush. I do not even know Lady Stubbs, Horatio said, though he feared his father didn't really hear him. Lady Caroline Walters, too. She is very accomplished, is she not? She is fond of social gatherings. You'd no doubt hold lots of parties and events here then, married to her. I cannot believe we are talking about the lady I will marry some day in this fashion. Surely there is no rush. I also do not wish to speak of them as if I am picking them out of a tailor's shop. His words made his father laugh, who shrugged. Your mother and I were happy in our arrangement, Horatio. Our parents introduced us, and we have not only been content, yet happy. Patrick looked away from the papers and eyed Horatio across the room. There's no harm in an arranged marriage. Yes, there is, Horatio whispered so quietly that as Patrick returned to his papers, he didn't hear the words. Abruptly, Horatio felt trapped, as if the walls were too near, his cravat too tight and his tailcoat too securely buttoned. He fidgeted in the seat, wanting nothing more than to be away from this conversation and far away from any prospect of an arranged marriage. He could picture what such a marriage would be like. Married to someone he didn't know, he'd feel under constant pressure to perform, to act a part. He'd rather marry someone he did know, someone he could at least be friends with. Clara came into his mind so strongly that his body stiffened. She could be a chance to escape such a marriage. Chapter 12 Clara There's a parcel for Lady Clara, too. 
the messenger handed the parcel to the butler at the door. The words caught Clara's attention. She was leaving the breakfast room and hurried to close the door behind her before creeping across the hallway, peering toward the front door. The butler was standing in the open door, taking letters from a messenger boy and a box wrapped in brown tissue paper tied up with string. Thank you. The butler wished the boy a good day, then closed the door behind him. Rather than going to interrupt breakfast, he placed the letters on a silver card tray on the hall table. The parcel he placed next to them, though he peered at it with interest. Clara stayed silent from where she stood, hidden behind a marble pillar in the hallway, waiting for the butler to depart. He did soon enough, hurrying off to the servants' quarters. When he was gone, Clara creeped around the pillar and hastened to pick up the parcel, glancing over her shoulder repeatedly in case she was seen. She didn't want to explain to anyone what was inside, and would have to think of a good lie quickly if her parents came out and saw her with the parcel. Snatching it up from its place beside the silver card tray, she hurried to the staircase nearby, practically taking the steps two at a time in her eagerness to be upstairs. In her chamber, inside, she found Betsy. The lady's maid was tidying up Clara's toilet table. At Clara's hastened entrance, she made Betsy jump so much that she nearly dropped a scent bottle and had to catch it from the air. Oh, you made me jump, Betsy said with a laugh. Goodness, I may have broken it. I am not so precious about scent bottles. Clara waved away her worry as she kicked the door shut behind her. Look what has arrived. She held out the parcel in both hands, watching as Betsy placed the scent bottle behind her on the vanity table. It has arrived, Betsy said excitedly. It has. Clara placed the box on a chaise long nearby and stood back, staring at the brown parcel. It seemed so innocuous, so plain, but she knew inside there was much to be seen. After Betsy had deposited Clara's letter in the tree, a reply quickly came. The healer, Bona Dea, had assured Clara she could help. She was sympathetic for Clara's woes, but she also issued caution in the use of some of the tonics she would send. Remember who one truly is in their heart and soul, not their appearance. This was the last line in Bonadea's letter. Clara thought of the words every now and then, though she didn't pay them any great heed. She knew what she wanted. She wanted the chance to stand at a ball or an event and feel confident enough that she could approach Horatio freely, without nerves or fear. Slowly she reached for the string around the parcel and began to untie it. Betsy moved to her side and bobbed on her toes, her excitement much more palpable. You are more excited than I am, Clara teased, as she began to pull away the brown tissue paper. I'm intrigued, I confess. You hear of these things, but to see it is another matter. Oh my. Betsy broke off as the box inside was revealed. Clara had been expecting some cardboard box, yet instead there was a fine wooden tramp box. A little like a tea caddy in structure, short and wide, the sides had been carved and whittled, as if with a small blade. The carvings formed repeated patterns of swirls and vines, each leaf coming to a perfect point. It is beautiful, Clara whispered as she reached for the lid. This Bonadea takes pride in her work, does she not? I'd say so. Betsy agreed with a hasty nod and stepped forward with Clara so they could peer inside together. Resting inside were a multitude of things that Clara began to pull out and examine. The first was a tiny bottle, much smaller than a scent bottle, with what appeared to be a dripper at one end. Scrawling black script on a label stuck to the bottle read, Belladonna Drops. Belladonna, I've heard of that, Clara whispered. As have I. My mother always called it deadly nightshade. I thought it was supposed to be quite dangerous. Betsy reached into the box and pulled out a piece of paper. Unfolding it, she found a list. Belladonna drops, she read aloud. Yes, she says here, these must be used with care. One to two drops in the eyes make the eyes shine and the pupils dilate. It is derived from a poison, so never use more than two. Oh, I see. The danger of it made Clara put the bottle down again before she reached for another. Belladonna tincture. 
at her words, Betchy looked further down the list. It says, the tincture can be diluted into tea. Use one teaspoon in a pot of hot water and no more, said to make the skin glow and hair shine. Betchy smiled a little. It sounds a little like magic, doesn't it? It does, rather. Clara laughed at the idea, reaching inside to find other things. There was a type of red rouge for the lips, said to bring a natural pinkness to the skin, and orchid perfume in a long crystal scent bottle. Orchid perfume? Said to enamour with desirable scent, Betchy said, smiling still. I might have to borrow that one. Be my guest. Clara laughed, reaching for a powder in a small tin and another slip of paper, wrapped around a vial of something that looked a little like sugar. It's a recipe for cupcakes. Designed to impress and show off skills, use this refined sugar. There are some tips here too, Betchy went on. Cucumber resting on eyes for a few minutes can reduce puffiness and signs of tiredness. Honey to skin wounds, lesions and scars can help to heal too. Goodness, it could be witchcraft. Or botany, Clara pointed out, seeing that everything which had been sent to her was a part of science. At no point had the healer professed to have power or accomplished great things. She had merely used what she knew about the natural world to offer tips to Clara. There is one thing I worry about, Betchy said, putting down the scrap of paper in her hands as Clara reached for a second slip, pressed to the bottom of the tramp box. What is that? Clara asked. If you still use all these things, will you still be you? Betchy said. Of course I will be. Clara smiled, watching as Betchy tried to meet that smile, though it seemed a struggle. This is about my appearance, not who I am inside. Yes, I suppose. Yet Betchy's voice had fallen quiet as Clara opened up the second slip of paper. Opening it up, she found a note from the healer. I wish you luck in your endeavour, my lady. I pray you will use everything I have sent you in moderation and with caution. These are supposed to enhance one's natural beauty rather than transform oneself. Write to me if there is anything else you need. Your new friend, Bonadea. Clara guessed the healer in town had never actually seen her face to face, otherwise she would not have talked of natural beauty. I must hope they are quite transformative in my case. She placed all the bottles and tins back into the tramp box, laying the slips of paper on top of them. A grain of hope began to bloom in her stomach, and she couldn't help longing to try out some of the things inside. She was reminded of being very young, when her mother had first come in and said she was getting her first dress designed for her. That day at the Modistes had been a wonderful thing. Dressing up, trying to act the part of a lady when she was but twelve was exciting. Now, once again, she felt as if she was to act a part, wearing the makeup and trying out the tinctures. Thank you, Betchy. Clara said in a rush. I pray this works. As do I, though Betchy's voice was more uncertain. Before any more words passed between them, a call came from downstairs, following the front door closing with a hefty shut. Clara, Clara, are you upstairs? Marianne was calling her. A letter has arrived for you. Judging by the seal on the back, I believe it is from Mr Fitzroy. Oh my... Clara turned her head impatiently to the door, aware of Marianne's footsteps on the staircase. Quickly hide the box! Clara whispered in a rush to Betchy. The maid grabbed the box and turned in a circle, her movements frantic and her head jerking from side to side as she looked for a place to hide it. Clara gestured to beneath the bed as she moved to the door. Clara, are you in there? Marianne called, now having reached the other side of the door. She knocked on the wood just as Clara waited for Betchy to hide the box under the pillow of the bed. She did so, but as she stood, managed to slip on the rug and fall onto the bed. Clara! Marianne called again, her hand reaching for the doorknob. Seeing she could not wait any longer, Clara opened the door. Ah, Mama, what was that you were calling to me? Clara pretended ignorance and tried to fight her intrigued gaze that kept shooting down to the letter in her mother's hands. I... Marianne trialled off, her eyes on the bed. Clara looked round to see Betchy had hurried to her feet, 
and was now pretending to remake the bed. Your maid is most attentive. Was her first attempt at the bed not good enough today? Betchy always likes things to be perfect. Clara brushed off the matter, sharing a small smile with Betchy across the room. Is that a letter for me? Yes, it is. Marianne's smile grew as she handed Clara the letter. I dare say it is Mr Fitzroy's handwriting. Do let me know later what he has to say. She walked away, casting one curious glance back to Betchy at the bed before she was gone. Clara hastened to close the door, looking at Betchy, who flopped down onto the edge of the bed. I am not cut out for lying and hiding things, Betchy whispered through a giggle. I get myself into such a fuss. You did very well. Clara was busy opening the letter, breaking the red wax seal that bore the mark of Baron of Aldington's family. She opened up the letter to find Horatio's handwriting across the page. Dear Lady Clara, at least in a letter I am able to address you as formally as I should do, even though when we are together my tongue frequently makes the mistake of dropping your title. Forgive me for writing to you without discussion in advance, but I long to renew those excursions you and I have often talked so much of us of late. I must also admit a frustration with staying indoors all the time. As much as I enjoy the events of the Tun and my mother's tea parties, there is more to be had in this world, wouldn't you agree? That is why I am hoping we can return to our rides from the past. We could visit Corf Castle again, for I long to see how the ruins have changed, and you can show me what else you have discovered. So, what does he say? Betchy called from across the room. He wishes for me to go riding with him. Clara's voice was quiet as she tried to restrain the thrill she felt. It was palpable, thrumming through her and making her fingers a little jittery. He wishes to spend time with me, away from the events of the ton. Maybe I stand a chance of catching his eye after all. Maybe we do not need what is in this box then, Betchy declared and gestured to the pillow where it was hidden. Well, I... Clara trailed off as she looked down to read what more was in Horatio's letter. I confess there is some art in my invitation, one I will tell you openly of, as I pray you will agree it is a good plan. Seeing that my valet is becoming quite besotted with your lady's maid, I am seeking to give them more opportunities to see one another. I hope you'll agree this is the perfect scheme to make such an outcome a reality for of course our parents will insist on chaperones these days on our rides. If we bring the two of them, they can see each other much more. Write back to me when you can, your friend Mr Horatio Fitzroy. Clara's breath caught in her throat and the jitteriness of her excitement faded away. My lady, what is it? Betchy asked quietly from across the room. Is something wrong? No, nothing at all. Clara lied and folded up the letter, hiding the words that were written there. Moving to her writing bureau across the room, she placed the letter slowly down on the desk, wanting a little distance from Horatio's words. He sent the invitation purely for James and Betchy's benefit. Spending time with me is his sacrifice for his valet's happiness. Do not get rid of the box just yet, Betchy. I would still like to try a few of the things that the healer has sent to me. Clara forced a smile as she sat down at her writing bureau to send her reply. She dipped the white quill feather she used into a bottle of ink and wrote a careful answer to Horatio. At all times, she kept her eyes downturned, praying Betchy wouldn't see her true expression on her face. It was one of disappointment, for she feared Horatio had no real wish to spend time with her at all. Chapter 13 Horatio do not walk too fast, James, or I fear Lady Clara's parents will guess the real reason we are here. Horatio's words urged the valet to drop back as they left their horses on the driveway and moved toward the door of the Duke of Gordon's house. The valet could barely stand still until Horatio offered another warning glare. Abruptly, James stood like a stone, not moving a muscle. Wonderful, that's better, Horatio said with sarcasm, though I have a statue for a valet now. He knocked on the door, finding it quickly answered by the butler and shortly followed by the Duchess of Gordon, 
who didn't seem able to stop smiling when she saw Horatio this morning. It is so good to see you returning to your old habits of riding again, she said with kindness. Clara will be down shortly. She has been looking forward to this ride. As have I, Horatio said with ease and stepped back from the door, waiting to take to his horse. Ah, here she is now. At the Duchess's words, Horatio turned back, looking up the stairwell and to the landing, where Clara had appeared with her maid Betchy at her side. Betchy hurried down rather quickly, clearly eager to see James, whereas Clara walked much slower, a hand to her stomach. Horatio couldn't tell if she was trying to flatten the creases in her gown, or maybe she felt a little queasy. His thoughts were quite lost as he stared at her, for she had opted for a riding habit today. The gown and the Spencer jacket were altogether slimmer fitting than the usual gowns she wore. They revealed more of her figure, in such a way that Horatio pulled a little at the cravat around his neck, aware of a sudden heat in his body. It is Clara. Do not think of her in such a way. Lady Clara? He forced himself to use her title as she approached, her hand now lowering from her stomach. You look quite fine today. Thank you. Though as she thanked him, her smile didn't quite reach her eyes. Well, have fun, and do not be too long on your ride, Marianne said, waving the two of them off. She stayed in the doorway as Horatio led the way down to the horses and offered Clara a hand to help her up. Is she still watching us? Horatio said playfully, whispering to Clara. Did you doubt it? Clara's question had him laughing gently. I did not think the idea of the two of us riding together would have this effect on her. Do not think of that. He shrugged and kept his hand up, aware that she hadn't yet taken it. After all, I'm here with a goal in mind. He purposefully glanced at James, who was now helping Betchy into the saddle of a mare that had been brought round for her. Just so. Clara didn't smile, however, and pulled herself up onto her horse, not taking Horatio's hand at all. He lowered the hand, wondering if she'd seen it or meant to reject it. So where shall we ride today? Did you still wish to visit Corfe again? Ah, you read my mind. Within minutes, Horatio was in the saddle, following Clara as she led a path down the drive atop her grey steed. They started fast, galloping to gain pace, but then soon slowed down. We shall have to slow, Horatio called to her, urging her to do so. As keen as I am to put a little distance between us and our chaperones, we cannot lose them entirely. Ha! A charmer, as always, she said, laughing boldly at his words. She laughed in a way which was quite open today, as opposed to the habit she sometimes had of lowering her head and hiding from him, masking her blushing cheeks. It was a rather engaging laugh, and Horatio urged his horse closer to Clara's so they rode alongside each other down the gravel trackway. Riding this close, he caught a whiff of her perfume. It was more unusual than what she customarily wore. In fact, he could have sworn he discerned the scent of orchid there. It is my occupation, of course, he said, continuing the jest. To charm. She frowned with the words, looking away from their path, as her eyes found his own. What gentleman does not wish to make a lady smile? And how would you seek to do it? she asked, a playful smile appearing on her lips. A compliment goes a long way, Lady Clara. He deepened his voice with the words. For instance, I could compliment you on your riding habit again, or the nature of your perfume, or even your riding style. Mr Fitzroy. Her words were a little firmer than usual, capturing his attention. Yes, it is I. She reminded him openly her eyes wide. I am not one of the ladies you meet in an assembly room who will flutter their fan at you as quickly as they would their own eyelashes, longing for your attention and just one compliment to make their night. Ha! Huh. You have judged me rather too well. The realisation had his hand slackening around the horse's reins. In your company, I seek nothing more than the real you. I wish to talk with you openly to hear your opinions on the world and your interests. She levelled her gaze at him. There was an intensity in it 
he had not seen there before. It made him still atop the horse, not moving with the steed's movements, so it snorted uncomfortably. I have no wish to hear a string of false compliments. Who said they would be false? He teased her, earning a greater frown. I warrant most of the compliments you give at such ton events you give because you know they will raise a smile, rather than giving them because you truly agree with the sentiment. She smiled a little, that intense gaze relaxing. Ah. He moved with the horse once again, so startled by her challenge that he found himself limp. You are right. She jerked her head toward him so sharply that she lifted a hand to rub her neck. Cricked your neck? God's wounds, I must have startled you. Was it so obvious? She continued to rub her neck. Rather. He glanced back, seeing that James and Betsy were following, though at a little distance away he realised he had the freedom to talk as he liked. We are not in a ballroom or assembly room now, are we? Or even a garden party? No, indeed. You and I are the only ones here, she concurred smiling as she looked forward at the path ahead. The sun came out at her words and filtered through the trees, transforming the grey morning into a sunny spring day. I fear I have taken on a habit of performing, he confessed, staring at the sunshine as it came down in great beams between the tree branches, lighting tulips and snowdrops alongside their path. For whom? she asked, her voice gentle. For everyone. Horatio sighed with the words. When I'm at an event, I know what ladies want. They wish for compliments, and I can give that to them. They wish for charm. You certainly give that to them, too. Clara chuckled lightly. At the garden party, you clearly had Miss Pilkington and her friends enamoured. Any more such fine words, and the ladies might have swooned. Horatio laughed at the idea, shaking his head. I guess I've fallen into bad habits on the continent, he declared, trying to control his mirth. Well, you do not need such habits here with me, she reminded him. I know who you really are, and it is not this surface charm. Who am I then? he asked, looking toward her. Do, go on. I'm intrigued to hear what you have to say. I have many things I could answer to your point. You're certainly an adventurer. She nodded as she spoke, turning their horses down another path, so they began to circle a hill. Horatio remembered the path from long ago. It wouldn't be far now until they reached Corf Castle. You have a wildness to you, a longing to laugh and to find wit or folly, even in the simplest of things. Yet if you are still the boy I once knew, you have something else to you too. What is that? Horatio asked so intrigued that he didn't look forward, but stared straight at her. An honesty. Her words made Horatio sit forward in his saddle, a frown appearing on his face. He wondered if he was still as honest as the boy he had once been. He was often charming when a situation called for it. But was that a lie? A white lie, perhaps? Or was he being untruthful to himself? I'm sorry. Her whispered words had him turning to face her once again, noting the sunlight had fallen on her face. It lit those brown eyes, the deep depths seeming to go on like pools. I didn't mean to upset you. No, no, you didn't. He shook his head hurriedly. I was just thinking that you may have seen something in me that I had not seen in myself. He laughed, amazed. Incredible to think you know me better than I know myself, Lady Clara. Perhaps a little, she said softly. It is one more turn now, and we'll soon see the castle. She urged the horse into a faster trot, and Horatio followed, finding he did not want to fall behind her. They soon stretched out into a gallop, one so fast that he neglected to look behind him and see how far back James and Betsy had fallen. All he could think of was the exhilaration of the ride and his eagerness to follow Clara. They took a turn in the path, and one hill fell away, giving way to another. Ahead of them, Corf Castle grew, its grey, towering ruins reaching toward the sky and the few white, wispy clouds that were left. It was just as Horatio remembered it, 
yet perhaps larger and more dominating of the skyline. The memories of him and Clara together in that castle stirred something in his gut. It was an excitement that had his eyes shooting from the castle to Clara's back. She urged the horse to jump a fence, and he followed, before the animals turned toward a path that usually had a bridge, enabling them to reach the hill where the ruins were placed. Oh! Clara called from up ahead, but she could not stop the steed in time. What is it? Clara! He dropped her title at the sound of sudden panic and pulled on his horse's reins. He managed to stop in time, seeing the problem, but she could not. His horse's hooves skidded to a halt beside what was once a river, and was now boggy dirt, squelchy and slimy in appearance. The bridge that should have passed over the dried-up river was broken in two, and had not yet been repired. Clara's horse barreled into the bog. Unable to stop in time, by the time the horse realised it was in the bog, he panicked. The grey lifted his head high into the sky, whinnied loudly, then bucked, struggling to lift its front hooves out of the dirt and into the air. Clara! Horatio shouted again, seeing the danger that was about to befall. He jumped down from the horse, casting the reins aside, thinking only of his friend as she slipped from the saddle, unable to stay in place. She fell into the bog, landing squarely on her back. The horse quickly put its hooves down and managed to scramble out, leaving Clara behind in the mud. Clara? Horatio called again, fearful she had been hurt. He didn't even hesitate or debate going into the mud. He strode in, amazed to feel the way his hessian boots sank deep into the dirt. His right foot was soon up to his ankle, then his left up to the knee. As he tried to pull his right foot out, he began to windmill his arms to keep balance, but it failed miserably, and he fell back on his rear in the mud. A peal of laughter rang out, and Horatio looked up to see Clara struggling to sit in the mud. She was covered in dark, wet glops, even up to her hair, but she laughed aloud as she kneeled in the bog. You should have seen yourself then, she said, almost crying through her tears. I swear, it was like watching an actor at the theatre in some comedic farce. He couldn't help laughing at her when he realised she wasn't hurt. It seems I was so desperate to run to your aid. Look at me, he laughed again. What sort of hero would I make? A muddy one. They continued to snigger together as they tried to stand. Clara went first, ending up on her knees. Then Horatio tried, and slipped so much he went completely down onto his back, seeming to take flight for a minute. Are you hurt? she asked, her voice quiet. No. At his answer they both laughed again, so hard that Horatio had to hold onto his stomach. Only the laughter hurts. My muddy hero, she said dramatically. Come here. We'll have to help one another, or we'll still be in here when Betchy and James catch up with us. True. He moved to his knees and offered a hand to her. They took hold of one another, the mud still between their fingers, then tried to stand. Oh! When Clara slipped, in danger of taking both of them over together, he took her other hand too. Don't ruin our good work, he said playfully, watching as she smiled so much the skin around her eyes crinkled. There was something in the moment that was quite entrancing for Horatio. He couldn't remember the last time he had seen Clara give way to such happiness and such free laughter, as if she had no cares in the world. She had certainly not been this free with him since he had returned home, not until now. He moved his feet, trying to stand straight, then the mud slipped beneath him. No! she called out, but the word was too late. They went over together again, and Horatio ended up on his back, with Clara falling on top of him. He didn't even think of how inappropriate it could appear to any passerby. He could only laugh as she giggled on top of him. Pray tell, did you hope by shouting out no it would magically keep us standing? He teased, watching as she tried to move off him. Perhaps I did, she confessed. As she moved, he became aware of how close their bodies were pressed together. He had to close his eyes for a second, warding off the image of the tight-fitting Spencer jacket and bodies. Don't let that heat return. Clara is my friend, nothing more, remember that. This time, we shall manage it.
She moved to her knees and offered her hands. He did the same thing, being certain this time to keep his eyes on her face. As they stood, they barely managed to stay straight. When each one of them slipped, the other tugged on their joining hands, so that they seemed almost in a tug of war over their clutches. Horatio just managed to get a boot on the dry earth beside them, as Clara slipped once more. Whoa! He caught her in time, and she fell into him. Fortunately, he was anchored by his boot on the dry land, and they did not fall over again. At last, I have managed one heroic action. At his words, she laughed warmly, hardly seeming in a hurry to get off him. He was in no great rush to release her either. He grew aware of the slimness of her waist beneath the curve of his arm as they stayed in their position. Well, that was quite eventful. Do you reckon our horses are laughing at us? She asked, her gaze turning upward to find his. I warrant not as much as we're laughing at ourselves. He drew her toward the bank, and at last they both stepped out onto the dry, though they didn't release one another's hands. Look at you now. He held out her hands, the better to see how covered in mud she was. What will your parents say when I return you to them in this state? They will not let you come riding with me again. Would you believe me if I said I had come home in worse states before? She wrinkled her nose, clearly recalling a memory. I remember one time you and I went riding along the coast when we were young. Mama said we came back carrying half the beach's sand in our clothes. I had quite forgotten that. Horatio was so busy smiling at Clara that it took him a minute to realise they had an audience. Only when James cleared his throat did he look to the side and see his valet riding with Betchy, the two of them wide-eyed at what they had found. Horatio hurried to drop Clara's hands, realising how it would have looked to their friends. Lady Clara fell in, he hastened to explain. Mr Fitzroy was so kind to attempt to help me out. She smiled with the words and stepped back from him, clearly increasing the distance. Despite the humour of the moment, he felt a little disappointed at that distance and the loss of her hand in his. Would it have really been so bad to have held her hand for a little longer? Well, shall we head to the castle? she asked, looking round for her horse. Yes, let's. Even though Horatio was covered in dirt, he had no wish to leave Clara yet. Chapter 14 Clara Goodness, are you to go out riding again today, Clara? Marianne's words urged Clara to look up from her breakfast. Not today, Clara said slowly, watching as her mother smiled a little. I would have thought you would. After all, you and Mr Fitzroy have been riding together for a week now. Marianne sat forward at the table, an excitableness in her manner. She barely seemed aware that she had buttered her toast twice. Careful, dear, Gregory said from the head of the table not even looking up from his paper as he spoke. You'll put ideas in our daughter's head. Me? Marianne said innocently, about to butter her toast for the third time before she realised what she was doing and returned the knife to the butter dish. I was simply pointing out that our daughter and Mr Fitzroy have become rather close this week, have they not? Clara's stomach tightened into a knot with anticipation. It is what I had hoped for. Gregory peered over the edge of his paper with a warning glare at his wife, before raising the paper and hiding his expression again. That warning was enough to make Clara's hopes dwindle a little. Every day for a week it is a lot of riding, Marianne pointed out, moving to top up Clara's teacup beside her. It is, Clara whispered, unable to stop the smile on her face. It had been something of a whirlwind week. Each day Horatio had returned, saying that it would give James and Betchy another chance to spend time together, yet that no longer felt like the reason to Clara. Each day she and Horatio lost track of time in one another's company, until it was Betchy who had to remind them of the time and the need to go home. After that first day, when they had ridden to the castle, they had seen other ruins and ridden through forests. Before we continue into the story, do us a favour. Like this video and hit the subscribe button because it helps very much with YouTube's algorithm. 
If you want the audiobooks ads free, visit our website and select our bundles to save more. Thank you again. Now back to our story. Just the day before, they had been so caught up in their conversation, laughing together, that they became quite lost in a forest. In the end, Horatio had had to climb a tree to find a view of their surroundings before they could ride in any particular direction. It is wonderful to see you smiling so much, my dear, Marianne whispered to Clara and laid a hand over hers. One could not blame you for it, with the attentions of a handsome man like Mr Fitzroy. Marianne, don't put ideas in our daughter's head. Once more, Gregory's words made Clara's smile falter. I am not putting ideas in her head, Marianne insisted, though she seemed to be talking more to a newspaper than a face, for Gregory refused to lower it. I'm simply remarking on the sheer number of hours that Clara and Mr Fitzroy have spent in one another's company this last week. They spent longer still together when they were children. At last, Gregory folded up the paper and put it down on the table beside him, returning to his breakfast. He offered a sad sort of smile in Clara's direction. I am glad you are enjoying yourself, Clara, but do not let your mother give you any wild ideas. I don't know what you mean. Clara pretended innocence, twirling the butter knife in her hand as she looked for something to do to distract herself. This last week, hope had bloomed quite naturally within her. Every day, Horatio turned up, asking her to go riding again. Each day, they had fun together. He was the Horatio she knew, rather than the charmer who attended the balls and assemblies with a false smile and an enchanting word or two. Was it so mad to think that maybe he felt something for her? The healer's tonic certainly seemed to be having an effect. After all, Horatio had not asked to spend so much time with Clara before she had started to use them. The orchid perfume she heavily relied on, and once or twice she had used the belladonna eye drops, though she found them rather itchy, and when out riding in the bright sunshine, her eyes grew sore too. There were some things she still had to try, though, including the belladonna tea and the cupcake recipe designed to impress. Mr Fitzroy is not coming today, though. Marianne asked, pouring a little milk into Clara's tea. Not today. Clara nodded her head at the window, beyond which the rain came down hard. It was looking like rain last night, and we both agreed we should not go riding in the rain. Mr Fitzroy seemed worried I could end up ill or catch a fever. Her words prompted her mother to smile. It sounds like the affection of a suitor, Marianne said with glee, or that of a friend. Gregory warned from across the table once again. You and your pessimism. Marianne rolled her eyes at him. Is it so wrong to encourage a possible courtship between Clara and Mr Fitzroy? I am being realistic, that is all, Gregory said quietly. I am pleased to see you are happy, Clara. He addressed his comments solely to her now. But I know you as well as I heard the rumours of him when he returned to town. I know. Her voice was soft as she slumped back in her chair. Horatio was a charmer, and the words he'd uttered at the market in town still burned in the back of her mind. If he doesn't believe in love, it would have to be someone special to make him reconsider. She still wasn't convinced she was that person, even with the healer's tonics. Looking down at the silver knife in her hand, she saw a morphed reflection of herself. Her face was jagged in that reflection, not quite straight, and the lips were a rather dull colour. She began to imagine other ways to bring her face to life, perhaps with more rouge for her lips. Well, I long to see the Baroness again, Marianne said, clearing her throat as if that action would clear the awkward air that Gregory had placed on the room with his warnings. I shall invite the family for tea tomorrow. What do you say, Clara? Would you like to see Mr Fitzroy again? Of course, mother. Clara tried to keep the excitement out of her voice as she put the knife down. Marianne seemed thoroughly pleased with herself, smiling broadly as she lifted her teacup to her lips and raised her chin high. On the other side of the table, Gregory shook his head a little. Excellent. I shall send them an invitation after breakfast then. Oh, what shall we serve them, though? 
Our cook's favourite sponge cake requires strawberries and it is still too early for those berries to bloom just yet. Mariana chewed her lip, deep in thought. Oh. Clara sat forward, an idea coming to fruition. Betsy and I were talking of a recipe for cupcakes. It was a recipe of her mother's given to her by her grandmother. I would dearly like to give the recipe a go. Perhaps I could make the cakes for the tea tomorrow. Clara, we have cooks for that, Gregory said distractedly, picking up his newspaper once again. Clara swallowed, fearing her best opportunity to impress with the recipe the healer had given her was about to slip away. Oh, tush. Marianne waved her hand in the air, dismissing the idea. We all have interests, and if Clara wishes to bake, then she can. Yes, dear, you can make the cupcakes recipe. I hope we will have the ingredients for it, but if not, we can send the cook to the market. Thank you. Clara placed her hands under the table, trying to keep the excited way in which she fidgeted, her fingers gripping each other, hidden from the view of her parents. I dare say we'll be a merry party tomorrow, Marianne continued in her happy manner. Perhaps you and Mr Fitzroy can go riding again. She'll be sore she's been riding that much, Gregory spoke with caution. I do not mind. I am enjoying exploring, Clara insisted. It hadn't escaped her notice that when Horatio went riding with her, her father allowed her to ride farther away from the house. Clearly, for all his cautions, he trusted Horatio to keep her safe on these long journeys. The mere idea had her recalling the moment Horatio had pulled her out of the bog when they had reached Corfe Castle. His hand in hers brought a blush to her cheek. She knew she could trust him, for he had a habit of trying to keep her safe. Then it is settled, Marianne said, lowering her teacup and clapping her hands together. The Baron's family will come for tea tomorrow. Clara will make cakes and she may go riding too. Dearest, Gregory spoke slowly from across the table. Your artful ways are not quite so secretive as you think. Marianne didn't seem to mind, for she continued to smile. Then you add the fluor. Betsy read out the instructions for the cupcake recipe as Clara bent her heed over the large bowl placed on the kitchen worktop. The sun was streaming through the window, making the flour that was in the air hover and dance like dust particles. More flour, Clara said in surprise, but did as she was told, somehow getting more flour on her apron than in the bowl. Oh dear, I'm not particularly good at this, am I? I'd be even worse, Betsy said beside her. I'm rather glad I have been deputised just to read out instructions. Next, add the rose water. She says here it is powerful, so only add two drops. Very well. Clara added two drops, then lifted the tiny dark brown vial to her nose. It didn't seem to smell very strong to her, so she added a third drop. My lady, Betsy laughed as she pointed into the bowl. That is breaking the rules. It didn't smell very strong, Clara shrugged. Perhaps this is not strong rose water. I am sure it will be fine. I would like the cupcakes to at least taste of something. She began to stir the mixture together, getting a little more flour over her hands, though she barely noticed. That afternoon, the cook had been ushered out of the kitchen so that Clara and Betsy could make the cakes. The poor cook was sorry to lose control of her territory, but she also seemed rather pleased to be given a helping hand in preparing some of the cakes. If Mr Fitzroy could see you making cakes for him, what do you think he would say? Betsy asked, elbowing Clara beside her with a giggle. He'd probably laugh at the effort I was going to. Clara smiled, knowing it would be the case. He'd also give a greater compliment than they deserved, just to be kind. She sighed deeply with the words, hoping he truly enjoyed them. I must ask, Betsy paused, laying down the recipe instructions and sidling closer toward Clara. Do you think that Bonadea's tonics are working, my lady? Shh, Clara pleaded, looking around the kitchen. They were alone, but Clara feared the cook returning to the kitchen open door at any minute. I do not know, she whispered in confession. Sometimes I think maybe they are. She recalled a moment on their last ride together 
She and Horatio had turned the horses toward the coastline and ridden along the cliffs out to Old Harry Rocks, where the cliffs gave way to white chalk stacks in the ocean. She had been admiring the rocks, telling Horatio the tale of how the rocks got their name when she had noticed he had been staring at her, quite openly. He'd laughed off the moment and bid her to tell the story again, not explaining why he had been so distracted. That moment had given her hope. Both the times, she gulped, hesitating for a second, I am not so sure. When they had come to say goodbye on their last ride, Clara had hoped Horatio would do something or say anything to talk of the new intimacy between them, but he had not. He'd taken his leave very quickly indeed and not even grasped her hand. The hurried departure had left her body cold and her manner rather malapert all evening because of her foul mood. Do not lose hope yet, my lady, Betsy said with enthusiasm. I have seen the way Mr Fitzroy looks at you. Surely such long looks cannot speak of friendship alone. Clara didn't dare offer an answer because she feared what the correct answer might be. Tell me of your time with James instead, Clara bid her friend, desperate to think of something else for a minute. She began to add lemon zest, as per the recipe beside her, so distracted by Betsy's words that she nearly caught her fingers on the grater more than once. Oh, I can barely stand still for my excitement when speaking of him. Betsy giggled with the words. Did you know he is quite an athlete? He is fond of swimming in the local river and grew up doing competitions with his brother. He promised some day to teach me to swim too. Betchy! Clara caught her finger on the grater as she turned to her friend, noting the great blush spreading up her cheeks. He's bold, your suitor. I'll give him that. Is it wrong to be so enthused by such an offer? Betchy whispered, laying a hand to her chest as if she could quell her beating heart through touch alone. Well, I... Clara trailed off, wondering what sort of excitement she would feel if Horatio had made such an offer to her. The mere idea of the two of them alone in a river, the physicality, too, of being taught to swim, had a heat spreading through her body and her heart suffering palpitations. She leaned over the grater, trying to hide her great blush. Any lady, I'm sure, would be excited. That's what I thought. Bet she continued to giggle. I hope he comes tomorrow during your tea. Then I shall have chance to see him again. Yes, I hope so for you. Clara couldn't help feeling envy as she watched Betsy walk away to tidy some of the bowls they were using. Clara thought it must have been a wondrous thing to be so confident of a gentleman's care and affection without having to resort to tonics, rouges, perfumes or recipes to impress. Her hands fell limp over the lemon and the grater for a second, the disappointment swelling. I'm not so fortunate as Betsy in this regard. I have to do them all if I'm to garner any affection at all. Chapter 15 Horatio Ah, Mr Fitzroy, so glad you could join us. The Duchess of Gordon was the first to greet Horatio for his tea, shortly followed by the Duke, who then shifted their attention to his parents. Horatio was glad to be inside and shook the rainwater off his frock coat as he passed it to the butler with thanks. His head was restless, and he turned it back and forth despite his busy actions. He couldn't focus on the coat, for he was looking elsewhere in the hall. He was looking for Clara. Come, come this way. The Duchess took control of the welcome and urged Horatio and his parents to follow her. We have set up the tea in the parlour today. What a shame it is raining. You cannot go for another of your rides, Mr Fitzroy. Yes, it is a shame. Horatio looked out of the window of the parlour as they stepped in seeing the rain was coming down even harder now in great sheets. Each raindrop struck the window with force, smearing the view beyond. He resented the weather for its sudden turn. All week he had been enjoying his rides with Clara, and despite beginning them for James's sake, Horatio had no wish to end them. One day when James had been called away to attend to a matter with his family, Horatio had still gone to ride with Clara, for he was so intent on seeing her. Ah, there you are, Clara. The Duchess's words had Horatio turning back to look into the room. Clara had entered and was carrying a silver tray that carried cupcakes. 
She has been very industrious ahead of your visit today and has made these cupcakes herself. Clara blushed at her mother's words. I hope you'll enjoy them. She set them on the table, just as Horatio moved to her side. He barely took note of his parents' conversation, who said something to the Duke about the racing season. Were they talking of horses or dogs, perhaps? Horatio didn't care. He found himself holding out Clara's chair for her so she could sit. Thank you. She smiled up at him, just as he took the seat beside her. I'm afraid I'm quite lamenting the fact we could not go riding again today, he confessed to her quietly as she began to offer the teapot round. My horse will be glad of the rest. I still do not think he has forgiven me for the incident in the bog. Her reminder had soft laughter escaping his lips. It was a pleasant day. He had enjoyed every day with her since. As she poured the tea, he found himself staring at her, openly. At a ball or an assembly, he would have torn his gaze away by now, not that he seemed to mind on this occasion. He was looking at Clara. What did it matter if he stared a little too long? Where shall we go riding next? she asked him, offering up one of the cupcakes. He eagerly took one, telling her of his ideas. I thought we could go as far as Studland one day, he said with intrigue. The last time we went to that beach, it was your sixteenth birthday. She smiled, pausing with the cupcakes in recollection. You dived into the ocean and came back out sodden. Your horse was not very pleased you rode him after that. Ha! Huh, I remember it well. If I promise not to dive into the water this time, will you come? He asked, longing for her to be there. This last week Horatio had discovered something about himself. Around Clara, there was no performance in him, no need to lie or to offer surface charm, as she had called it. He'd been himself, and each day together had been easy, full of laughter. He felt a longing for such days to continue. Of course I'll come, she promised, then poured his tea for him as he bit into the cupcake. Hmm, this is delicious. He was startled by the cake and eagerly took another bite. You made these? I had no idea you were fond of baking. It was a recipe I found. She hid her face a little, bending down over her teacup. I am not usually a baker, but I did enjoy doing this. I might do it some more. You should. He found himself leaning forward and placing a second cupcake on his plate, even before he'd finished the first. The way she smiled at the action tempted him to add a third to the plate but he restrained himself. As he reached for his teacup, she was still pouring the milk in. Their hands brushed and they both leapt back. Did she feel that? He couldn't tell for she busied herself with pouring the milk in her mother's cup on her other side. Horatio froze, uncertain what to say or feel. What is happening between us? He took a rather big swig from his teacup, burning his tongue with his thoughts so distracted. He couldn't deny this last week. The friendship between him and Clara had become deeper. But what did all these moments mean? What did the blushes and the jumpy touches acquire too? We cannot court. No, that cannot be where this intimacy is leading. He'd seen friendships like his and Clara's ruined before. A gentleman he knew in France courted a friend of his, and the two ended up arguing to such an extent that their friendship was ruined. Horatio did not want such a future for him and Clara. I hear Mr Fitzroy is quite popular with the young ladies in town. The Duchess spoke, breaking off the conversation about racing. At once all round the table were attentive. Oh, he is. Eleonora laid her hand to Horatio's arm, making him a little uncomfortable at his mother's praise. I question if such ladies need spectacles, for they cannot be seeing me as I truly am. Horatio jested, prompting all to laugh around the table. There are even whispers of some ladies hoping for marriage, the Duchess said, leaning across the table as if she wished to share the secret with Eleonora alone, though plainly all could hear. What an exciting time for you. I confess I hope for Horatio's marriage. Once more Eleonora laid a hand to his arm. Mother, he warned her softly, 
but as she continued on, he busied himself with eating another of Clara's cupcakes. I have no wish to marry yet. We cannot talk of this. Many ladies are fond of you, Horatio. It is nothing to be embarrassed of, Eleonora said with eagerness. Do you mean to say none of the ladies here have caught your eye? Horatio swallowed uncomfortably around the cupcake, aware that all were waiting for his answer, even his father, who seemed to be finding some amusement in the moment. His lip curled with his smile, and when Horatio glared at him a little for not putting an end to the discussion, his father lifted his teacup and hid his smile behind the rim. This is hardly a matter to discuss now, is it? Horatio tried to brush off the moment. He could remember all too easily how his father had listed out many ladies' names last week, urging him to consider one of them for a bride. Yet Horatio could not. Any dalliance or fancy that he'd had was always fleeting. There was no lady he could feel a deep connection with or imagine a strong affection that could last beyond weeks, apart from one. His eyes shifted to Clara beside him, and she looked straight back at him. When they caught each other's gaze, they abruptly looked away. Why ever not? Eleonora encouraged him on. We are amongst friends, after all. Your Grace, you have noticed that Horatio is a favourite with the ladies, then? She addressed her comments to the Duchess, who nodded. Oh, yes, Miss Pilkington, certainly. And Lady Caroline Walters seemed to occupy herself with saying your name a lot the other day, when I met her in town. The Duchess smiled and nodded. You are quite the favourite, but I hope that when you do choose a bride, you will choose with your heart, Mr Fitzroy. He blinked, startled by the affection in the words. It reminded him of just how long he had known the Duke and the Duchess, who were quite like an uncle and aunt to him. I hope to. Thank you, Your Grace. He nodded and downed what was left in his cup. Clara leaned over and offered to fill up his cup again. He thanked her quietly and nodded, eager for the distraction from this conversation that felt a little too personal and claustrophobic. He pulled at the tight cravat around his throat, suddenly thinking it was quite heated in the room. For all my son's words, I do not believe him to be in a hurry, Patrick declared, reaching for one of Clara's cupcakes. These are delicious, Lady Clara. Thank you. She smiled with the words, and it prompted Horatio to look down at the cupcake on his plate. It warmed him to think that Clara had made the cupcakes just for them. You are right, father. I am in no hurry. Horatio answered his father's words, for he could see Patrick levelling an eager gaze at him. Some day I shall marry. But I have not settled on a bride yet, and I certainly have no one in mind. Oh, I see. No one at all? the Duchess asked. Her teacup in her hand had fallen still. No. Horatio was extremely aware of how he had placed himself beside Clara, feeling how heated it was in the room, despite the cold and the wet outside. He pulled at his cravat once again. Do not think of Clara. No matter how close their friendship had become, he couldn't imagine risking that all for the sake of a courtship. She was beautiful, certainly, and this last week his attraction to her had only increased. The day they had fallen in the bog, and she had fallen on top of him, had made such attractions and excitement stir his body, but he had to stay in control. This friendship is the most important of my life. I must keep it as it is. As my parents have pointed out, there are many promising possible brides in the tone at the moment. It will take some care and consideration, Horatio said slowly being careful not to steal one glance at Clara. Well said. Patrick nodded in approval. There's Lady Stubbs, Miss Pilkington, and Lady Walters, to name a few. There's Lady Agatha Baker, too, Eleonora added. Have you met her yet, Horatio? I... Horatio couldn't remember. He'd been introduced to so many ladies. You danced with her last week. Clara's sudden words caught his interest. He looked at her to see her eyes were down on the cupcake on her plate. I did, he said in surprise, for he couldn't remember it. 
She was the lady with the peacock feather in her hair and the pastel blue gown. She's very beautiful. Clara's words conjured a memory. Horatio nodded, recalling the lady who had been quite a bold and exotic dancer. Yes, she certainly had been beautiful, with eyes bright blue to match the feather in her hair, yet Horatio had barely concentrated on the dance. At the time, he'd been busy searching for Clara in the crowd and had been unable to find her. Yes, she's a good option too, Eleonora said with vigour. There are many women for you to consider, my dear. She smiled so broadly at Horatio that he shook his head. Since when has my future marriage become a topic of such open discussion? He laughed at the idea, looking between them all. Let us talk of something that makes another here equally uncomfortable. Where is the fun in that? the Duke teased, urging Horatio to laugh a little more. We could talk to my mother about her friends that play bridge. Horatio reached for any other topic. This one was a good choice, for Eleonora blushed at once. We are on a losing streak, that is all. We will win again soon. They all laughed together at her sudden embarrassment. Oh, choose another topic, Horatio. Very well. How about you, Lady Clara? He turned to face her in the chair. We could talk of what suitors you have and the marriage your parents expect you to make. Clara did not meet his eye. She picked up her teacup and took a hefty sip. The others around the table laughed, but Horatio could see Clara did not join in with the jest. Oh, have I embarrassed her so much? I did not mean to. I have no suitors, Mr Fitzroy. She forced a smile and sat straight. No. If you wish to tease someone with the topic of marriage, then we shall have to return our conversation to the matter of your own future marriage. Father, weren't you saying the other day you bumped into Mr Pilkington and he seemed to have high hopes for his daughter regarding Mr Fitzroy? That's right, I did. Let me tell you this story, my friends, for I longed to laugh when I met him. As the Duke launched into a story of how he'd met Mr Pilkington in town, and had been subjected to an hour's worth of bragging about his daughters, Horatio grew distracted. Earlier that afternoon when he had arrived, he and Clara had kept looking at one another. He could have quite easily persuaded himself that they were stealing glances. He enjoyed looking at her, and rather liked the idea that she was fond of looking at him too, but that moment had now passed. Clara seemed to be looking anywhere else in the room. She looked at the cupcakes, at her teacup, at her parents and at his own, yet she never once met his gaze. Even when he asked to try another one of her cakes, she offered the silver tray, but her eyes stayed downturned. As the tea went on, she persisted with this distance. It made Horatio quite miserable, to the point that he stared at her openly, waiting for the brief moment when she would look back at him. Oh, it is too soon for you to leave yet, my friends the Duchess exclaimed as the tea grew to a close. Do say you will stay for dinner too this evening? Of course, how could we refuse? Eleonora said. The words didn't make Clara smile. She continued to stare down at the crumbs on her plate. Chapter 16 Horatio, something is wrong. Horatio could not stop staring at Clara, thinking what a strange evening it had been. It was a natural thing for the Duke and Duchess of Gordon to extend their tea invitation to a dinner invitation too. During this time, Horatio would have normally found himself talking to Clara at great length, but she barely spoke to him at all. He kept watching her, wondering at first if she was ill. Was it possible something in the cakes that afternoon had upset her stomach? Even if she was ill, it did not account for the strange way in which she refused to meet his gaze. As dinner ended and they retreated to the parlour, Horatio invited Clara to the card table so they could complete one of their usual games. She played silently, though, only offering one or two words to do with the game. Desperate to see her speak, to be as they had been this last week, open and constantly happy with one another, he discarded the cards on the table. He cast one wary glance at their parents, but they were too caught up in their own conversation to notice what was taking place. Horatio took the opportunity, 
He rested his elbows on the card table, making the candle beside them flicker, with the flame dancing back and forth. Clara. The way he didn't use her title did something to her, for a muscle ticked in her cheek as she stared at her cards. Pray, tell me what is wrong. Nothing is wrong, Mr Fitzroy. It seemed to be her way of urging formality once more as she rearranged her cards in her hand. Shall we begin our next round? She shook the cards, showing she was ready. Or I could stand up, do a jig and a song. At his words, she looked up. At last, you can bear to look at me again. I thought it might get your attention. She frowned a little. Goodness, Clara, I thought at least that might get a smile from you. Forgive me, I am out of sorts, that is all. She shrugged and returned her attention to her cards. You can tell me the reason for it, can you not? he asked, his voice soft. We are friends, Clara, and after this last week... He trailed off, watching as she fidgeted in her seat. What do I call us now? What are we to each other? He wasn't sure any more. There was an intimacy there, one he didn't know how to describe. He feared putting a label on it not just for the expectations of the parents who sat across the room from them, but also because of the fear of losing Clara. If this were to ever become something more, we might break it. I cannot lose this friendship, not now. I have never had one that is so important to me. Perhaps I need to do something else to get your attention. He smiled a little, an idea occurring to him. I could talk of our adventures this week. Oh, I know. I will talk about the day you and I ended up in that bog. Shh, she pleaded, discarding her cards at last and looking at him. What will our parents think if they hear the details of that day? It achieved the goal, and that is all I care about. He gestured to how she had shifted her focus completely to him now. I do not think you should refer to that day at all. She reached for her cards and picked them up again. Horatio was so angered at her picking up the cards, he laid a hand over hers, flattening the cards to the table. She blushed at once, looking toward their parents. Neither should you do that. Any physical touch between us will put ideas in my mother's head that shouldn't be there. What do you mean? Horatio asked, frowning as she slipped her hand out from underneath his own. His palm felt a little cold without hers there. As you said earlier, Mr Fitzroy, you and your father have many ladies in mind for your hunt for a bride. You wouldn't wish to give my mother ideas. Believe me, she can run away with an idea of hers. Clara issued a warning and reached for her port glass beside her. Rather than take a delicate sip as she often did, she appeared to knock back more than usual. That is why you should not touch me, and you should not mention that day in the bog either. No matter the innocence of such actions, my mother may not perceive them in that light. Oh, I see. He understood the warning and sat back. The mere idea that the Duchess could be planting such hope on the idea of him asking Clara to marry him some day had his stomach tightening into a knot. He did not like such expectations, and had he not been outspoken enough earlier to avoid those expectations forming. Fear not, Clara, you are safe from me. What I said earlier will have put any idea your mother may have had to bed too. Let us hope so, she whispered. Ah, Horatio, dear, his mother called to him across the room. It is time we were going. That came round quickly, Horatio whispered, for only Clara to hear him. He didn't hurry to stand, but she did, all too fast. He asked her to follow her. I wish you good luck in finding this bride of yours you seek, Mr Fitzroy. Her face was impassive, no feeling in it. Good night. She curtsied and left the table. Horatio stared after her, realising at once what her words were hiding and what had made her manner so quiet. She is out of sorts because of me and because of what I said. Suddenly her blushes and the way her hand would hold his at times spoke of more than just friendship. They spoke of a greater affection. He cursed inwardly as his mother called him away. Clara is upset because I have declared quite openly that I would never consider her for a bride. Sir, is something wrong? No, of course not. I spend most days like this. 
Horatio's irony was thick as he marched through the estate of his father's grounds, barely stopping to pause breath. James was forced to hurry after him, waving in the air the jacket that Horatio had neglected to put on. So, thank you, James. Horatio took the jacket from his valet and shrugged it on over his shoulders before turning down the next woodland path, urging James to follow him. Occasionally James's boots skidded in the damp undergrowth of the dewy spring morning, but Horatio strode too fast for such a slip to bother him. Would you tell me why you are marching around the gardens as if you are a soldier ready for battle? James asked with something of an amused grin on his cheeks. Any other time, Horatio would have been glad of the jest, but not now. I barely slept, he said, staring forward at the tree trunks they passed by and the daffodil heads poking through the low-lying grass. Why is that? I had too much on my mind. Horatio rubbed his eyes, trying to clear the sleep dust from them as his thoughts returned to that which had bothered him all night. Clara. As he had tried to sleep, he thought of that distant manner she had employed all evening and the way she had retreated from him, offering no intimacy at all. I have ruined it all. He meant the words to be just a thought, but they somehow escaped his lips, bringing James up short beside him. Ruined? Ruined what? James asked, having to clamber over a tree root at the last minute that he had not seen, for he was too busy looking at Horatio. Absent-mindedly, Horatio held out a hand to James's shoulder, steadying the young man so he didn't fall over before he walked on. I am a fool, James, a great fool indeed. The folly of a man is his words, I'm convinced of it. Words escaped me yesterday when I visited Clara's house, and I did not even think of what their impact would be. I had no notion of the result, yet. He was aware he was making no sense, not just because he was rambling, but because a deep frown was etched in James's voice. Is there a point where you could explain yourself properly, sir? James said in a teasing tone. Horatio abruptly came to a stop, urging James to nearly trip over another tree root. Horatio barely caught him in time. I should march around the sitting room. Then you'd be safer, Horatio observed. I'm too busy worrying for you to look where my feet are going. James protested, standing straight once more. You are a good man. Horatio observed with a smile, but that smile could not remain for long. It quickly faded away and he shook his head. You tell me the truth, James, for you are one of the only two in the world who have observed Clara and I together this last week. Ah, this is about Lady Clara? James said slowly. Yes. Horatio walked on, but slower this time enabling James to follow at a more leisurely pace. Horatio fidgeted with his tailcoat as he walked, uncertain what more to do, for his thoughts were so frantic, running from one idea to the next. What did you perceive the relationship between Clara and I to be? The question came rather quietly, as if speaking of it aloud made the matter just a little more real. There is something more than friendship there, is there not? Ah, James was the one to stop walking this time, prompting Horatio to turn further down the path and stare back at his friend. You want my honest opinion on this matter? I do. Pray, do not treat me as many servants would their master, and flatter them with white lies. Be honest with me, James. We are friends, are we not? Pray talk to me as one, Horatio pleaded, pressing his hands together. Very well. James paused and folded his arms. From what I have seen, Lady Clara feels something more for you than friendship. The curse that escaped Horatio's lips surprised himself as well as James. He turned on the spot, kicking up the dirt in the path with his boots, and reached for his dark hair, pulling at the tendrils in frustration. No matter how hard he thought on this subject, he couldn't understand how he could be so blind to see Clara every day for a week and not realise it himself. Not until she had retreated from him. Yet there is something more I also observed, James called to him. What is that? Horatio asked, still pulling at his hair. I did not think you merely looked at Lady Clara as your friend either. 
This time, Horatio was the one to fumble. He turned and caught his boot on a nearby tree root. Unlike James, who had managed to steady himself each time, Horatio fell. He had to clutch at a tree trunk and ended up falling into it almost face first. Ow, he murmured, standing once more and rubbing at his bruised jaw. Don't laugh. He turned to face James, who was pressing his lips together, trying his best not to laugh. Go on with what you were saying. As you wish. James took a step forward, the laugh he had been holding in escaping him in a short hiccough before he continued. Sir, you went to see Lady Clara every day. I do not remember seeing you smile so much as you did in her company, and when we returned to the house, you talked about her. Constantly. Horatio swallowed, realising his valet was right. If I were a wagering man, James declared, walking forward to catch up with Horatio on the path, I would have bet halfway through the week of riding that you had a wish to court Lady Clara. You would? Horatio stammered. Absolutely. Horatio turned and looked out through the woods, thinking hard on what James had said. He felt as if his mind had been plunged into a fog, for he could not see anything clearly. Each time he tried to think of Clara and how happy they had been together that week. The sadness in her manner the day before returned, and her retreat too. Why does that memory make me ache? Are you telling me, sir, that you do not feel anything for Lady Clara? Was I mistaken? James asked in surprise. No, I mean, I don't know. Horatio struggled to find the right words. He walked on, urging James to follow at his side. I have only ever thought of Clara as my friend, my good friend, and yet... Yet, James prompted him. Horatio fidgeted, pulling at his tailcoat once more as he searched for the right words. I always feared if I tried to make it anything more than it was, I would ruin our friendship. Clara's friendship is too precious to me to risk that. Yet now, what do I feel? I'm struggling to explain it. I feel like a boy again, unable to articulate my thoughts at all. He kicked out at a nearby bush, watching the leaves dance and bristle at his touch. I believe that's what my mother calls being lovesick, James said with humour. What? Horatio spun round so fast that James jumped. Goodness, do not hide behind a tree from me. I'm tempted at that look. James continued the jest and ran away, leaving Horatio in the path laughing. He was glad for the chance to chuckle and to forget the woes on his shoulders for a minute or two, but soon enough that chuckle faded and he thought of James's words. Lovesick, is that what I am? All I know is this. Horatio paused, meeting James's gaze as he emerged from behind the nearest tree. Clara is the most important friendship of my life. Yesterday I declared quite openly that I would marry some day, but I did not mention her name, not once as a possible bride. She retreated from me. She barely spoke all evening. And the pain there, what she was suffering, he swallowed, searching for the right words. It made me ache too. It was not just worrying for a friend. He thought of the day he and Clara had become so tangled in the boggy mud near Corf Castle. The heat returned to him, then the memory of her hand in his, the intimacy there, as he had helped her out of the dried-up river. She means more to me than that. God, I am blind. Horatio abruptly covered his eyes as if he could hide from the world and his embarrassment. I like to think my wager was a good one then, and your heart does belong to her, James said as they began to walk on, and Horatio lowered his hand from his eyes. You fear you have damaged things now? Irreparably, Horatio cursed. How will she forgive me for what I said yesterday? By making your feelings known, sir, James said without hesitation. There is a ball in a few days, is there not? Yes. Horatio wasn't convinced, though, and returned to fidgeting. Perhaps there you will have your chance to set things right. Perhaps. Yet Horatio wasn't sure how to go about it. Chapter 17 Clara Then he gave me this. Betchy gestured toward the necklace around her throat. 
Clara forced a smile for her friend as they rode down the path, back toward the house. Your beau is a kind man indeed, Betchy. Clara admired the relationship between her friend and Horatio's valet. James was clearly proving himself not only a devoted suitor, but one with true kindness. He made the effort to come and see Betchy most days in some capacity or another, and he frequently turned up with gifts. They could be chocolates, the simplest of things. And then the latest gift was this necklace, something that must have cost him a fair amount as a valet, yet he had been determined to do it anyway. He is devoted to you. It seems mad for such a short time we have been courting. Betchy toyed with the silver pendant at her throat, looking down and admiring it. Feeling something of a tightness in her chest, Clara pushed away the envy she felt bubbling there. I will not be jealous of my friend. I should be deliriously happy for her. Clara found that though she was happy for her friend, the envy remained still. It grated at her and was only reinforced by the memory of what Horatio had declared when he had last come to the house for tea. He will never look at me as he looks at other women. Ever. I was a ridiculous to even think he would consider me. Suddenly the healer's package all felt rather foolish. Clinging to the reins of her horse as she turned the mare's path toward the stable, she considered what was left in the package. All the tonics, tricks and perfumes she had tried had done little. There were very few things left to even attempt, and one of them was the Belladonna tea infusion. Perhaps it is time to abandon my endeavour. As she clambered down from the horse in the courtyard, she asked more after Betchy and James, glad to see her maid go on at such lengths about her happy courtship. It brought into focus once more how different James was with Betchy to how Horatio was with Clara. It was quite apparent he only ever wished to be her friend. Betchy's happy ramblings about James paused as they entered the house through the side door into the sitting room. Marianne was in the sitting room attending to some embroidery in her lap and looked up at their approach. Ah, there you are, dear, she said with a smile as her gaze met Clara's own. We shall leave for the ball in an hour. Oh, the ball. Clara came to a sudden stop, for she had quite forgotten the event. You had not forgotten it? I'm afraid I had. Clara shrugged as she walked past her mother, heading for the door with Betchy. My mind has been distracted, I suppose. Marianne chewed her lip, looking a little worried at Clara's words. I notice that Mr Fitzroy hasn't come to ride with you the last couple of days. Marianne's sudden words had Clara pausing in the doorway. He is busy elsewhere, no doubt. Clara placed a hand to the doorframe as she turned back to face her mother, forcing a smile. He may be at the ball tonight. Yes, I suppose. Mariana nodded, though no smile appeared on her own features. Wear the blue gown tonight, Clara. You look quite beautiful in that one. Mr Fitzroy may ask you to dance. Mother. Clara's calm voice abruptly quietened her mother. You and I both know. Mr Fitzroy will not ask me to dance. Marianne looked saddened as she lifted her embroidery and began to hurry with her needle. You heard his declarations about marriage as clearly as I did the other day. Yes, I did. Marianne forced a smile now, but it was a sad one. Perhaps you are right. Well, wear the blue gown anyway, dear. It is quite beautiful. Yes, Mamma. I will be ready soon. Clara said her goodbyes to her mother and left with Betchy close at her side. Betchy followed her up the staircase toward her bedchamber, but she no longer talked excitedly of her courtship with James. In fact, she stayed rather silent. Clara could guess why easily enough. After Horatio's declarations at the afternoon tea, Clara had been crushed. The realisation that even after the week they had shared, he would never consider her as a woman to capture his heart, had broken her own heart. She had told Betchy of what he had said that evening, feeling tearful and as if her heart was shriveled in her chest. When they entered her bedchamber, Betchy hurried to make Clara a bath as she took off her riding habit and pressed a dressing gown around her shoulders. 
Moving to the edge of the bath, she helped Betchy prepare it with herbs, trailing her fingers through the water. I hate to see you sad, my lady, Betchy said eventually, breaking the silence between them. You deserve to be happy. You are a good friend to me. Clara picked up some of the lavender from beside the bath and sprinkled it in the water, before pressing some of the unused leaves to her nose, inhaling the fragrant scent. Such herbs had been recommended by the healer, but it was not working. Clara was beginning to suspect that Bonadea was a charlatan, and none of her tonics worked at all. Do not worry for me, Betchy. In time, what I feel shall be forgotten, and I shall be myself once again. She looked up, seeing Betchy holding a copper jug on the other side of the bath. Rather than pouring the water into the bath to heat it up, she fidgeted with the jug, chewing on her bottom lip. Fear not for me, Betchy, Clara pleaded once more, seeing Betchy's worried look. I have read many times in books that time is what is needed to heal a wounded heart. It will take a while, but I shall get there, I am sure. Yes, I am sure you are right. Betchy topped up the jug, then retreated. I'll bring you some hot water for your tea now. I'll be back shortly. Clara thanked her once more. When Betchy was gone, she clambered into the bath, resting her head on the lip of the bath as she considered the words she had uttered to her friend. It was true that she had heard many times of how time could heal wounded hearts, but at this moment it felt like an impossible thing. After the week she and Horatio had shared, how could she forget that intimacy so easily? How could she forget the times they had shared where he had held her hand? One day when they had seen some priory ruins in Wareham, Clara had tripped over the low-lying stones. Within seconds, Horatio had been there, taking her hand and helping her across the ruined walls. He had not let go of her hand then, not once. They had walked together for some time, hand in hand, until Betchy and James had appeared. At that moment, Horatio had hastily dropped her hand. The memory of him letting go of her hand had Clara dipping her head under the water, as if she could hide from the world, by plunging into those depths and forgetting that memory. It was clear as she thought of their intimate times together that Horatio was always the one to put distance back between them again. Perhaps that is what he meant to do at the afternoon tea. Maybe he feared my attachment and wanted to put me on my guard. It would certainly explain why he has not returned to go riding with me again. Pressing her head through the water, she washed herself when she heard Betchy return to the chamber. The maid stayed on the other side of the screen as she brought in hot water, tea leaves and milk on a silver tray. My lady, I'll put your tea down here by the fire. I have brought up one of the cupcakes you made too. There is just one left. Thank you, Betchy, Clara called to her. I will call again soon when I wish to dress. Of course. Betchy left, humming a happy tune. Even though Clara couldn't see her because of the screen, she could guess well enough what Betchy would be doing as she left. Most likely, she would be playing with the silver necklace James had given to her. Once Clara was done with her bath, she clambered out and toweled her body dry before moving toward the silver tray by the fire. On a plate was the last cupcake. She picked it up, feeling a lingering hatred for what she had done. I'm a fool for going to such lengths to try and please him. She tucked into the cupcake, taking a bite, before a small smile appeared on her lips. She had greatly enjoyed making the cupcakes and wondered if she could perhaps repeat such an experiment someday, but not to impress another, only to please herself. Maybe I could, she whispered, then lifted the jar holding the tea leaves about to spoon them into the teapot of hot water when the silver spoon in her hand hovered in the air. The hesitation was a reminder that there was one last thing in the healer's box that she had not yet tried. Returning the caddy spoon to the tea leaves, she crossed the chamber, wrapping her towel tightly around her body as she sought out the tramp box hidden under her bed. Placing it on the blankets, she lifted the lid and searched inside. Amongst the objects, she found the glass vial labelled Belladonna Leaves. Taking the glass vial, she returned to the tea tray along with a note from Bonadea with instructions on how to prepare the tea. 
there was a heavy warning that accompanied the healer's instructions. The effects of belladonna leaves are powerful. Pray, use them with care and follow my instructions. Very well, Clara whispered to herself and followed the instructions to the letter, placing the caddy spoon in the glass vial and adding a little of the leaves to the teapot. She was halfway through her task when there was a knock at her bedchamber door. Clara? Marianne's voice called through the closed wood. Yes, Mama? Clara called, pausing with the spoon. I just wanted to let you know your father and I have been talking about this evening. Mr Fitzroy is not the only eligible gentleman that will be there tonight. Marianne's words made Clara's heart sink a little as she stirred the tea leaves, losing track of how much she had put in. Lord Warrington and Mr Nesbitt will be there. They have both called on you before. Marianne's voice was tinged with hope. Yes, they have. I am sure we will have a pleasant evening, Mama, Clara called to her mother, wanting to put her mind at rest. Yes, you are right. Marianne did not leave right away, though. Her worry was plain. She knew how much I care for Mr Fitzroy. It never had to be declared, not in so many words, but she knew. I will see you downstairs soon, my dear, Marianne said and retreated from the door. Clara sighed with relief once her mother was gone and looked down at the teapot, trying to remember how many teaspoons of the belladonna leaves she had put in. The recipe said two, but had she put in two already, or just one? She could have been hesitant and stuck with it as it was. Turning over the healer's instructions, she found a list of the tea's benefits. Gives a healthy rouge to the skin, can make the drinker calm and comfortable too, sometimes a little tired. In all, the drinker is said to glow. Clara was convinced that a few more tea leaves couldn't hurt, not if the effects were so fortunate. She added another small spoon of leaves to the hot water and stirred it in the teapot, allowing it to brew before she poured out a cup full of the belladonna. It was a strange purplish-green liquid that when she sniffed it, it made her nose curl. Oh, I think I will have to hold my nose when I drink this. She laughed at herself as she took a hearty gulp. Standing to her feet, she returned to the healer's tramp box and replaced the glass vial. As she moved, she carried the teacup with her, drinking a little and often. Staring into the tramp box, it all felt an odd thing to have tried in the first place. Perhaps the healer's remedies helped to make a woman sometimes feel more confident and comfortable in her own skin. Clara had certainly felt more confident this last week, but that confidence had faded with Horatio's declaration, and she felt a fool for trying any of these remedies at all. Let this be the last evening I do this, Clara declared aloud, speaking of her resolution to the open air. It is my last attempt to catch Horatio's eye, and if he still does not notice me. She hesitated, lifting the lid of the tramp box and slowly closing it. Then he never will look at me as he sees other women. She closed the lid of the tramp box, the sound echoing rather ominously around the room. Crossing the chamber once more, she lifted the teacup to her lips and downed it, even drinking the dregs. Despite the awful scent, there was something pleasant in the taste of the drink. She returned the coupe to the tray and moved it to her wardrobe, opening the doors wide to look at her dresses. The blue gown her mother had spoken of was near the front and would have been easy to choose, but there was another gown that caught her eye. A Pomona green dress pushed to the back was one she had quite forgotten about. It was rather bold, and a colour that Clara didn't usually wear. She often preferred creams, whites and pastel colours, for they helped her to stay quite hidden in corners of rooms. Perhaps I shall be a little different tonight. She reached for the Pomona green gown. Chapter 18 Clara how much of this did you have? Betsy asked, lifting the lid of the teapot and wrinkling her nose as she peered into the teapot. I followed the recipe, I think. Clara turned to the mirror, trying not to think too much about it. There may have been a few extra leaves in there, but I am sure a few leaves could do no harm. 
In the reflection of the mirror, Clara caught Betchy's reaction. Betchy's eyebrows furrowed together before she sniffed the teapot another time. She seemed to decide it was no great concern, for she shrugged and replaced the lid to the teapot. What do you think of this one? Clara held the Pomona green gown over her body, hiding her chemise, stockings and corset for a minute. Goodness! Betchy hurried across the room, joining her at the mirror. The lightness of Betchy's eyes seemed lighter still as she stared at the gown. It is so different to what you usually wear. I do not know why, but I wish to wear it. Clara ruffled the skirt for a minute, watching as the green silk shimmered in the last of the sunlight that streamed through the window. It was like staring at liquid emeralds, the surface shimmering. Are you feeling well? Betchy teased her. Quite well, Clara laughed. Imagine that. A lady wishes to wear a different gown, and you're convinced she's gone quite mad. No, indeed, it is nice to see you opt for such a gown. Betchy took the gown from her. It is quite stunning. Clara smiled and stepped into the gown as Betchy held it out for her. Standing on one foot, Clara felt a little dizzy. It was a strange effect, but she managed to hide it from her friend by reaching out with one hand to the standing mirror and supporting herself there before climbing into the gown. With two feet on the floor once more, she felt safe and that dizziness settled. As Betchy tied the laces at the back of the gown, Clara faced the mirror, staring at her reflection. The green silk did something rather different to her skin. It was a contrast, but a good one. For a change, she didn't look wan and pale, with her white gown completing the look of a ghost, far from it. Maybe I should wear such colours more. As Betchy finished tying the laces and stepped away, hunting out some shoes to match the dress, Clara moved closer to the mirror and looked at her face in the reflection. Pinching her cheeks, she brought a rouge to the tinge of her skin. Her pupils seemed more dilated than usual too. Perhaps it is the effect of the belladonna. Here you go, my lady. Betchy offered up some shoes. Once more as Clara stepped in, she had to stabilise herself by placing a hand on the mirror, though Betchy didn't notice, for she was concentrating too much on her task. It is merely the tea. No doubt the feeling will fade in time. Clara assured herself with this thought as she stepped back, holding her arms outward. What do you think? Clara asked. I know it is very different to how I usually look, but... I think you look quite beautiful, Betchy declared without hesitation. In fact, I think any gentleman who does not ask you to dance tonight will be a fool indeed. Ha! Then the world will be full of fools, Clara said in jest, watching as her friend laughed with her. I should go. Thank you for your help, Betchy. She clasped her friend's hand before hurrying out of the room. At the door, she smiled once back at Betchy, noting that Betchy's nose curled as she returned to the teapot. Clara thought nothing more of it and hurried out of the room. On the stairs, that dizziness returned, but clutching to the banister, she managed to push it away. At the bottom of the stairs, her parents awaited her, though their backs were turned to her as they stood in the front door, waiting for the carriage to be prepared. They were clearly not aware of her approach for some minutes, as Clara overheard a conversation they would plainly not have had if they knew she was in earshot. I fear what his words have done to her, Marianne was confessing to her husband, her arm wrapped tightly through his own. It is why I issued caution. Gregory's words were quiet, but there was a firmness there that Clara could not remember hearing for some time. The man is blind. I'll give him that. It is a shame. You like him, Gregory, may I remind you? Marianne said, elbowing him as if punishing him. I do like Mr Fitzroy. I respect him. I watched him grow from being a boy to a man. Gregory sighed deeply. When he returned, and I heard the rumours of him, I confess, I feared he would break many a lady's heart. It is with great sadness I see our daughter is to be one of them. It is sad indeed, Marianne whispered. Clara stumbled on the last step, cottoning on to what they were discussing. Her own heartbreak was hard enough, but to hear her parents talking of it, when they had never even asked her about it, cut deep.
as if she had been wounded in her gut. They were pitying her openly, and it only made her feel small. Aham. She cleared her throat as she stepped off the stairs, announcing her presence. Her parents turned round to face her, their faces both abruptly spreading into smiles. If you're both going to gossip about me, pray at least next time do it more quietly. I am sorry, dear, Marianne said in a rush, stepping toward her and releasing Gregory's arm. We were simply worrying. Oh. Her eyes widened as they danced over Clara's figure. Feeling self-conscious, Clara's hands began to flatten out the dress, worried there might be creases in it. You did not opt for the blue gown? Marianne asked. No. Clara swallowed, that nervousness growing. I thought I would try something different this evening. Clara, you look quite stunning, Gregory said, picking up her shawl off a hook by the front door and carrying it toward her, offering to thread it around her shoulders for her. Thank you, Father. You should wear more colours like this. They suit you well. Gregory offered his arm and escorted her out of the house. Thank you, she said again, her chin raising a little higher now. Yes, it suits you very well. Marianne seemed surprised, running her fingers over Clara's skirt as they passed out of the house and down the front steps, heading toward the carriage that awaited them. Clara was helped inside first, then Marianne. Gregory stepped up last and knocked on the wall of the carriage, showing they were ready to go. Lord Warrington will be there this evening, Marianne said after some minutes of silence. You enjoyed his visit to the house, did you not? She seemed intent on having an answer from Clara, a look of hope in her eyes. Yes, he was a pleasant man. Clara recollected the strange gentleman's visit. Lord Warrington had had a preoccupation with hygiene, going so far as to dab himself with his napkin multiple times. Even after he had escorted Clara to a room and released her hand, he had wiped his palm with the napkin as if she was dirty. His conversation was pleasant enough, but I am not sure he will be offering any attentions to me. In that gown, Gregory said distractedly, I worry how many gentlemen will be approaching you tonight. His voice was gruff, so much so that Clara looked at him, noticing a crease in his forehead. Are you worried for me, father? A little. You're my daughter, he reminded her. When I look at you... I always see the little girl who liked to run through our garden and invariably came back with dirt all over her. I wish to protect you. From Lord Warrington? Clara asked with interest, watching the way her father exchanged a look with Marianne. From any man that would hurt you, Gregory said, his voice growing deeper. Fearing her parents were going to return to talking of Horatio once more, she turned her eyes out of the window and avoided encouraging them in the conversation. They must have sensed her reticence for the topic, for soon enough they talked of other matters such as who would be at the ball, and no one mentioned Horatio or his parents. Clara was happy to busy herself with watching the sun descend in the distance. When they passed Baron Adlington's house, she traced the sunlight as it faded around the building, thinking of Horatio riding his horse back to the house after each of their rides, then darkness swept in, and the thought of Horatio vanished with the light. Clara kept staring at the champagne in her wide-brimmed glass, thinking that watching the bubbles was a much more interesting event than she had ever considered it to be before. Each bubble rose to the surface of the liquid, then bobbed with its neighbour, as if they were dancing on the ceiling. An errant imagining of the people at the ball dancing on the ballroom ceiling entered her head, and Clara hid her giggle behind her champagne glass, masking it from the ladies around her. I feel quite light-headed and silly this evening. Perhaps I have drunk more champagne than I realised. The ladies in her circle were preoccupied with gossiping. For a large part, Clara had taken no notice. She was aware of the ladies pointing at others in the room, being cruel about other women's choices of gowns, and even going so far as to disparage some ladies' choice of dancing partners. More than once had Clara attempted to leave but Miss Harriet Pilkington had taken her arm and urged her to stay. 
Once more, Clara tried to leave now, quite mesmerised by watching the champagne bubbles dance and deciding it was much more interesting than the ladies' conversation. Yet, as she attempted to go, Miss Pilkington took her arm and drew her back, bumping their sides together, as if they were the dearest of friends. Oh, to be beside a true friend now instead of this lady. Lady Clara, do not part from us yet, Miss Pilkington pleaded. After all, you can give us more gossip than most. I can, Clara said in surprise. Oh, yes, indeed, Lady Caroline Waters declared from Clara's other side. I hear that Mr Fitzroy had been riding with you a lot as of late. A lot? Miss Pilkington spluttered, practically choking on her own champagne. Clara smiled a little, feeling some sort of satisfaction in seeing the jealousy on Miss Pilkington's face. Yes, indeed, Lady Waters said hurriedly. You were seen riding one day by my father's steward. She went on with purpose, eyeing Clara carefully. The beauty of Lady Waters' features was a distraction to Clara at this moment. She found one of her hands brushing the Pomona green gown, finding folds that creased and trying to flatten them. We are friends, and we always rode together when we were young. Mr Fitzroy wished to return to the pastime, Clara declared, watching out of the corner of her eye as Miss Pilkington blushed a bright red. Oh, she murmured, struggling for words. As you know him so well, you will know better than any of us which lady he is considering courting. He must confide in you, must he not? As you two are such good friends. The emphasis of the word made the champagne in Clara's stomach curdle. She wondered if she'd only heard the emphasis in her own head, or if it was done on purpose by Miss Pilkington. Did I tell you how he described you, Lady Clara, on the first night he and I danced together? I am not sure I wish to hear it. Clara took a gulp of champagne, once more feeling that Miss Pilkington was out to cause trouble. He called you the little friend he'd always had, the one that followed him round like a shadow. Miss Pilkington was not the only one to laugh raucously. Lady Caroline Waters, Miss Withers and two other ladies did too. The embarrassment of the moment had Clara turning bright red. She could feel it heating her cheeks. What a cruel thing to say, Miss Withers said, shaking her head. Gosh, I am greater than a fool. Clara's thoughts ran mad as she stared down at her champagne. I am an imbecile to think Horatio could ever look at me with admiration when this is what he says of me when I am nowhere nearby. Is that exactly what he said, Miss Pilkington, word for word? Lady Caroline seemed as if she didn't quite believe it, angling her head to the side. It is what he said, Miss Pilkington insisted. I find it hard to imagine a gentleman who is such good friends with Lady Clara would talk about her in such a manner. Lady Caroline didn't back down, but Clara knew the truth. Horatio would talk about her in such a manner. Maybe he meant it as a jest, for that was his way, making comments into constant jokes and witticisms. Perhaps he had no idea how cruel those words actually sounded, or how small they would make her feel. Let us put the matter to bed, Clara said hurriedly, praying for a different subject. Yes, let us talk of who Mr Fitzroy intends to dance with tonight. With the words, Miss Pilkington presented her dance card, making the small engraved card dance around her white-gloved wrist. He intimated when we met the other day that he would reserve two dances with me tonight. Two? Clara couldn't help the word escaping her in surprise. For all of Horatio's insistence that he hasn't chosen his future bride yet, the man is an insufferable flirt. He has Miss Pilkington convinced of his attachment to her. Yes, indeed. Miss Pilkington lifted her head high. Do I hear a note of envy in your tone, Lady Clara? Aware that all the gazes of the ladies swivelled toward her, Clara shook her head. No, indeed. As you say, I am just his shadow. Last time I checked, shadows did not have voices, so what I have to say should not matter. Her words she meant in jest, and she was relieved to see that Lady Caroline and Miss Withers laughed, happy to indulge but Miss Pilkington seemed quite out of sorts and shifted between her feet before her attention was caught by something else in the room. Ah, speak of the devil, she said hurriedly. 
It seems he has arrived now. We shall see just who he asked to dance. Clara turned her gaze to follow Miss Pilkington's own to see Horatio had indeed arrived along with his parents and was standing by the doorway of the room, his eyes surveying the ballroom quickly. Then his gaze found Clara's own and he didn't look away. Chapter 19 Horatio Horatio's eyes found Clara's easily through the crowd. She was standing amongst a group of ladies, most of whom Horatio had danced with many times. This evening Clara stood out, for many reasons. She opted for a Pomona green gown, a colour he had not seen her wear before, and it suited her quite brilliantly. It flattered the curves of her figure, and if he was not mistaken, he would not be the only gentleman looking at her tonight in that gown. Yet there was so much more that drew him to her, rather than just the gown. She smiled a little at him across the room, and at once he returned that look. She was the one person in the ballroom who he wished to talk to. Naturally, he could flirt and charm the other ladies around her. Such times had been enjoyable in the past, but in that moment they felt cheap to Horatio and paper thin. Why would he waste time charming such ladies when he could have a real conversation with Clara? It has little to do with beauty or surface charm. The thought struck him harshly, as if he had been winded. It has everything to do with the heart. The truth of the matter was that Clara had the best heart in the room. She had kindness, devotion and wit. Their friendship was one he had taken for granted for too long. Horatio? His mother's voice approached him from behind. He barely cast a glance back at Eleonora, for he couldn't take his eyes off Clara. She had looked away now and seemed to be in a rather intense conversation with Miss Pilkington at her side. Yes, mother, he said distractedly. I hope you will dance with many ladies tonight. Eleonora's tone was an excited one. Any other time, Horatio would have sighed. Since his discussion the other day at the tea party about marrying, she had taken up the mantle of this discussion with fervour and constantly encouraged him toward ladies and courtship. Who will you dance with? I will satisfy your hunger to see me dance tonight, mother, he said, watching as her smile broadened. Though I may surprise you as to who I ask. Who? she asked with plain intrigue. Before he could answer her, his father appeared at his mother's side, offering up a glass. Patrick, this is the most interesting thing. Horatio has just declared he is about to surprise us with whom he is going to ask to dance. Is he? Then allow me to place a wager on the matter. Patrick whispered something in Eleonora's ear, making her eyes widen. Who did you guess? Horatio asked, but Patrick refused to say and shook his head. Go to the lady you wish to dance with, Horatio. I shall see if my wager is right or not. Horatio looked away from his father's amused grin and crossed the room. He made his way toward the group of ladies, knowing this first move would satisfy his parents little, for he could pick any of the ladies in the crowd. He moved to stand beside Clara, not wanting to stand with anyone else. I must talk to her. I must make amends for what I said when we shared tea. Good evening, ladies. He bowed to them all, then shifted his focus to Clara who curtsied rather hurriedly. He was tempted to take her hand, to draw her away from the other ladies at once, but she clutched at her champagne glass with both hands, making the task an impossible one. Ah, Mr Fitzroy, Miss Pilkington declared on his other side, trying to get his attention. Your ears must have been burning, for you are quite the topic of our conversation. I am. Horatio knew there were many charming words he could have offered, but he said none of them. He barely glanced at Miss Pilkington and looked to Clara instead. Has the topic of me bored you yet? I would not be surprised for it. His jest prompted her to smile. At least this evening she was not avoiding looking at him. She returned his gaze just as intently as his own. Bored of you, she asked, that smile still in place. I deny it was possible, but I fear what it would do to your ego. We both know it's a dangerous thing, he jested with her, 
aware that the other ladies were watching him closely. Well, Miss Pilkington rather forced her way into the conversation, we have been talking much of who you will dance with tonight. Is that subject so interesting? Horatio asked, his brow furrowing. There are many gentlemen here tonight you ladies could dance with. That there are. Lady Caroline agreed with a hearty nod. Yet you should hear how Miss Pilkington talks of you, Mr Fitzroy. She has her heart set on you for a dance. Horatio felt his heart sink in his chest. To not ask Miss Pilkington now would be quite rude, for her intentions had been laid open by her friend, but Horatio found he could not do it. Out of the corner of his eye he could see Clara looking down at her champagne glass, then busy herself with taking a sip. Surely Miss Pilkington longs for a different partner for a change. His words surprised everyone, including Clara, who practically choked on her champagne. She looked up as he offered his handkerchief, allowing her to dab her lips. Oh! Miss Pilkington struggled for words as Horatio went on. Keep it, Lady Clara, he said when she tried to offer the handkerchief back to him. It was a courtesy to offer a lady a handkerchief but the offer for her to keep it suggested something deeper, perhaps a connection between them. At once, he noticed Miss Withers and a lady next to her whisper and point at the handkerchief. Are you not in the mood to dance tonight? Clara asked, her lips parted in wonder. On the contrary, I'd be glad of a dance. He clasped his hands together and rubbed them excitedly. If you will be my partner, Lady Clara. He held his hand out toward her, feeling a startling knot in his stomach. The last time he had asked her to dance, she had refused, making up an excuse and running away quite quickly. I beg of you, do not refuse me tonight. It mattered more to him now than any other dance ever had done before. Surely Lady Clara does not mean to dance, Miss Pilkington said quickly. She rarely ever does. Lady Clara can answer for herself. Horatio found it hard to keep the irritation out of his voice, so much so that he didn't look at Miss Pilkington with the words but kept his eyes on Clara. Please, Clara. For a second, he thought she must have heard his silent plea, for there was a flicker to her lips, one that showed her temptation to smile. I'll be glad to dance, she offered her hand to him. If you would excuse us, ladies. Horatio bowed to them all and took the champagne glass out of Clara's hand, placing it down on a nearby table before drawing her away across the room. As they walked, he was aware of the startled way in which she was looking at him. Her brow was creased so much, her eyes squinted, and their usual enticing dark colour was almost hidden by that squint. I have shocked you, he whispered, drawing her nearer to him as they made their way toward the dance floor. He brought her so near that he felt a heat being that close to her. She must have felt it too, for a blush began to spread across her cheeks and her breathing quickened. For how long has she been this responsive to me? For how long have I been blind to the effect I have on her? A little, she confessed. Miss Pilkington has been talking of how she will share two dances with you tonight. After her name was mentioned by you the other day as a possible bride, I felt for certain you would not waste a dance with me. Waste a dance, he spluttered and shook his head, laughing a little. Clara, I don't consider a dance with you to be wasting anything. Mr Fitzroy, she said, raising an eyebrow. Yes? You dropped my title again, she whispered as they stopped by the dance floor waiting for the music to end so they could join in with the next dance. So I did. His smile grew a little as he chose not to look away from her. I find I cannot stick to your title and I have no wish to. I also wish you would not call me Mr Fitzroy. It is your name, she reminded him, as is Horatio. He smiled broadly and lowered the connection of their hands down to his side, so their hold on one another was hidden from any onlooker. With that new secrecy, he brushed his thumb across the back of her hand, a small act of fondness. The way her eyes shot down to that touch showed it had the effect he had hoped for. Call me Horatio, Clara. Please. But... 
she seemed to struggle for words. Before any more could be said between them, the last dance ended, and the dancers moved from the floor. Horatio took the opportunity to lead her forward and set up their places in the centre of the floor. This is how it will be between us. Horatio had a plan now, so that he would not hurt her again. Tonight, he would show his intentions rather than say them. They would be as they had been the last week during their rides, the closest of friends. Yet their intimacies he would press further still, to illustrate to her how he truly felt. When the moment was right and they were alone, perhaps on their next ride together, he would declare what he truly felt for her. This feeling, Clara, it is not just friendship. It is much more than that. He released her hand, and they turned to bow and curtsy to one another. As the music began, he found it was a cotillion. It was with some disappointment he realised it was not a waltz, for the idea of holding Clara in his arms for such a dance made a longing build in his stomach. Taking her hand, they circled one another for the opening rotation, then parted and turned the other way, this time not holding on to one another, but at all times looking at each other. Why did you choose me to dance with? She said softly, staring openly at him. There are finer dancers than I. If a man chooses who to dance with based on their skill, then he is a shallow man. Horatio took her hand and led her around the couple beside them before they turned to face one another, taking each other in the waltz hold. The way his fingers took her waist clearly caught her attention for a small gasp escaped her lips. That sound had his heart beating hard in his chest. I wish to dance with you because it is you. He hoped it was enough to show his longing for her. She smiled a little, then shook her head as if in disbelief. And who shall you dance with next? she asked. Miss Pilkington certainly has her heart set upon you. Lady Waters would be glad for a dance too, I am sure. She is a great beauty. She released him and walked around him as he performed a two-step side to side. To keep Clara in sight, Horatio cricked his neck as he flicked round to follow her with his eyes. He noticed something strange as she walked. She blinked a little uncertainly, but then she did not repeat the action as she came back to face him. I shall dance with you again. This time his words shocked her as he took hold of her once more. This time there was only his one hand on her waist and her hand on his shoulder. They seemed to be dancing closer than he could remember, dancing with any other lady. If you say yes, of course. You confuse me, she whispered, her chin tilted up toward him, such a pleasant blush on her cheeks that Horatio found he lost track of where the other couples were on the floor. He so nearly ended up bumping the shoulders with another gentleman that his hand passed a little further around Clara's waist, drawing her forward, away from a possible collision. Ride with me again tomorrow, he asked, never taking his eyes off hers. You have not been to my house for three days, she reminded him. I thought you had lost interest in riding. Consider that me dwelling on my own anger at myself for two of them, and working with my father for the third day, he explained in a rush as he turned her under his arm. Her head spun round, her gaze meeting his quickly. Once more that was a lack of focus in her eyes, and her head turned to the side. Why were you angry at yourself? For a very specific reason. I shall tell you all tomorrow. His voice deepened as they returned to the beginning of the dance. As they took hands and circled one another, he sought out her gaze but had lost it now. Clara? She was looking down then her head tilted sideways. Is something wrong? I... She didn't finish. She released his hand, and as they turned to walk the other way around one another, he saw her eyes glazed over. Clara, he said in panic. He didn't care if the choreography called for him not to hold her at that moment. He reached for her hand, taking it tightly in his own. He abandoned the dance, just as her eyes closed. Clara! She appeared dizzy, then lost her footing and began to fall. No! 
His arm came up around her instantly as her feet gave way beneath her. Horatio held her tightly in his arms, gazing down at her in the candlelight. She had swooned, but in the most unnatural way possible. Where a lady was usually pale after fainting, Clara was red in the cheeks, and there was sweat beading on her brow. Everyone stopped in the dance as Horatio held on to her. They all turned, wondering if there had been some injury. Clara? Horatio lifted his hand to her cheek, but she didn't rouse. She was completely unconscious, as if she was far gone from the world. Looking up, Horatio sought her parents. He found them swiftly across the room with the Duke marching forward. Even the musicians abandoned their music as all stared, wondering what had happened. I'll get you out of here, Clara, Horatio whispered, even though she could no longer hear him. He lifted her in his arms and carried her, resting her unconscious head against his shoulder and marching away from the dance floor. The dancers parted, as did those in the ballroom, allowing Horatio to meet the Duke in the middle of the floor. What has happened? the Duke asked in panic. She has passed out, Your Grace. Something is wrong. The Duke gestured for Horatio to pass Clara to him, but Horatio refused. He had no intention of letting her go. Chapter 20 Clara the world seems so strange. Clara's eyes opened, but she could not focus in one place for long. As quickly as she saw something above her, her gaze was darting somewhere else, restless. There was a heat to her body, one that seemed to burn from far beneath her skin into her very core. She pulled at the covers around her, desperately needing some coolness. Then a damp cloth was pressed to her head. She felt it abruptly there with the water drops running down her forehead and her nose. She is unwell indeed, a voice said, from somewhere through the blurriness. It wasn't a voice she recognised, but it was a gentleman's rougher tones. How could this happen? Marianne called, her voice the one closest to Clara. The cloth on her forehead moved and she realised it was her mother holding that dampness to her. My poor Clara, my dear. She moved the cloth away and kissed Clara's forehead. Briefly, Clara focused on her mother's face, then it was blurry again as the cloth returned to her forehead. She may have eaten or drank something that has made her ill. Equally, these fevers can catch one unawares, Your Grace. It had to be a doctor's voice, the male one, that was trying to placate her mother. He had that insufferably calm tone that seemed to contrast her mother's panicked voice so strongly. I have given her some tonics to calm her now. We must let her rest. I will not leave her side, Marianne exclaimed loudly. Clara tried to reach out a hand to her mother, wanting to be near her. She felt her mother's hand clasp her own. She is awake, see? She is awake. Barely, the doctor said once more. She is in delirium. She may not even remember this later. I will remember. Clara tried to commit the moment to memory. Above her, she saw Marianne's face. Her cheeks were streaked with tears and her hair was in disarray. Such love Clara felt for her mother in that moment that she clutched hard on her hand, refusing to let go. Then another face appeared behind Marianne's. It was her father's. Gregory's wide lips were pressed firmly together. It was his usual sign of worry. He reached out a hand and pushed the hair back from Clara's forehead. She briefly focused on his eyes, able to see the dark orbs there, then things became blurry once more. Clara could feel herself slipping away, as if falling into darkness. Never had she known this sort of sleep before. It was heavy, and it clawed her, as if it were some other world that had creatures dwelling within it. These creatures made of shadows had their fingers on her shoulders and on her gown. They were drawing her into the darkness of sleep, so fast she could not fight it. We must do as the doctor says, Gregory was saying to Marianne. I know it is hard, but all this excitement in this room is not good for her. Come away, Marianne. You go, I will not leave her, Marianne insisted. I will stay with her, Your Grace. That was Betchy's voice, Clara was quite certain of it. The argument continued over who should stay there with Clara, 
but the voices seemed to become distant, and Clara was drawn into that dark world of sleep. She wasn't sure how long everything stayed black. Soon enough, imaginations took hold behind the darkness of her lids. The dreams were mad and strange. Sometimes she saw herself running through the Corfe Castle ruins, uncertain if she was running from someone or trying to find another. She kept looking over her shoulder, then searching forward once more, her eyes dancing restlessly. The ruins of the keep towered over her head, then a rumble began, deep within the earth. It shook the ground and the ruined castle, until the stones began to shake free of their positions. Clara sprinted, heading for the parapet above the castle bank. From here there was a sharp cliff drop, deep within the valley beside the castle hill. Once there had been a moat beneath her, but it was all dry now. In that crevice of earth there was a figure waving to her. I will catch you, he was shouting to her, trying to assure her. It may be some distance away, but Clara was certain who it was. It was Horatio waving to her. Jump, Clara. She had no choice. The castle was coming down. The stones of the tower keep were falling from their position. Some crashed into the earth behind her, and if she stayed where she was for any longer, she risked being trapped, injured, maybe even fatally. Clara, Horatio called to her, a note of desperation in his voice. Jump! Clara took that leap. Her body fell through the air, yet there was no sign of the ground, no earth to meet her, and Horatio's arms were not their ether to catch her. No one was there, and the world seemed empty, until she caught sight of the bottom of the valley. It was coming up quickly toward her, the grass about to meet her face. Clara! Clara sat up in bed. The dream melted away as she looked around herself, finding her body not only damp but running in sweat, with her hair plastered to her face. Clara. It was Betchy's voice. She shook Clara by the shoulders, and Clara's eyes darted to her maid sitting beside her. You were dreaming. Betchy. Clara managed her maid's name, her throat feeling dry and croaky. Raising a hand to her neck, she looked around the room, stunned at its transformation. Dark curtains had been thrown over the windows, and herbal oils were being burned at one end of the room, filling the air with their scents. Drink this, Betchy said, passing a glass of water to Clara. You must need it. Thank you, Clara managed shakily, noting how her hand trembled as she lifted the glass. She felt awful. She was dizzy and felt a need to lay down again, though she pressed herself into the pillows against the bedhead, fighting the urge. Betchy, what has happened to me? Betchy slowly took the glass from Clara's fingers and returned it to the bedside table, glancing to the closed bedchamber door before she spoke, clearly wary of incomers. It was the Belladonna, my lady, Betchy said, her voice tight as her lip trembled. Not that the doctor has realised that. Clara stared, her lips parted, as Betchy went on. You must have drunk too much. You are quite ill indeed. The doctor thinks you have a fever or ate something strange, but I am in no doubt as to your illness's cause. You have all the symptoms of belladonna poisoning. Betchy's breath hitched and her eyes filled with tears. Oh, Betchy! Clara reached toward her and took her hand. Do not worry for me. How could I not? Betchy asked as a tear slid down her cheek. Belladonna is dangerous. They call it deadly nightshade for a reason, for it's deadly. The very words shook Clara to her core. She shuddered and sat back against the bedhead once more, though she still clung to Betchy's hand. I was the one who recommended the healer to you. Oh, I'm so sorry, my lady. I did this to you. What? No, no, that is absurd. Clara sat abruptly forward and her head swam. She tilted to the side, in danger of falling out of the bed. My lady! Betchy grabbed her by the shoulders, pulling her back to safety. Thank you, Clara whispered, as she turned on the bed and took Betchy's hand once more. Listen to me, my friend. You have nothing to reproach yourself with and no reason to take blame. I am the one who drank the tea. I am the one who put too much in. Oh, what have I done to myself? 
Looking around the room, the danger began to dawn greatly. On a sideboard, Clara could see a bleeding bowl that had not yet been cleaned properly. The sight of the dried blood against the white porcelain made her look down to her arm where the doctor had bled her, her arm sore from the prick of a needle. There were glass vials of tonics stacked high too, and Clara couldn't quite discern the temperature of the room. Was it cold or hot and cloying? She pulled at the covers, then pushed them away in the next second. You still have a fever, Betchy warned her, placing her palm to Clara's temple. You must rest to get better. Your mother will be relieved to see you are awake at last. Awake? How long have I been... Clara trailed off as she suddenly remembered the ball. She could remember dancing with Horatio, feeling excitement and hope as he danced with her. Her foolishness had made her giddy like a child, before a dizziness had swept in, one so strong she had been unable to fight it. God of mercy, I swooned at the ball, did I not? Mr Fitzroy caught you before you fell, Betchy explained in a quiet rush. Oh! Clara covered her face, hiding in the palms of her hands. The knowledge that she had not only swooned in front of the entire ball, but fallen into Horatio's arms was too much to bear. What must he think of her now? What would all the ladies be saying about her today? You barely woke at all yesterday, Betchy said, her words continuing to come fast. When you did, the doctor feared you were hallucinating, in a state of delirium. Oh, this just gets worse. Clara turned and pressed her face into the pillow, hoping to hide there for good when she felt a dampness of sweat across her forehead. She lifted just enough for Betchy to pass her a wet cloth so she could clean her skin. How could I have done this to myself, Betchy? What do you mean? she asked. The healer's tonics. Oh, what if they are found? Clara clawed at the bed, her body too weak to move across the mattress but Betchy pulled her back into position against the pillows. Fear not for them. I have hidden them so that the doctor and your parents could not find them, Betchy said with a quick smile. No one needs to know. Thank you, but that is not what worries me most. Clara sat up and shook her head. At this angle, as she turned her head across the room, she caught a glimpse of her reflection. Ordinarily, when she saw her reflection, she would poke at it, pull at her skin and wonder how much fairer she could look if things were a little different, but not today. The sight that greeted her in that mirror was too worrying to even think of lifting her hands to her cheeks. Her skin was pale, her cheeks had a gaunt look to them, and her hair was mussed with the dampness of sweat. I could be a ghost, she whispered into the air, uncertain whether Betchy heard her at all. I could have died drinking that tea. All for what? For Horatio to notice me. Betchy, I fear who I have become. This time, Clara caught the attention of her lady's maid completely. Betchy's eyes fixed on her. What do you mean? Here, drink this. The doctor said I was to keep giving you water when you're roused. Betchy pressed another glass into Clara's hands, and she took small sips aware that when she drank that was a queasy feeling in her stomach. I mean, look at me, Clara said between sips. Look what I have done to myself. I have quite lost control of my sanity. And for what? For a man to notice me who had no intention of ever considering me in the first place. Am I so unhappy in myself that I would seek to change my own being for the sake of another? Oh, God. She sank back into the pillows. Even hearing the words aloud makes me ashamed. My lady. Betchy lifted her own hands and covered her cheeks, a look of despair in her large, round eyes. I don't think you ever really needed the healer's tonics. You are a fine woman as you are, my dearest friend, and you are the kindest person I know. If the man you care for is not wise enough to see any of that, then is it not a sign he is not worthy of your care? The words seemed to cut through the dizziness for a second, and Clara nodded. She felt numb toward Horatio in that moment. He'd done nothing wrong, other than be true to himself. 
Though she questioned why he had felt the need to flirt and speak as he had done at the ball with her, she knew the truth of how he felt, for he had declared it quite openly over tea with her parents. He intended to marry another. Why then was she seeking to capture his interest at the expense of her own health? We must get rid of the tonics, the tea leaves, all of it. Clara sat forward, but as she tried to stand, that dizziness swam in again. My lady, you must rest. Betsy caught her before she could fall and pressed her back into the bed. I'm under instruction to fetch your family and the doctor when you wake too. Please allow me to do that now. If you wish to be rid of the healer's box, I can do it for you. Yes, please do, thank you, Betsy. Clara rested on the pillows, startled by the sheer exhaustion of her body after just the attempt to rise. As she continued to sip water, the next half an hour or so passed by in a blur. The doctor returned and took her temperature, applying salves to her skin she was not sure would do anything, before he urged her to drink a tea. She sniffed at it, curling her nose, finding herself suspicious of tea now. But she drank eventually. When her parents came in, she was embraced by her mother for many minutes until her eyes began to fall closed and her father pulled Marianne away. We must let her sleep now, dear. She needs it. Gregory had brushed a loving hand over Clara's head, nudging away the damp locks that were stuck to her temple, before he wished her well and pulled Marianne out of the room. Marianne went slowly, constantly looking back at Clara, not wishing to go. Some minutes later, Clara was alone with Betsy. Beneath the tea tray, Betsy revealed the healer's tramp box and opened it on the bed allowing Clara to peer inside. Her stomach seemed to roll, and she found nausea rising as she moved so much, though. I brought it, my lardy, as I wish it to be certain that you truly want to be rid of this. There's the orchid perfume and the recipe for the cupcakes, too. Betsy's voice had softened as she pointed to the box. I truly wish to be rid of it. Clara closed her eyes, sinking back away from the box. You need sleep. Betsy observed. There is one thing we must do before I sleep. Clara sat back, sighing heavily, as she nodded her head at the fire. Would you do me a favour, Betsy? Anything, my lady. Burn it. Clara nodded her heat at the fireplace. Empty the glass vials into the fire, burn the papers, everything. I wish to be rid of it, especially the Belagona tea leaves. Are you certain? Betsy asked, her eyebrows raising as she stood off the bed, carrying the tramp box with her. I am. Please do so. Clara's eyes darted quickly across the room, watching Betsy as she knelt on the rug and began to burn it all, tossing the papers into the flames, emptying the glass bottles, and lastly, tossing in the belladonna leaves. They were singed on the burning logs until they disappeared into glowing embers and became nothing but ash. How absurd I've been, Clara declared with surprising fervour. Her anger at herself overtook her exhaustion briefly, and she said the words loudly to Betsy across the room. My attachment to Horatio has made me quite mad, I fear. We all go a little mad at times, Betsy winced. Not as mad as I, Clara said, cutting off her friend. Today it ends. I will never jeopardise my own health again for the sake of a man. I was blind to even attempt it. Unable to sit up any more, she sank down into the bed, feeling sleep pulling her into its throes. It dragged her toward that darkness, inescapable, so only a few more words escaped her. Do you know what I wish, Betsy? What? Betsy said as she hurried across the room to Clara's side. I wish Horatio had never come home again. I cannot bear his presence here. It has only made things worse. She sighed deeply as her eyelids fluttered closed. I wish he was gone again. Chapter 21 Horatio Mr Fitzroy At his name, Horatio looked up from where he had placed himself in the armchair by the fire, restless and unable to sit back. For the last two days he had occupied a similar position by the fire in the Duke of Gordon's parlour. 
even after the first day where Clara had not roused and the Duke had bid him to go home. He had only gone with the understanding that he could return again early the next morning. You do look tired, my friend, the Duke said kindly and offered him a cup of tea. Horatio hurriedly took it and thanked the Duke for the offer. Am I to understand that when you went home last night you did not sleep at all? Only a little. I could not find peace. Horatio had a heavy heart in his chest, and he seemed unable to shift it. In his mind's eye, he kept seeing that dance with Clara. They were dancing, enjoying themselves as he flirted with her, and she responded, her cheeks blushing red. What hope he'd had in that moment. What excitement. He'd been thinking himself something of an imbecile not to see what could be between them before, but none of that mattered when they had danced together. That dance had been the start of something, had it not. A new future for the two of them, for the dance to end as it had done, with Clara tumbling in his arms, scared him, beyond that which he thought he was capable of being frightened. She was sick indeed. I could not find peace either, the Duke agreed with a slow nod, the old lines of his face looking more and more creased these days. He shifted in his chair, making the light of the fire dance off those craggy features. You have sat in this chair for most of the last two days. Until there is news of her, I fear I cannot leave, Horatio explained as he lifted his teacup to his lips and took a slow sip. I long to know what is wrong with her. As do we all. The Duke nodded in agreement as a deep sigh escaped him. The doctor seems quite confused about the matter. He keeps offering up explanations, though between you and I, I am not sure if they are anything more than guesses. I'm tempted to agree with you. Horatio sat back in the chair, trying to find some comfort as he sipped the tea. He'd overheard the last conversation the doctor had shared with the Duke and Duchess of Gordon about Clara's condition. He seemed none the wiser as to whether it was food poisoning or an infection of some kind. Yet we all ate the same thing the day of the ball. The Duke shook his head. I cannot see how she could have such poisoning. What is more, it's an extreme case, is it not? How many people with food poisoning do you hear of suffering a delirium? Horatio could not make sense of it. He'd seen the doctor shake his head gravely, muttering strange misgivings about Clara's delirium. I fear for her, Horatio confessed Allude. I can tell. The Duke offered a rather sad smile. Yet I also fear that you sitting in my parlour every day is not good for you. I know, I'm sorry for intruding. Horatio went to put down the teacup, but the Duke waved his hand, urging Horatio to continue with his tea. Nonsense, you are not intruding at all. You are always welcome here, the Duke insisted, his voice deep and gravelly. Yet you will notice no other friend of Clara's sits in my house longing to know news of her. Some letters have been sent inquiring after her health, but to be honest, I fear some of them have purely been sent in order to discover some gossip. Ah, the ton, they are predictable. Horatio winced at the idea, thinking of the likes of Miss Pilkington writing a letter just out of curiosity rather than genuine worry. There is also only one person that carried my daughter out of that room when everyone stared at her. The Duke's words had Horatio freezing, with his teacup raised to his lips. You would not even pass her to me, Mr Fitzroy. The Duke's eyebrows raised with the question. I was worried for her, Horatio said, aware his voice had turned quiet. I couldn't imagine leaving her at that moment. I didn't want to leave, and I don't, even now. What he felt for Clara was deep indeed. That was plain for him to see. He had repeatedly glanced at the ceiling, thinking of the bedchamber upstairs where Clara was resting. Then he looked down and thought of that dance, imagining the way she had fallen and how he had reached out to catch her before she struck the floor. She is lucky to have a friend as genuine as you. The Duke's words made guilt spread inside Horatio. He sat forward, resting an elbow on his knee as he lifted his teacup to his lips another time. I'm not sure I have always been as good a friend as I should have been. He didn't elaborate, but he appreciated the Duke's silence on the matter. 
for the Duke didn't press him. He only nodded slowly in understanding. I could have been a better friend. Could I not have noticed she was sick sooner? Should I not have declared openly that day of the tea party that there was but one woman I could think of marrying? An image of Clara appeared in his head. It was of Clara as they fell into the bog by Corfe Castle, their hands pulling at one another to help each other out, and the joyous laugh on her face. That was how Clara should always be, happy and smiling. Has she woken at all? Horatio asked. That is one of the reasons I have come to you now. The Duke nodded his head up to the ceiling. She has woken. The Doctor has seen her, as have Marianne and I. Horatio nearly rose out of his seat in his eagerness, but the Duke raised a hand, trying to calm him. You and I both know, Mr Fitzroy. It would be highly unusual to allow a gentleman caller into my daughter's bedchamber. The Duke's words were honest, said with a small frown. It was enough to make Horatio fall into the seat again, deflated. Yet, perhaps I can make an exception for this situation. After all, she could have injured herself if you had not been there to catch her. You would let me see her? Horatio was already putting down his teacup beside him on a small dumbwaiter table, noting how his words made the Duke's lip curl a little into the glimmer of a smile. I will. Her maid, Betchy, is with her now, so she can be your chaperone. The Duke had barely finished his sentence before Horatio was on his feet. Yet, Mr Fitzroy, may I ask you something before you see her? Yes, of course. Horatio stalled, feeling an itchiness in his legs, for they were so restless and longed to be on the way to Clara's chamber already. Do not stay long, for I fear she's exhausted and needs her sleep, the Duke said as he stood and collected the other teacup. Yes, of course. Horatio moved to the door. And one more thing. The Duke's words had him pausing on the threshold of the door. Yes? Horatio encouraged him on, wishing the gentleman to be quicker in his conversation. Take care with what you say to my daughter, Mr Fitzroy. The warning was there, even though the words were said softly. I've seen her hurt once before by the things you can say. I do not wish to see it again. Horatio balked, his body stiffening. He stared at the Duke with an open and honest face, realising that a secret was being told here. I knew it. I knew what I had done. And this is the confirmation of it. Horatio grimaced to remember how in this very room he had declared quite openly an interest to marry, and never once said Clara's name. I assure you, Your Grace. Horatio held the Duke's gaze. I have no intention of hurting your daughter. Good. The Duke smiled at the words. Then go to her, but remember what I said, and do not stay long. I promise not to. Horatio bowed in parting and left the room, hastening to the stairs. His feet were so restless that he took two steps at a time, as he urged himself to be calm and slowed his haste before he reached the top of the stairs. He walked across the corridor heading for Clara's chamber, finding his hands were smoothing the tailcoat that had become creased from his long hours of sitting in that armchair. Standing outside her door for a second or two, he paced, thinking of what he should say. Was now the moment to tell Clara how he felt? Perhaps it was. He couldn't bear there to be any more pain or misunderstanding between them. It's time to be completely honest with her. He raised a hand to knock on the door when he heard sounds from inside. For a second he was certain he heard his own name, though Clara called him Horatio and not Mr Fitzroy. Then the words quietened a little. Finding his curiosity defying him, Horatio froze, with his hand in the air as if he would knock at any moment as he strained to hear what Clara was saying inside the room. He heard the crack of the fire and wood snapping, as if more logs were being thrown onto the grate. Then Clara's words came loudly, crystal clear through the door. I wish Horatio had never come home again. Her words had his hand slowly dropping from the door. He gulped, feeling a sudden lump in his throat. Why? Why would she not wish me to be here? I cannot bear his presence here. It has only made things worse.
Horatio backed up from the door a little. Her words cut deep into his gut, as if he had been wounded, and he thought of all that had passed between them. He thought of Clara wishing him well with his search for a bride and how she had first rejected his offer of a dance. I wish he was gone again. Her final words on the matter had him stumbling away from the bedchamber. How could he go in there and face her now, knowing how she truly felt about him? He hastened across the landing, though he didn't get far before he reached out for the banister and gripped to it, pausing long enough to hold himself up. Yet I thought... He had been so convinced that Clara cared for him too. Did she not blush at his touches and return his flirtation? Their dance had been something special, something almost intimate. Was it possible he had misunderstood her entirely? I cannot stay here any more, he muttered aloud and flung himself from the landing, hastening for the stairs, practically running down them. In the entrance hall he found the Duke and Duchess of Gordon talking together. Ah, Mr Fitzroy, how did you find... Oh, you are off. The Duke's words noted how quickly Horatio reached for his frock coat off the nearest peg and leapt for the door. I must depart. Thank you for your hospitality. I am sorry to have been here for so long. He bowed to them both, hoping his words were polite enough, though there was such turmoil going on in his breast that he could not be certain of it. Not waiting for their answer, he hastened out of the door and rounded the house, calling to the stables. The stable boy had his steed ready within minutes and soon enough Horatio was on his way home. He galloped down the drive, only pausing the steed long enough at the end of the drive to look back at the house and think of Clara's bedchamber and what she had said. I wish he was gone again. It left him feeling cold, unwanted and as important to her as an autumn leaf that would fall past her shoulder. Cursing under his breath, Horatio fled. He rode hard all the way home, his thoughts racing over every meeting he'd had with Clara and what he could have done now to make her hate him so. Gradually, a picture formed. He no longer thought only of the pleasant memories he'd had with Clara, but their meetings in public. He saw himself as if it were all a painting. He saw how he talked with other ladies, flirted with them, leaving Clara quite sidelined. He watched as he danced with other ladies, one night in particular, where he had practically ignored Clara all evening, for he had not wanted to think of what it was he felt for her. Every lady he had charmed and flirted with had taken his arm and smiled sweetly up at him. That's what Clara thinks of me then. When he reached the house he headed straight for the stable, urging the horse toward the stable master before he hastened into the house. He felt his steps beneath him were heavy and hard, his boots thudding into the earth and the stone steps that led up to the front door. Pushing the door open wide, he made someone jump within. Eleonora at the bottom of the staircase placed a hand to her heart at his sudden entrance. Oh, Horatio, my heart. Goodness, you did make me jump. Is something wrong? How is Lady Clara? At her hurried questions, Horatio didn't answer at first. He merely moved to the stairs. Horatio, what has happened? Nothing. Lady Clara is awake at last, and it seems she is recovering, so that is something. He gulped, avoiding looking at his mother as he stared at the stairs. Tell me the truth, mother. Since I have been back, how would you describe my behaviour at events? I beg your pardon? Eleonora offered an innocent look. It prompted him to narrow his eyes a little. Do not be coy, mother, please, he begged. I need to hear the truth. Would you describe my behaviour as flirtatious? That of a cad? She didn't answer right away, but fidgeted, her hands wringing together before she nodded. They talk of you as quite the rogue, dear. I thought you knew that, she said softly. One should not care about what they think, though. Your father and I never do. You should enjoy your own life, not live it by worrying what others think of you. I know. I did guess that is what they thought to an extent. It's just I never thought... He trailed off. How could he tell his mother that he was only just realising how the rogue he was had alienated him from the one woman he truly cared for? No wonder Clara wanted nothing to do with him, 
when he had always paid his attention elsewhere and behaved so abominably. It's merely a wonder she has not wished me gone before now. Chapter 22 Clara I'm not getting better, am I? Clara asked as she tried to stand from the bed and move to the copper bath Betchy had run for her. I wish I could say you were. Betchy's voice was but a whisper, for she was clearly nervous to admit it aloud. Clara had been in this state for two days now, her body depleted, dizziness swimming in every time she attempted to stand, along with intermittent nausea. The doctor returned every now and then, but all he could assure her was that the fever was passing. She was not convinced his methods of assisting her were helping, and she was tempted to send him away entirely, though her parents would not hear of it. I swear each time the doctor bleeds me he makes me feel worse, Clara muttered as Betchy helped her toward the bath. When they reached the copper bath, she was so dizzy she planted both palms to the rim of the tub, clinging to it to keep herself standing. I wish he would not do it. He says he's letting the ill humours out of the body. At Betchy's words, Clara looked up with something of a glare, to which Betchy smiled a little. I know. It sounds mad, but he swears it works. I am not so convinced. Clara took off her dressing gown and stepped into the water, sitting quickly in the bath so that the soothing fragrance of the water washed over her. The heat helped, warming her inner core that had felt cold when she was sat in the bad. Behind her, Betchy passed her another glass of water, fulfilling her duties well. You are very kind to me, Betchy. You have taken care of me. I only wish I could do more. Betchy drew up a stool and sat beside the bathtub, offering soaps for Clara to use. Clara took them weakly, amazed at the deep breath she had to take just to retrieve the soap from Betchy's grasp. You have done enough. Clara offered a smile to her friend, watching as Betchy's eyes took on a sadness that she had often worn these last few days. You are changed a little, Clara observed sadly. You do not sing these days as you used to. I cannot sing when I am so worried for you, Betchy whispered. You are not seeing your bow either, are you? That guilt raged in Clara's chest. Because you are here helping me, you rarely see him at all. Oh, my lady, do not believe I bemoan that, please. I would always wish to be here to help you, Betchy insisted leaning so far forward that she nearly toppled the stool over. Careful. We do not need an injury to add to the woes in this room, Clara said softly, to which Betchy smiled. I do believe that was a jest. You must be getting a little more strength, for you have not made jests in a long time. Betchy offered the glass of water once more, but Clara shook her head, declining. You may be right, Clara said softly though I still fear what the doctor is advising is not good for me. Raising her arm above the waterline, she peered at the pricks to her skin where the doctor had bled her. Gulping at the sight of all of the tiny pinpricks, she felt that nausea returning. Perhaps there is someone else we could ask for advice. Betchy leaned forward with the words, her voice taking on a note of breathy excitement. There is one we could tell the true cause of your illness to. After all, who? Clara asked, watching as Betchy sat straight with a smile. Bonadea. Oh. Clara gulped at the mention of the healer. The woman had been kind to offer up her tonics. Clara certainly didn't blame the healer for her sickness, as the healer had warned her most assiduously not to take too much. And she had done it anyway. Do you think she would help? I think it is certainly worth a question. Betchy nodded and stood to her feet, moving to Clara's writing bureau in the corner of the room. I could write to her, she said, picking up a loose sheet of paper. I'll tell her exactly what has happened and explain that you are not getting better very quickly and that we wish for her advice in what to do. What do you think? Clara paused, uncertain for a minute as she brushed one of the soaps over her skin. She was tempted to try and forget ever talking to Bonadea, but that was for the wrong reasons. Such a wish came because she wished to forget all that she had done in order to catch Horatio's eye. I endangered myself for the want of him. 
Oh, how I wish I could forget such foolishness. Pushing the thought away, Clara nodded at Betsy across the room. She wasn't getting better, and if anyone could help her in this situation, then Betsy was right. Bonadea was the person most suited to help them. Yes, Betsy, please do write to her. Perhaps she can accomplish something this doctor cannot. She sighed and looked down at the water. I'm tempted to ask her if she has a tonic to make one forget too. So I can forget all that I have done. She jested, watching as Betsy smiled. I'm glad to see you joking again, Betsy said softly. As am I. Yet Clara felt weak even as she uttered the words. She plunged her head beneath the water, enveloping her body within the warm depths, hoping the muffling of the water would help her to mask her memories. Horatio. My lord, my lord, this is madness. James's voice echoed through the rain as Horatio rode on. Then I'm content to be mad, James, he called back, urging the horse deeper through the trees as he rode up the incline of the hill beside the house. James struggled to follow as Horatio made the horse jump sprawling tree roots and fallen logs, the earth so damp that the hooves would sometimes squelch and nearly disappear into the sods of soil beneath them. Why are we doing this? James called a hid to him, trying to catch his attention. You have been riding for two days straight, and yet you will not tell anyone what is wrong, because I'm ashamed to put it into words. Horatio was not so great a fool as to deny what he was doing was madness. Riding so much would exhaust the horse as well as himself, and on a day like today it was hazardous. The rain pelted down in great streaks between the trees, making the leaves and branches dance together, as if they were raising their branches like arms, shaking them wildly in the air. In the ground, great puddles stretched out. When Horatio's steed clomped into the puddles, Vast globules of water jumped up, splattering Horatio's clothes and face, but he didn't care. He let the dirty water fall upon him until his hair was plastered to his forehead. My lord, James called again, his voice a little distant now. Horatio reached the clearing between the trees at the top of the hill, bringing his steed to a hasty halt. The horse whinnied in surprise, its hooves clomping in a circle as Horatio surveyed the estate. This high up, he could see far and wide across the county. Not only was his father's estate visible, but the neighbouring one was too. The Duke of Gordon's house was grey and murky in the awful weather, though its outline was still visible to Horatio. He cursed as he found his eyes naturally drawing toward it. Well, I am glad we are taking a break. James heaved with the words as he reached Horatio's side. I'm sorry, James. Horatio looked to his friend seeing the state the poor valet was in, half slung across his saddle in a similar state to himself, covered in dirty raindrops. My misery should not be making you miserable too. Eh, it's what happens with friends. James shrugged, unaffected by the idea. I'm happy to suffer a little, though I may complain if we have to ride down the hill so madly again. At his jest, Horatio was glad of the excuse to smile, even if it did not last long. My lord, pray, tell me what is wrong. It's... Horatio's eyes shot to the Duke of Gordon's house. Without having to say a word, James guessed the answer. It's Lady Clara, James summarised for him. It is. Horatio had kept the secret long enough. Up here, where he felt at the top of the earth, pelted and battled by the elements, the words slipped from his lips. I was told I could see her and when I went to see her, I overheard her regretting I ever came home. She wished I was gone again. He hung his head a little, looking down at his wet hand upon the leather reins, gripping it loosely. She hated me. I am certain of it. I find it hard to imagine that lady hating you. James shook his head, evidently not believing it. I can imagine it, all too easily. How have I behaved, James? Appallingly. I flirted with every lady in the county, practically danced with them all too, up to the point that I nearly ignored Clara at some events. I was awful to her. If she cared for me at all, then the rogue I was would have hardened her heart to me. 
Horatio cursed as he lifted his eyes to the house in the distance. It was growing even more indistinct now, as the storm continued to roll in, and the clouds began to block out the house. I have no chance of winning her heart now. For a second there were no words between them. There was only the sound of rain falling on the earth beside them and upon their bodies. Eventually James did break the silence, though his voice was quiet. If you truly care for her, can you not tell her? And say what? Horatio knew it was an absurd idea. She would put me in my place, and rightly so. I fear, James, I have lost the only chance I ever had with Clara. That tightness returned to his throat as the view of her house disappeared completely, becoming nothing but murky grey and fog. Horatio let his imagination wander as he listened to the rain, thinking of how different their lives could have been if when he had returned to the county he had realised what he felt for Clara at once. If he had behaved himself at events and pursued only Clara, what then could have happened? They could be courting by now, riding to places like Corfe Castle every other day, falling into bogs together and ending up entangled as they had done. That familiar heat absorbed his body, reminding him of the stirring he'd felt for Clara. She is not mine, and now she never will be. Let us return to the house, James, Horatio said, turning the horse around. I promise to ride slower. Thank you. James looked anxious as if he wished to return to their conversation, but Horatio did not give him the chance and rode on. He had every intention of returning to his ride the next day, no matter what the weather was. At least up here, he could glimpse Clara's house from a distance and imagine how life could be different. Betchy. It's all wrong, all so wrong. Betchy kept muttering the words to herself, anxiously turning the sealed letter over in her hands. She was always this way, fidgeting constantly, especially when she was worried. Her mother would often tell her off for such things, but Lady Clara never did. She was the truest of friends and accepted Betchy as she was. Oh, my lady, the world should be kinder to you. The whispered words kept coming, as if they were pleas and prayers to God himself for help. Despite what Lady Clara had said many times of how it was her own fault she had made herself sick, Betchy still felt the guilt rage. She was the one who had told Clara about Bonadea in the first place. She was also the one who had told her mistress about such tonics as the Belladonna leaves. Had I not told her, then Lady Clara would be well now. She would never have suffered as she has done. Hastening out of the village, she moved to the river that travelled under a stone bridge and meandered past a few large river banks full of reeds. Rushing alongside the bank, Betchy's boots slipped more than once in the damp earth, though she hurried to stand straight again. She wished to deliver the letter fast and return to Lady Clara so she at least had a friend at her side. When she saw the old oak tree, she paused for a minute, staring at the tall tree as it bent over the river its twiggy branches outstretched with the first few green leaves of spring. At last. Moving to the tree, Betchy reached up to a knot within the trunk and pressed the letter inside. The hole was empty, suggesting that Bonadea came regularly to pick up her letters. Leaving the letter in the tree, Betchy stepped back, glancing back and forth to ensure no one had seen what she had done before she began to return to the village. Footsteps sounded nearby and Betchy panicked, hastening up to the stony bridge. She reached it just as the bearer of the footsteps appeared, though they were also on the bridge and the two of them ended up colliding. Betchy! James cried as she fell into him. Oh my goodness! Betchy struggled to stand off him, so startled that she had walked straight into him. He smiled warmly down at her his eyes wide as he helped her to her feet, his hands on her waist. Such heat spread through her skin at that touch. She was certain her whole body turned red. I'm so sorry, I should really look where I'm going. You do not need to apologise for that, he said playfully with a wink. She smiled at his wink, loving the intimacy that could be between them. I am only sorry we have not seen much of each other as of late as am I. 
She was startled by how easily James took her hand and threaded it through his arm. It was a tender touch, a kind one. At the touch, he led her back toward the village, escorting her. I am afraid I cannot leave my mistress for long at present. She is still so unwell. I am sorry to hear it. James looked genuinely pained. I am sure my master will be sorry to hear it too. He will? Betsy asked, intrigued to hear more about Mr Fitzroy. She was so confused by the man and did not know what to think. Part of her wished to like him, for Lady Clara had been so besotted with him, but another part of her wished to dislike him. Was he not the reason her friend had been quite mad enough to take these tonics in the first place? He is worried for her, I know it. He rides through the rain every day at present, even during the storm yesterday. James grimaced at the words. Truly, Betsy said in surprise. The first couple of days Betsy had been constantly with Clara and hadn't even heard that Mr Fitzroy was waiting in the house for Clara to wake. She'd only heard of that gossip much later. Oh yes, I was quite sodden following him. At James's words, she smiled softly. You do not have to follow him, you know, she reminded, watching as he shrugged. He is my friend. Just as you wish to be with your mistress, I wish to help him, and I worry for him at present. James's words caught her interest and Betsy stared at him. I pray you and I will see more of each other soon, though. As do I, Betsy admitted, smiling hurriedly. Tell me. She paused, thinking on the strange behaviour of Mr Fitzroy. What is it he is so worried about? Lady Clara, James said simply, as if the answer was obvious. He's quite beside himself with worry for her. Betty was startled by it. She had believed Mr Fitzroy could be indifferent to Lady Clara. She'd heard, of course, that Mr Fitzroy had stayed in the house for a long time, hoping to hear news of her, but once hearing she had woken, there was gossip travelling around the staff that he had fled the house. It was almost as if he was avoiding her entirely. I do not know what to think any more. He is. James nodded. I pray she will improve soon, then he may too. As do I. I must return to her. Betty glanced toward the lane in the village she had to take, aware that James held onto her hand still, not wishing to let go. She would have loved to have stayed with him, but now was not the time. She needs me, James. Of course. He lifted her hand to his lips hurriedly and kissed the back, making something in her chest jolt with excitement. I shall see you soon, I hope. It's strange this want to always be near you. I know what you mean. She squeezed his hand one last time, then turned and hurried down the path, heading back to the house. The whole walk, her thoughts flicked from one thought to another. That kiss. Oh, how it feels. What of Mr Fitzroy, though? Should I tell Lady Clara about his mad rides? One doesn't know what to think any more. Chapter 23 Clara He's here, my lady. Who? Clara couldn't sum up much excitement. Over the last few weeks such words might have brought her happiness and hope, but they no longer did. She would prefer to lay in her bed thinking of the persistent headache that would not leave her rather than rouse herself from the bed. Your brother! Betsy's words had a sudden reaction. Clara's head shot up from the glass of water she had been staring into, and she moved to the edge of the bed. The dizziness grew with the movement, and Betsy hurried back from the window, grasping Clara's hand and thrusting her onto the bed again. My lady, you still must take care, Betsy pleaded her tone taking on a note of desperation. Oh, damn this infernal sickness, Clara muttered angrily. I am not getting better very fast, am I? We must wait to see what the healer replies yet. For now, rest yourself. Betsy took the glass out of Clara's hand and placid it beside her on the bed, before urging Clara to rest on the pillows. You said Daniel is here, Clara murmured her eyes darting to the window where Betsy had been standing seconds ago, looking out at the driveway. 
He is. I have just seen him arrive. He must have cut short his grand tour, Betty said, fussing with the blankets and pulling them up around Clara's legs. Yes, he must. Clara chewed her lip nervously, not wanting to think that news of her sickness may have deterred Daniel from continuing with his travels. At the same time, she longed to see him. I shall go and see him, Betchy said, placing a comforting hand to Clara's shoulder. I shall urge him to come and see you. I will also check if any post has yet been delivered. Perhaps there is a chance the healer has replied today. Perhaps. Thank you, Betchy. Clara smiled at the maid. The moment Betchy was out of the room, she slumped into the pillows behind her, and that smile vanished. Raising weary hands, she rubbed her temple, desperately trying to soften some of the ache that throbbed there beneath her skin. Oh, why did I ever do this to myself? It has been days now. Daniel did not take long to appear. Clara could hear him talking with their mother and father downstairs, the muffled panic and the constant questions, before he appeared in the doorway, thrusting it open wide. The moment Clara saw her brother, that smile returned to her cheeks, and it was a full one this time. He stood in the doorway his usual self, though perhaps a little more tanned than Clara could remember. His cinnamon-coloured hair was unruly, along with the patch of facial hair on his chin and upper lip that may have needed a little taming, for they looked tussled by the wind. His eyes were the thing that always captured Clara the most. They were large, dark brown eyes that held warmth to them. Clara, what on earth is happening? he said and bundled into the room. They say you've been ill for days. What's this about you being unable to leave the bed? He broke off as a raft of coughing escaped him. Clara moved to kneel on the edge of the bed as he hurried toward her, grabbing the chair that Betchy had occupied for most of the time beside her. He thrust a handkerchief over his mouth that he coughed into, before sitting beside her and leaning on her bed. Something tells me we should talk of your own illness rather than mine, Clara pointed out, trying to ignore how weak her voice sounded to usual. Once Daniel had gotten control of his coughing, he peered at her with narrowed eyes over his handkerchief before lowering it and stuffing it into his pocket. You and I both know it is merely something I have to live with. Poor lungs, that's what they have always said to me, isn't it? He shook his head, as if he was unbothered by the idea, though Clara knew the truth. Often enough, as they had grown up together, had she seen poor Daniel suffer. When he was very young and the worst coughing fits had struck his body, there had been panic in his eyes, fear that he might not be able to breathe clearly again. These days, he tried to take such things with a pinch of salt, but Clara was not always convinced by his easy shrugs and small smiles. How are you? Clara asked, genuinely wishing to know. Why are you back so soon? You ask me that? Daniel shook his head and leaned toward her, taking her hand in both of his own. I got on the next ship out of France the moment I heard of how you were. They say you have been in bed for days. Is it true? I'm afraid it is. Clara's voice was quiet as Daniel patted her hand, as if praying it would bring her some comfort. The doctor says I'm getting better, but progress does not seem to be fast. I am not wholly convinced by this doctor's methods. Every time he bleeds me, I feel worse. Hardly any great surprise there. I do not think I've ever heard a single person claiming to feel better after being bled. Daniel scoffed at the idea. How do you feel now? I feel... Clara rested back on the pillows, her body weak. She was torn between telling the truth to her brother and keeping some of the worst from him in order to protect him. In the end, those dark eyes staring at her, innocent like a large puppy's, had her giving way to the truth. Abysmal. I tell our mother I can feel my strength returning, but in truth, I still feel weak. I have this persistent headache, my throat is always dry, and I just feel... She sighed deeply as Daniel squeezed her hand. I don't want to be in this bed forever. And you won't be, he assured her, his voice deep. Fear not, Clara, you will be on your feet again.
soon enough. You sound awfully confident, she observed with an interested smile. I wonder if you see the same thing Betsy sees as she looks at me. She stares at me as if I'm at death's door. I've seen my own reflection in the mirror, and I know I am pale enough for it. I wish I could deny it and say you were not as white as a ghost, but I can't. Daniel grimaced. Yet there is something I can tell about you, which lets me know you are recovering. What is that? Clara asked with interest. For one thing, I've never seen you defeated by sickness, Daniel spoke with confidence, his smile growing. When you and I were little, you had a fever one day. I remember it well. Mother kept pushing you back into bed, but you just kept climbing back out of it again. Even when the doctors said you should be sleeping, you wouldn't. You said there was more to do, more to explore. And why should you waste so much time in bed? At his words, Clara blinked, thinking of the girl she used to be. When did I lose that defiance? I've always loved an adventure, and my curiosity often gets the better of me, but the determination to go with it. What happened to that? You are just the same, Daniel said, his voice soft. So I am convinced you will be back on your feet in a day or two. You have even more confidence than my doctors, Clara pointed out wryly. After all of my experiences with doctors, please, do not blame me for not putting much stock in their opinion. He raised his eyebrows with the words, and Clara couldn't help nodding in agreement. Daniel had been advised by many doctors and physicians over the years, but they had done little to help his lungs. We must simply give you an enticement to be out of this bed. An enticement? What sort? Clara asked in interest. I could promise you chocolates, Daniel said teasingly, but I don't think that's enough. A ride to Corf Castle, perhaps. That certainly makes me wish to be out of this bed, she agreed with a slow nod. Yet you are not moving, he grimaced. I know. I shall offer to introduce you to one of my friends instead. A Mr Thornbury. You'd like him very much, Clara. He could be a suitor for you. A suitor? Clara had to stop herself from laughing aloud at Daniel. She squeezed his hand softly instead and smiled as she rebuked him. I'm not wishing for a suitor, Daniel. I have quite accepted that the chances of me catching the eye of a man are slim indeed. There was a pause between them, a beat of silence as Daniel stared at her, his eyes narrowed. What do you mean by that? I mean that I think I have realised I am not very lovable. Clara shrugged, as if it was no great matter. It's something I have to accept, is it not? We must all deal with the hand we have been dealt in life, that is all. How absurd! Daniel stood to his feet at once, releasing her hand. Is that what you think of yourself? It's what I know to be true. Daniel! Daniel! Marianne's voice began to call down the corridor. You are needed. Clara nodded her head toward the door. You must go to her. She has missed you greatly and will long for your company now. Yes, but... Daniel appeared very much as if he didn't want to leave, reaching down and placing his hand on Clara's shoulder. Daniel, Marianne called again. I'm coming, he called to the door, then sighed, exaggeratedly so, for Clara to see and laugh at. There we are. That was a genuine laugh, so at least that is something. With that smile, I hope it will not be long until you are climbing out of this bed. We shall see. Go to her, Clara urged, nodding to the door once more. Very well. Daniel moved to the door and opened it wide, before he hesitated, looking back to Clara. Though believe me, this absurd declaration you just made about not being lovable is not the end of this discussion. What? Why not? Clara protested because I have this thing where I can't let a silly statement end a serious discussion. He shook his head. I simply can't allow it, Clara. I will endeavour to persuade you otherwise. He went out of the door with a smile and must have nearly bumped into Betchy in the corridor, for Clara heard his hasty apology, and it was soon followed by Betchy bursting into the room, waving a letter in the air. She's replied. She's replied, she whispered in a rush. Clara thanked her and took the letter from Betchy's hand,
tearing open the blank red wax seal to read the letter inside. Dear Lady Clara, I am so sorry to hear you are suffering from belladonna poisoning. I do fear it as a tonic, and despite all my warnings, I worry that it is too dangerous a thing to offer people. The risks are too great. I may retire it as a tonic and not use it again. From what your maid has said, it does sound like you are recovering, but here are some tips on recovering faster. First of all, drink plenty of water, even more than you think you need. Once you have a little energy, take walks too, for the fresh air and muscle use will give you renewed strength. There can be continued gastric discomfort and head itches for a while, so I advise a sweet tea or chamomile tea to assist with these. Something I cannot stress more is that if your doctor is bleeding you, pray stop him. It weakens the body. Desist at once, and you may be startled by how fast your recovery can be. Now, my lady, if you will forgive the advice of a stranger, I wish to address another matter. I offer these tonics and remedies to people to assist with women's confidence at times and to help them feel as if they are taking control of their futures. But in truth, no woman needs any of this. You certainly do not need anything I gave you. They are merely a way to buoy confidence, but such confidence should come naturally. I am a great believer in that every woman should be comfortable as they are, happy as they are, for we were all made uniquely. Why should we try to be like any other when we are the perfect versions of ourselves already? When it comes to the matter of men, the above could not be stressed more. Believe me, my lady, that any man who does not notice you as you are, to the point that you feel you need these tonics, is not worthy of your affection. Your true and best partner in life will love you for who you are, not because of orchid perfume or large pupils by using belladonna drops. He is certainly not worth risking your own health for. I pray you will see some wisdom in my words, my lady. I have heard much of you in the village, and I respect you as you are. Pray, do not change for any man. Your friend, Bonadea. Well? Betchy stood beside Clara's bed impatiently shifting between her feet. What does it say? She's right. Clara was quite overcome. Tears sprung into her eyes and she began to wipe them away haphazardly with the heels of her hands. Goodness, she is right. Oh, I already knew it to be true, but to see it written down so, it is a reminder of that truth. I should have always been happy as I am, Betchy. Who cares if that is not enough to earn Horatio's affection? Why am I ever straining to achieve it? Betchy smiled a little at the words as Clara folded up the letter and held it close to her chest. Bonadea had some good advice to share then? Very good indeed. Clara lowered the letter a minute later to show Betchy everything that Bonadea had said. We shall do it all. More water. A little walk, perhaps, if you will permit me to cling to your arm, Betchy. Another bath, too, I think. And most of all, take that bleeding bowl away. Clara waved a hand at the bowl nearby on a sideboard. Part of the porcelain rim was cut out, where the doctor would rest her arm to bleed her. We shall not be using that again. A short while later, Clara was on her feet, though with a little difficulty. The increased water intake had softened the headache, and the bath had helped to freshen her up. When the doctor had arrived, she'd thanked him for his help, but sent him away, much to his own chagrin. Drinking sweet tea had also helped to curb the discomfort in her gut a little. Staring in the mirror, Clara could see the paleness of her skin, yet she didn't poke or prod at her cheeks. Neither did she fuss with her hair and try to get it to behave the way other ladies' updos did with beautiful curls. I am happy as I am. Oh, I am just happy to be alive. She smiled at the reflection, then turned and took Betchy's arm. I fear we shall have to walk slowly, but we will do as Bonadea says, and I shall go for a short walk. Maybe Daniel can accompany me too. I think it an excellent idea, my lady. Betchy led her out of the room, with Clara having to intermittently rest her weight on her maid's arm. I heard your mother talking of an assembly this morning. It is supposed to take place this Saturday. Perhaps if you are up to it, you could attend. We shall see, Clara said with a small smile. 
At the bottom of the stairs, she caught sight of Daniel. He was walking out of the sitting room, carrying a carved conch shell. Yes, mother. You would not believe the size of some of these in Italy. All the gentlemen were bringing them back. He trailed off, no longer glancing over his shoulder to where their mother was in the sitting room, but focusing on Clara on the stairs instead. Clara, you are up. I am. I will not say it is easy, but I am up. She released Betchy's arm, thanking her for her help, and moved to Daniel's side. Would you accompany me for a short walk, Daniel? He took her arm before she even had a chance to take his. I'd love to hear about your travels on the continent and this strange thing. She took the conch shell out of his hand, admiring the way the outer rim had been carved into the cameo of a boat scene. I would love to come with you. Here, lean on me, he pleaded with her and led her toward the front door. As they began to walk, Clara found some renewed strength to the point that she had some hope of attending an assembly after all at the end of the week. As she thought of that assembly, she made one resolution to herself. If Horatio is in attendance on Saturday, I shall steer clear of him. Chapter 24 Horatio, I can't stand this. Stand what, dear? Eleonora's voice shook Horatio. He snapped his head to look at his mother not realising he had spoken the thought aloud. Horatio, are you quite all right? Eleonora asked, eyeing him carefully as she stared up at him. He didn't answer but downed the glass of claret in his hand and looked out across the assembly rooms toward where Clara was standing. I truly cannot stand this. He told himself all day that if she came tonight, he would keep his distance. After all, it was what she wanted. She had told her maid quite profusely how she wished Horatio hadn't come back at all. He was merely giving her his wish and staying away, yet somehow it was more difficult than he imagined it would be. She'd arrived earlier that evening on the arm of her brother Daniel, and since that moment Horatio didn't think he'd taken his eyes off her. There was still a pale pallor to her skin, and he caught her yawning more than once, showing she hadn't completely recovered but there was also something different about Clara this evening. Whoever she spoke to, she never once hung her head or hid. She took part in conversations freely, talked and held her own in discussions. Horatio found himself admiring her from afar, wondering at this new self-confidence and what had been the cause of it. I wish to speak to her. Horatio, Eleonora tried to get his attention as he poured out a second glass of claret for himself. I think our son's mind is rather preoccupied this evening, dear, his father said, appearing at their side. I've just been speaking to the Duke of Gordon. I'm pleased to say that Lady Clara is making a good recovery, so much so they have dismissed the doctor. That is good news, Horatio said, though he didn't look back at his father as he said the words. He kept staring across the room. Clara was in an intense conversation with her brother. Whatever Daniel was telling her had to be amusing, for Clara kept smiling and laughing. It brought back the day riding to Corf Castle, and how she had laughed with Horatio, especially when they had fallen in the bog. Horatio! A hand was suddenly waved in front of his face. What is it, father? Horatio looked up, noting it was Patrick's hand being waved in front of his nose so manically. Good God, hardly any of our words are going in, are they? Care to share why you are so distracted? Patrick glanced at Clara across the room. Or shall I just hazard a guess instead? It's nothing, Horatio lied. Then tell me this, why haven't you been to see Lady Clara this week when you could not part from her side for two days after she swooned at the ball? Patrick asked. Shh, Horatio pleaded, looking around. The assembly room was busy, and though they occupied but a corner of it, for Horatio was forming a habit of reaching for the claret decanter this evening, people still stared their way. Horatio didn't miss how the ladies he danced with in the past kept staring at him, some with hope. He had no intention of satisfying their hopes this evening. There's only one lady I can imagine dancing with, and she would certainly not dance with me. People can hear you when you talk so loudly, father, you do know that. 
Horatio said, gulping from his claret glass. That's enough of that, I think. Patrick took the glass from him. Father. Horatio was about to protest, but Patrick held up his hand, the palm faced out. I know, I know. You're old enough to decide when you're in your cups or not, yet you're still my son. I'll gladly tell you when you've had enough. He put the glass on the drinks table behind them. Now will you tell us what is wrong? I cannot get two words of sense out of him, Eleonora insisted at Horatio's side. He just keeps falling silent. He's off in his own world. He's away with the fairies, as my mother used to say. Horatio didn't rise to the bait, for he was too distracted. Across the room, Daniel seemed to be introducing Clara to someone, a gentleman that Horatio knew. Horatio was stunned to see Daniel had returned. He'd heard from his parents that Daniel had intended to spend considerably more time on his grand tour across the continent. Knowing of the friendship between Daniel and Clara, Horatio presumed it was Clara's sickness that had called him home again, out of concern for his sister. Horatio's thoughts didn't last with Daniel for long. He was busy thinking of the man that Daniel was introducing his sister to. Mr Thornbury was a man of good business and fortune, a respectable enough man that Horatio had met on more than one occasion. Yet at this moment in time, Horatio thought him a devil. Why is she smiling so much at Mr Thornbury? He's hardly funny or amusing. He's not even handsome. If she dances with him, she'll be sorely disappointed too. The man has as much elegance as cattle on ice. Yet as Horatio watched, Clara seemed very interested in her new acquaintance. Mr Thornbury was attentive, offering up a glass of champagne to her, and when Daniel departed, he even offered his own arm so that Clara could rest on him if she felt a little weak. That should be my arm she's holding on to. The thought cut through Horatio so much his breath felt stolen from his body. I cannot watch this. Horatio muttered. Watch what? Eleonora asked, her tone growing more and more impatient. Goodness, I swear it is like trying to talk to one of your greyhounds, Patrick. He's just about as communicative. I think I can guess why. Patrick's eyes followed Horatio's own staring across the room. Why aren't you talking to your friend, Horatio? Lady Clara? She has found someone more interesting to talk to, Horatio explained his eyebrows raised high as he watched Mr Thornbury lift Clara's hand to his lips and kiss it. No, I can't do this. Horatio turned away. What on earth is happening now? Eleonora cried, following him as he left the drinks table and crossed the ballroom. I must leave. Now, Horatio insisted. I will send the carriage back for you both later. No need. We will come with you, Patrick answered, before Horatio could put up a fuss. He would have rather stewed in his anger in silence in the carriage, but it was not to be. Instead, as he pulled on his frock coat, he suffered constant questions from his mother about why they were leaving. In the carriage, Patrick took Eleonora's hand, trying to calm her questions. As on the opposite bench, Horatio sat forward, his head in his palms. He stared at the shadows on the floor of the carriage as the lanterns swung over their heads with the movement of the horses. Goodness, what will our hosts think? Eleonora said after managing just a minute of silence. I will write to them tomorrow and explain we were taken ill suddenly and had to leave. Do not worry about that, Patrick said with ease, though Horatio could feel his father's eyes upon him, watching him closely. All the ladies, Horatio, They'll be very disappointed not to dance with you tonight, Eleonora went on. Let them be disappointed. I think our son only thinks of one lady, dear, Patrick explained, to which Eleonora frowned, looking his way. Who? she asked, a look of innocence on her face. Lady Clara, Patrick said, as if it were obvious. At hearing Clara's name, Horatio sat back on the bench, lowering his hands from his face and sighing deeply. That's nonsense! Eleonora shook her head. I've heard Horatio declare he would never consider Lady Clara more than any other lady. He dismissed the idea of courting her when I mentioned it. I know how he feels on the matter. Then I would suggest his feelings have changed, 
Patrick said succinctly, and stared at Horatio, waiting for him to say something. Horatio, is this true? Eleonora asked. I do not wish to speak about anything at this moment. Horatio was aware it was petulant to refuse to answer, but his mind did not know what else to do. He was too absorbed in thinking of the way Mr Thornbury had kissed Clara's hand and how it had hurt him, cutting him deep in the chest. I remember that look, Patrick said, a lightness to his tone as he looked at Eleonora at his side. I had it the night I saw you dance with another, he said to his wife. It was the same look of jealousy then. Jealousy? Horatio murmured the word aloud, knowing it was exactly what he felt. You're jealous? Eleonora murmured in surprise, but Horatio didn't answer, and his mother didn't press further. They all fell into silence, and Horatio turned his eyes to stare out of the window into the darkness of the night. As they rode on, something became very clear to Horatio, the reason why he was so jealous of Mr Thornbury offering something so small, such as a kiss to the back of Clara's hand. God's wounds. I am in love with Clara. Betchy. He's here, Betchy murmured to herself as she saw James waiting for her on the bridge at the edge of the village. Since the day they had bumped into each other on this bridge, they would often make excuses to their master and mistress in order to leave the house and see each other if only for a few minutes on this bridge. As Betchy ran up, James waved eagerly at her. I thought you might not come he confessed, reaching for her hand as she stopped beside him. I thought I might not be able to get away, Betchy agreed as he took her hand and kissed the back. She grew distracted, thinking of that kiss and the way his lips had brushed her skin. I... she trailed off. Too distracted. He teased her and kissed her hand a second time. A little. She giggled and glanced over her shoulder looking to the village in case anyone was looking their way, and noted that he'd given her hand a second kiss. I'm sorry. I was going to say I thought I couldn't get away, for Clara seems eager to talk these days. She's doing much more than she used to. What do you mean? James asked as he looped her arm through his own and led her down off the bridge so they were walking together. She's riding more again, Betchy said with a smile, glad to see Clara's strength returning to her. She's also developed an interest in baking. We made some cupcakes a while ago, and she found she enjoyed it, so is now pestering the cook to teach her some things. She's enjoying it, but she barely takes a breath to rest. I only managed to get away today because she has a visitor. Mr Thornbury has called on her. Ah, uh, has he? James grimaced at the words. You know the man? she asked in interest. That is a difficult question to answer. James smiled a little. I have never met the man myself, but having heard my master complain about the gentleman so much these last few days, it's as if I do know him. Mr Fitzroy complained about Mr Thornbury. Why? Betchy asked in surprise. Can't you tell? James laughed with the words. Betchy, Mr Fitzroy is completely besotted with Lady Clara. Never has a man been more lovesick as I have seen him these last few days. He even admits he used to like Mr Thornberry, but not since he saw him with Lady Clara at the assembly on Saturday. You'd think the two are perfect enemies now. Betchy had stopped walking. Pulling on James's arm, he halted too, turning back to look at her. Betchy! What is wrong? he asked, a note of concern in his voice. Besotted. You called him besotted? She shook her head, baffled by the idea. Yes, would you like me to say it again? He teased her. James, why has he never said anything to Lady Clara? That would be because he overheard a conversation that you and she had together once. Hearing he was not wanted, he's quite in despair. James pulled Betchy forward, so they were walking once again arm in arm. Betchy went willingly, glad of his touch, though she was still reeling. How is this possible? I thought he was indifferent to Lady Clara, Betchy said, her voice growing animated. No, besotted. There, I have said it again. James chuckled at himself. It's a shame she cannot look at him in the same way, 
especially when I was so convinced that she did. James, you do not understand. She does. Her voice was firm. I beg your pardon? James's laughter died and a deep frown set on his forehead. You mean she... He trailed off, placing a hand to his chest beneath which was his heart. Yes, Betchy said with eagerness. Good Lord, she has wished to give her heart to Mr Fitzroy for goodness knows how long. Whatever conversation your master overheard, he cannot have caught all of what she had said, or he would know the truth. Oh, this is mad, all quite mad. Betchy released James's arm and marched up and down the riverbank for a minute, thinking of all the confusion that had gone on. Is it possible that all this time they cared for one another after all? Clara never needed to use anything from Bonadea. She already had Mr Fitzroy's heart. Betchy, pray, stop walking and turn to look at me a minute. James moved to take her shoulders, spinning her to face him. You mean that what has arisen between them is nothing but confusion? Yes, Betchy said loudly once more. Oh, I cannot believe this muddle they are in. If only the healer knew how to make a tonic to encourage people to tell the truth instead, then maybe there would not be all this confusion. What did you say? James released her shoulder and folded his arms across his body. Hmm. Betchy pretended disinterest, realising just what words had escaped past her lips. Do not tell him about Bonadea. I cannot, or Clara's secret will truly be out there for good. Betchy. James tilted his head to the side, watching her closely. What healer are you speaking of? No one. You are hiding something, he observed, playfully waving a finger at her. Maybe a little. She chewed her lip and turned away. Oh, that is not important, James. What is important is the confusion here. Lady Clara loves Mr Fitzroy, and now you tell me that he loves her too, yes? I do not think a man could be more in love unless you have another explanation for why a man would go riding through storms just to hover at the top of a hill and look at Lady Clara's house from a distance, James said with a smile. We have to do something, James. We must do something. But what? James asked, shrugging his shoulders. I do not know how you will persuade my master to believe Lady Clara cares for him after what he heard. Well, there is one way to persuade him. Betchy tried to calm herself as she took James's hand. There is something you should know about what Lady Clara and I have done. Chapter 25 James Sir, there's something I really need to talk to you about. James was itching to speak, though it seemed to be getting him nowhere. He'd followed Mr Fitzroy on another of his mad rides, this time through the early morning dew around the estate and back to the house. Mr Fitzroy was now trying to distract himself by throwing his focus onto his father's tenants. Having hidden himself in the study, he was looking over the papers for a plan for new cottages, and he barely seemed to take notice of what James was saying. Hmm, Mr Fitzroy murmured, looking through the papers. I'm sorry, James. I'm not very good at giving my attention to any one place today. I admit, I'm distracted. He raised a hand that bore an ink-dipped quill, managing to get the ink across his chin by accident. James tapped his own chin to show what he had done, prompting Mr Fitzroy to wipe at the ink stain. I'm useless at the moment, aren't I? No, sir, but there is something I really have to talk to you about. James walked around one of the desks, coming closer to Horatio. He could scarcely believe all that he had heard from Betchy about Lady Clara's hiring of the healer, Bonadea, and the belladonna poisoning, yet it all added up. James's greatest fear now was that Mr Fitzroy wouldn't believe him. In all the years James had worked for Mr Fitzroy, he had great respect for the man, but he had foibles and flaws the way any human did, and Mr Fitzroy could certainly be stubborn at times. Once he'd set his mind on a certain opinion, it was not easy to shift it, and James feared this would be one of those times. If Mr Fitzroy was so convinced Lady Clara wanted him gone, how was James going to persuade his master that this wild tale of using tonics for confidence and beauty was true, all just to get his attention? I have a story to tell you, and though it may sound mad, please believe me, it is true, James pleaded with his master. 
You offer tantalising interest, Mr Fitzroy said with a smile, though he turned his eyes back down to the papers in front of him. Go on. Well, James paused, wishing he had his master's whole attention, though he was uncertain how to accomplish it in that moment. It's about... Ah, Horatio, there you are. Lord Adlington's voice disturbed their conversation. James turned to greet the Baron and bowed deeply, who nodded his head in return. I'm glad you're here, Horatio. I wish you to come and look over the site for the new cottages with me. Yes, of course, father. Horatio was already on his feet. James watched, struck by a change in his master. Mr Fitzroy always used to be a man who could raise his head, meet anyone's gaze, but not these days. He had a habit of letting his chin sink. Has his confidence dwindled? Remember, Horatio, these are the matters a baron must attend to, Lord Adlington was saying with clear and plain tones as he collected some of the paperwork from their desks. A baron must see to his tenants and always put them first. Yes, father, I know. We'll talk of other things as we ride too. What house you will take, or if you intend to stay here for a while? The baron urged Horatio to follow him to the door. What wife you will choose? As the words faded away, James watched his master's back, noting the moment a wife was mentioned. Mr Fitzroy's head dropped down further. This is absurd! James turned in a frantic circle, not knowing what more to do. Every opportunity he had to speak to Mr Fitzroy about what he knew had passed him by, and he wasn't even convinced if he did manage to tell the tale that Mr Fitzroy would believe him. He may dismiss it as the work of Betchy and I trying to set up our masters. Ah, what do I do now? James's eyes fell on a blank sheet of paper on the desk beside him and the quill that Mr Fitzroy had left unattended. It offered up an idea to James, a way to speak to someone who may just be able to help him. This healer claims to be some sort of master in confidence, does she not? If she knows how to conjure such things and stir love in another, perhaps she's wise enough to offer a solution now. Glancing back to the door to make sure he was not disturbed, James took a clean sheet of paper and began to write, moving the quill quickly as he worked. He wasn't convinced what he was doing was the right thing to do, but with no other options, he certainly needed some advice. At the very least, perhaps the healer could offer up a tonic or something to Mr Fitzroy to help him cope with his heartbreak. James pored over the letter for some time, aware that his handwriting was not the finest, but it would do for a situation such as this. Dear Bonadea, I write to you today to beg of your help. I know an acquaintance of mine enlisted your help recently, Lady Clara, but it is for her suitor that I now require your assistance, or would-be suitor, my master. Suffice it to say, a terrible confusion has taken place. As Lady Clara wished to impress the heart of my master, he has already been falling for her regardless of any endeavour she may have made. In truth, from what I know of my master, I believe he always cared for her, though he denied it to himself. It is only now he believes she is beyond his reach that he has realised what he feels for her. If you could see the pain that I see him in, I know you would do something to help. I've watched the man ride wildly atop his horse, staring into the distance, stoically refusing to show any emotion, even as a muscle ticks in his jaw, betraying the truth of what he feels. He is a man heartbroken, though he is not one who would readily talk of it. He believes Lady Clara is not just indifferent to him, but actively wishes him gone. Some scraps of conversation he must have overheard and misunderstood, but I fear if I tell him the truth of how Lady Clara feels, he will not believe me. Betchy tells me you have been consulted many times on such matters. You may be a wise woman, one who knows about healing properties and tonics, but you also know the ways of a person's heart and happiness. I find myself begging of you now, Bonadea. If you know of any way to resolve this situation, anything I can do for my master, anything I can offer to him to calm the storm raging in his heart, please tell me of it. They both deserve their chance to be happy, if only we could show them that it is within their reach. Yours, etc., Mr. James Newby. 
Sealing up the letter, James made a quick decision. It was bold of him to do such a thing, but he truly did want his friend to be happy, and it was worth the risk of sending a letter if it could produce some sort of help. Pocketing the letter, he stood to his feet and left the room. Hurrying to the hall, he pulled on his frock coat and left through the servant's stairwell, down and out of the kitchen door. It was around this time that he and Betchy would often try and meet, down by the riverside over the bridge. Hastening out, he pulled his frock coat around his shoulders, finding there was a chill in the air, despite the springtime flowers that were showing through the earth. The rainy weather had not gone yet, and he feared it might not pass for some time, as he found himself growing increasingly wet, thanks to a damp mist that swept across the village. On the bridge, Betchy was waiting for him. She hurried toward him, her happy smile making his heart race, before he pulled out the envelope from his pocket. Betchy, I'm afraid I must ask something of you. Please, would you give this to the healer you told me about? I think it could help us to resolve this situation. Betchy. What to do? What to do? Betchy kept murmuring these words to herself as she returned to the house with the letter James had given to her in the pocket of her reticule. She knew the moment she had said goodbye to James, she could have cut back and left the letter in the tree for Bonadea to find, yet there was something niggling at Betchy, something that prevented her from doing so. Maybe there is one more thing I could try first. Hurrying into the house through the servant's door, she pulled off her pelisse, but still clung to her reticule as she walked the corridors of the house. It wasn't long until she found where Lady Clara was. She could spy Lady Clara through the open door of the parlour. Lady Clara was sitting with Mr Thornbury and Daniel, talking freely. She has more colour to her these days. Betchy was glad to see the change, for Lady Clara seemed to be improving daily. There was more to her change, though, rather than just her health. Over the last few days, Lady Clara did not hang her head so much as she used to, and Betchy was glad to see Lady Clara enjoying herself. She went riding at almost every opportunity, and this new interest she had developed in baking had certainly surprised them all. I enjoyed making those cupcakes, not that I ever wished to make that particular recipe again. That was what she had said to Betchy when she donned an apron and stepped into the kitchen to ask the cook if she would kindly show Clara how to bake a few more things. Even now, as Lady Clara sat in the parlour with their guest, Betchy could see they were eating a new lemon and poppy seed cake that Lady Clara had made that morning. Her brother kept singing her praises for the baking, as did their guest, Mr Thornbury. You are quite skilled indeed, my lady. Mr Thornbury said kindly as he took another slice of cake. It is a pastime of yours, then? Baking? A recent one, Lady Clara answered. I find I enjoy it and wish to do more things that I enjoy. She smiled a little with the words. I've come to the opinion that a lot of young ladies in our society do as we think we should do. We turn up at assemblies and balls with smiles and feathers in our hair. We know how to dance and maybe a few of us know how to play instruments too, yet I wonder how much of that we all truly enjoy. I think we should make more time to do the things we truly wish to do. Impressively said, my lady. Mr Thornbury seemed quite taken with Clara. The fair hair brushed back from his forehead revealed eyes that never seemed to stray far from her. Any other time, Betchy would have been glad to see her mistress admired so much by a gentleman, but now... It gave her little happiness, not when she knew the gentleman Lady Clara truly cared for. Also cared for her too. I just need to persuade her of the case now, for if I merely tell her what James said, she may think I was merely saying it to make her feel better. How can I show her it is the truth? Betchy clung to the reticule in front of her, in which the letter was hidden. Feeling bold, she stepped up to the parlour door and knocked lightly. Ah, Betchy, you are back from your walk. Lady Clara smiled the moment her eyes fell on Betchy in the doorway. My apologies for the intrusion, my lady, Mr Thornbury, my lord. She curtsied to Mr Thornbury and the Duke's son in turn. No need to apologise, Mr Thornbury assured her. I was about to depart anyway. 
My friend, it is good to see you home again. He first said his goodbyes to Lady Clara's brother, who coughed a little and excused himself, saying he needed to fetch a tonic for his lungs. As Mr Thornbury hovered in the door of the house, he shifted his focus completely to Lady Clara and took her hand. I have greatly enjoyed seeing you again, my lady. Betsy tried to give them privacy and pretended interest in a painting nearby, though really she was watching avidly out of the corner of her eye. She observed as Mr Thornbury raised Lady Clara's hand to his lips and kissed the back. The kiss was given with admiration and tenderness, yet Lady Clara had no pinkening to her cheeks, neither did her lips flicker into a smile. I know what it is like to have your hand kissed by a man that you care for. Your heart races, your cheeks blush, and a smile is impossible to fight. It was not difficult for Betsy to draw the conclusion that though Lady Clara might respect the gentleman before her, she was not excited by him. She wished Mr Thornbury goodbye, then closed the door behind him, before turning to Betsy. Did you enjoy your visit, my lady? Betsy asked, trying not to sound too eager about the answer. Yes, um, well, Mr Thornbury is very pleasant company. The words sounded a little forced to Betsy's ear, but she did not comment on it. Daniel was keen to introduce us, and he was right in many regards. Mr Thornbury is kind, well-respected, and attentive. She seemed thoughtful at the idea as she walked into the sitting room with Betsy hurrying on at her tail. Yet that is all, my lady. All? Lady Clara repeated in confusion. I mean to ask, do you feel anything for the gentleman, my lady? Betsy asked as she tightened her hold on her reticule. Because if the answer is no, then I have something very important to tell you. Chapter 26 Clara Daniel, may I talk to you, please? Clara hung by the door to the billiards room, watching as her brother bent over the table, practising his skills as he fired the cue at another ball. He'd spent hours in this room the night before with their father, and Clara had been happy to hear the laughter coming from it. Today, Daniel practised alone. Of course. Daniel knocked one of the balls into another, sinking it into a pocket at the edge of the table, and beckoned Clara inside the room. She made a point of closing the door behind them, to which he smiled softly. If you're closing the door, then you must be about to share secrets. His face paled a little as he turned and coughed. Clara felt a tightening in her chest as she hurried to the billiards table, placing her hands on the wood. It was the same feeling whenever she saw Daniel suffer with his lungs. He shook his head at her, his silent way of assuring her he was well enough as he reached behind himself to lift a glass of colourless liquid to his lips. What is that? Clara asked, as Daniel wrinkled his nose, clearly not liking the scent of what he was drinking. Do not ask. It is the latest remedy from my most recent physician. He rolled his eyes with the words. Who knows if it works or not? He lowered the glass back down to a small table beside him, seemingly content that the liquid had done its job for now. Something tells me Daniel needs a different sort of healer. Perhaps some day he'll find someone better suited. So, Clara, you have closed the door and must wish to discuss secrets. What secrets do you wish to discuss? Daniel asked as he pocketed another of the balls. I wish to discuss your friend, Mr Thornbury. Clara had thought long and hard all night about how to have this conversation. Above all, Mr Thornbury was a kind and decent man. She certainly didn't wish to hurt his feelings. But she also knew deep down that he was not a man she could give her heart to. Go on, Daniel encouraged her, laying down his cue to the table. He is kind, Clara began softly, yet that is all I truly think of him. Thank you for the introduction between us. It was certainly a diversion when I was recovering, but... She paused, trying to choose her words carefully. He does not make your heart beat faster, eh? Daniel beat her to it, and she nodded softly. For that, I cannot blame you. Do you have your heart set on another? No. Clara shook her head quickly. Maybe once I did, but not any more. The image of Horatio came into her mind, 
and she did not know what to think. She thought briefly of his laughter and the way he had taken her hand, entwining their fingers together before they danced. Then she thought of how he had happily talked about nearly every respected lady in the county being his wife, before her. I do not turn Mr Thornbury's attentions down because I have another suitor. I do it because I fear Mr Thornbury is not the right suitor. I fear that I have spent too long trying to be someone I am not. With Mr Thornbury, I am still not completely myself. I would like to find a suitor who I will always be myself with without hesitation. Now that is something to admire indeed. Daniel sat down perching on the edge of the billiards table as Clara came to stand beside him. You admire me for saying that. Clara laughed at the idea. I have been in France and Italy. Daniel laughed at the idea. There, love poems and odes are ten a penny. It makes a nice change not to hear someone be carried away by the notion of love, but to think of love in relation to one's own happiness. At his words, Clara blinked, for she could not remember a time Daniel had spoken so openly of such heartfelt matters. You should always be happy with who you are, Clara. Never try to be someone you are not. Thank you, she whispered softly. Will you explain my position to Mr Thornbury for me? Happily, Daniel nodded as he stood to his feet and reached for the cue on the table. If in exchange you play a game with me, he offered her the cue. Me? I haven't played this game in years, she protested. When you and I were young, we thought the idea of the game was to hide the balls so father couldn't find them. Gosh, I'd forgotten that, Daniel said with a laugh. The butler wasn't best pleased to find one in his hat one day, was he? Clara laughed with him, shaking her head. Well, do you wish to learn to play properly this time? Clara didn't think about what the other ladies in the ton would consider of a lady learning to play billiards. She only though of how much fun she could have with her brother, doing something she wished to do. Very well, teach me to play, she said with vigour and took the cue from him. Then be warned, for I intend to play to win. Daniel laughed deeply and showed her the ropes. To his dismay, she kept to her word. About an hour later, she won the game and he insisted on a rematch, but his cough got the better of him and he had to take a rest. Clara promised they would have that rematch soon, though as she left the room she kept looking at her brother and the way he sipped the foul-smelling liquid, clearly with some desperation that it would help him. Daniel needs help. If only there was a way to find someone who could truly help him. Horatio. James, I am well aware I deserve this, Horatio muttered as he followed James through the woodland, heading toward the village. After all, I've dragged you out on horse rides through forests and up hills in storms. It makes sense for you to take vengeance dragging me out at night when it's this cold and wet. He wrapped his frock coat tightly around his chest and folded his arms, trying to keep his body dry from the heavy rainfall. Yet will you tell me at least why we are doing this? It's a little hard to explain, James said, calling back to Horatio. It's fair to say I did something bold, sir. How bold? Horatio asked with interest, catching up to his valet as they left the woodland and passed through the village. There were still a few people wandering about, and some men heading to the local inn. Horatio nodded to them in passing, hastening to follow his valet. James, how bold! He prompted him on when he had no answer. I have arranged for you to meet someone. Who? Horatio asked. A woman. At the words, Horatio spun on his heel and walked back the other way. Not that kind of woman. James laughed and grabbed Horatio's arm, pulling him back in the direction they had first been walking in. I believe this woman may be able to help you. She's a healer from the village. You do realise that what I suffer from is my own damn foolishness and self-pitying. I do not think a healer can do much for that. Maybe she'll tap me round the head and tell me off for what I have done. But that's about it. I could not blame her for it. Horatio huffed and walked on, curious as to why James thought seeing a healer would help him. 
I know I have not been myself lately, but what else am I supposed to do? Horatio had felt quite trapped. He knew what he felt now, but he was unable to speak of it. He had lost the only woman he had ever loved because he was too blind to see what he felt for too long. Trust me, sir, James pleaded, pulling Horatio along the bridge at the edge of town. Here the candlelight and lanterns from the streets fell away, and the only thing that lit their path was the dull moon, half hidden by the low clouds that were shedding their raindrops. The healer might be able to give some advice, something to at least make you feel like yourself again. She must be a miracle worker then, Horatio muttered. James, why are we trailing out in the middle of the night to see this healer? You do not need me to tell you it sounds a little odd to meet someone in the middle of the night, in the middle of nowhere too. She wished to meet you. I wrote to her, and she sent me a reply. She said if she was to make a tonic for you, she had to meet you and hear from your own mouth what your sufferings were first, James said hurriedly, walking ahead to where the river bent round a bank of reeds. Wonderful! Talking aloud of pain. Yes, that sounds just like what I wish to do, Horatio said wryly. James glanced back in his direction, and he supposed it was a droll look his valet offered him, but Horatio couldn't see the look clearly in the feeble moonlight. At the edge of the bank, James froze. She's here, he whispered frantically back to Horatio. Horatio reached James's side and paused too, peering ahead. There was a cloaked figure standing beneath a vast oak tree. He supposed the figure could have been sheltering from the rain beneath the branches, but the long shadows made the figure almost ghostly. Well, that's not creepy in the slightest, Horatio pointed out with a narrowed look in James's direction. Please just trust me, sir, James begged and gestured to the figure. Go and talk to her. Well, Horatio had to admit he was curious, and maybe that was getting the better of him. He turned to argue with James one more time, only to find James had shot off and was now back across the bridge. I knew you were creeped out too, Horatio muttered, before breathing deeply and turning to look at the cloaked figure. She was clearly aware he was there, for she faced toward him, though her hood was so low he couldn't see her face. Slowly he walked toward her, fearing this could be the most foolish thing he'd ever done. Why will the healer not show her face? He pushed the thought away as he considered she could have worn the vast dark cloak to hide from the rain. Good evening, Horatio said uncertainly as he approached the woman. In truth, I don't know why I'm here he began to ramble, not knowing what else to do. James, my valet, he is the one who wrote to you, apparently. He seems to think you could help me. What do you need help with? The lady's voice was deeper than he had expected it to be. At first he thought she could have been putting on a voice, then dismissed it as his own paranoia for meeting someone out in the dark and in the rain who refused to show their face. Pain, he admitted, the word coming from his sharply. I have made errors and done foolish things. The cloaked hood of the figure turned her head to the side. It was a silent encouragement for him to go on. It concerns a friend of mine, my dearest friend. He paused, finding himself swallowing around a sudden lump in his throat. Clara. The figure took a step forward. Horatio's eyes snapped up toward her as the woman revealed a gloved hand from the long sleeve of her cloak. Between her fingers, was a letter that she proffered toward Horatio. Take it, she urged him. He moved toward her, his feet slipping on the oak roots and took the letter. I sent this to Lady Clara after she enlisted my own services to try and impress you. Horatio froze. The letter hung loosely in his fingers for a second. Could it be possible? Read it the woman encouraged, her voice deep once more. Horatio unfolded the letter, trying to shield the ink from the raindrops that fell over his head. At first, his heart swam to read of what the true cause of Clara's illness was. It was Belladonna. She poisoned herself, oh good Lord. Then other things came into focus from the letter, and certain phrases leapt out, grabbing hold of Horatio, as if those words had little hands of their own. 
I am a great believer in that every woman should be comfortable as they are, happy as they are, for we were all made uniquely. Why should we try to be like any other, when we are the perfect versions of ourselves already? When it comes to the matter of men, the above could not be stressed more. Believe me, my lady, that any man who does not notice you as you are, to the point that you feel you need these tonics, is not worthy of your affection. Your true and best partner in life will love you for who you are, not because of orchid perfume or large pupils because of belladonna drops. Pray do not change for any man. Horatio felt that lump more strongly in the back of his throat now, as he nearly crumpled the letter between his fingers. She never had to change. The words fell quickly from his lips. I never wanted her to. Yes, you're right. Everything you say here is right. Any man who didn't notice her is not worthy of her, yet I did notice her. I saw her every day. I fell in love with her more every day, yet I was too blind to realise what it was. I thought too much of how some friends have ruined their friendship forever by courting. It was fear that stopped me, not a lack of loving her. He broke off sharply, noting that the healer had said nothing. The cloaked figure merely stared back at him. No wonder she must want me gone from her life. How can I blame her after reading this? He asked, his voice quieter this time. I love her, and yet I have lost her forever. He stepped back a little from the healer, feeling his heart thrumming his chest, the beats coming fast, one after another. Of course she wished I hadn't come back when I am the reason all this happened. He held up the letter in emphasis. To his shock, the gloved hands appeared from the sleeves of the cloak once more, but she proffered nothing forward this time. She reached for the hood of her cloak and lifted it over her head, revealing the large eyes that Horatio had traced hundreds of times, and the cinnamon-coloured hair he'd seen ride ahead of him wildly when they had explored together. Clara, he murmured her name aloud. He blinked a few times, certain that Clara might disappear at any moment. Your valet gave his letter to my maid, but she realised that only you and I could help one another, and that we did not need Bonadea. She gave me his letter. Horatio. I never wanted you gone. Not really, she said, her words coming fast. It's just that you being here made me mad, Horatio. I was no longer myself. I went to a healer just to help me with my confidence. Is that not a mad thing to do? Clara. Horatio didn't answer her, but stuffed the letter into his pocket and hurried toward her, crossing the last distance between them. He couldn't believe she was here now, saying these wonderful things. He couldn't understand how he'd been so blind to it all for so long. This ends. Now. His hands gently took her chin, and he lifted her head upward. I have always cared for you. The true you. You could have draped yourself in belladonna leaves for all I cared, and it would have made no difference, he said in a rush, watching as she laughed softly. Part of me has never stopped loving you since we were children out riding together. The rest of me just took a long time to catch up and realise what an idiot I had been. Forgive me, Clara. Please. He rested his forehead against hers, needing that moment of intimacy. If you'll forgive me for trying to catch your eye by going to a healer who had tonics. Already done, he whispered, then angled their heads together. Unable to resist, he pressed his lips to hers, longing for a kiss he had imagined now for so long. At once she responded to him, and the way her hands clung to his frock coat was intoxicating to him. He thought of nothing but Clara and elongated that kiss, until an owl hooted overhead and they both parted from one another as Clara giggled at the sound. I think that owl is not used to seeing people out here at night. Well, we all do wild things in the name of love, don't we? He whispered and bent his head back toward her again. That we do. As he kissed her, he listened to the owl hooting once more, but he didn't part from her. He'd wanted this too badly to even think of separating from Clara. The only thing that made him step away from her eventually was the realisation of how he'd been brought here that night. James knew, didn't he, that you were here waiting for me and not this healer, 
he asked in realisation, tipping his head back. Betty may have told him, Clara confessed. That little... Horatio turned, realising his valet had been keeping secrets from him. Clara pulled him back, though, before he could get very far, and he happily went back to kiss her again. I'll deal with him later, he managed between their kisses. Chapter 27 Betchy A sailor's life is a merry life. He robs young girls of their heart's delight. You're singing again, James observed as Betchy took his arm. I can't help it. Look at what we did, Betchy said with happiness and gestured forward through the park. Far ahead of them, Mr Fitzroy and Lady Clara were arm in arm and they didn't show much sign of looking at anyone in the park than each other. It had been the same every day this week since Betchy and James had orchestrated it so that Lady Clara and Mr Fitzroy could meet that night on the riverbank. Since all barriers had been taken down between the pair, they had been inseparable. The day after the meeting on the riverbank, Mr Fitzroy had turned up at the Duke of Gordon's house and asked for his blessing to court Lady Clara. Betchy didn't think she'd ever forget the way Lady Clara pressed her ear to the door of her father's study, trying to listen in, even when Marianne waved her hand at Lady Clara, urging her not to do so. They are happy, Betchy said, sighing with her own contentment, as she stared forward at the pair. I'm delighted for them both. As am I. James smiled with the words. Though I have to confess another source of delight too, for are we not the masters of it all? He teased, waggling his eyebrows as he did so and prompting Betchy to giggly. Ah, it was our doing that brought them together at last, Betchy said with a laugh. Perhaps a little. A little? James shook his head. You would not have said that if you had been the one to drag Mr Fitzroy to the river that night. God have mercy. He did not want to go walking through the rain so late at night. I had to practically drag him out. I can well imagine it. Betchy curled her hand more around James's bicep, watching as his attention was caught by it, and he smiled down at her. We're not doing a very good job of chaperoning the pair of them, are we? she asked, nodding her head forward. Not in the slightest. He shook his head. Yet I do not care much about that, and I do not think they mind either. I have to agree with you there. Betchy smiled as she watched how Lady Clara was with Mr Fitzroy. The two laughed openly together about something, and Lady Clara no longer tipped her head forward when she laughed, but kept her head raised high. Never have I seen her so happy. I've been meaning to ask you, James said slowly, those potions and tonics that Bonadea gave to your mistress, do any of them really work? Work? Betchy wrinkled her nose at the idea, showing exactly what she thought. There is medicine behind some of it. For instance, belladonna drops do make pupils wider, though the effects aren't that beautiful if you ask me. Orchid perfume is a nice scent, but anything else. I did not see how they improved my mistress in any way. All I can say is that couples do not really need them. Lady Clara and Mr Fitzroy certainly didn't. For them, the tonics merely helped them to see what they already felt for one another. Betchy nodded, pleased with her description. I don't doubt that without them, they would have come together regardless. I like that idea. James's smile matched her own in breadth. As we, the matchmakers, have a minute to be alone together. There is something I wish to talk to you about, if I may. Go on, Betchy urged James, turning her focus back toward him to see there was a little nervous suddenly in his manner. He was fidgeting, and there was rigidness in his jaw. Is everything well? Yes, well, I hope so. James seemed to laugh at his own joke, one Betchy did not understand as he pulled her to a stop. Betchy. You and I have been dancing around one another these last few weeks. The words made Betchy a little nervous, and her smile abruptly vanished. Pray, do not look sad yet. I haven't even asked what I'm going to ask. James laughed at the idea. Oh, then do. Say what you have to. Betchy chewed her lip all the same. 
terrified that James one day might no longer see her as she did him. I am tired of sneaking out to see one another, he confessed in a whisper. Though I'm thrilled now our master and mistress are courting, it makes it easier to see one another. I hardly wish our meetings to be always clandestine. Oh, Betchy's breathing quickened as she realised she was so excited by waiting for what he had to say, she could summon no words at all. If I asked for your father's permission, and he approved the match, would you consider a courtship, Betchy? An official one, he explained in a rush, so there are no more hastily grabbed moments on a bridge, and we can see each other as other courting couples do. James? She attempted to interrupt him, but his nerves made him just keep speaking. I can speak to your father soon, if it brings you comfort. Yet I'm getting ahead of myself here. It's just that I... James, she said again. I think that... James! She bent up toward him and placed a finger to his lips, silencing him. The way his lips curled into a smile had her longing to sing again, though this time she held on to temptation. Yes. Yes, he said, speaking against the finger before she lowered it. Yes, she said with more enthusiasm this time. Wonderful! He took her hand and dragged her further through the park. Ha! Huh? Where are we going? To see Mr Fitzroy. I'm asking him for time off to go and visit your father at once. Clara. You're supposed to be looking at the cards, Clara observed, peering over the cards in her hand to see Horatio sat on the other side of the card table, smiling at her. I'm distracted, he said easily. Wonderful. Then I shall win again. Clara declared as she placed down a card and won the hand. I never doubted you would. He threw in his cards and she gathered them together as they both laughed. If you stopped staring so much, you might win a hand. Or two, Clara said playfully to him, watching as Horatio sat back in his chair, not bothered by the idea. I'd rather talk to you, he assured her. We have talked all evening, she reminded him. We are also off to Corfe again tomorrow and we can talk more then. We talk every day. I know, I can't help it. The way he smiled at her made a warmth spread through Clara. I can scarcely believe how much has changed. In the last couple of weeks things had happened fast. Horatio had asked to court her the day after they had met on the riverbank, and since then they had not spent a day apart. At balls and assemblies they danced together, and Clara always promised not to swoon this time. Horatio frequently teased her that maybe it was his dancing that made her swoon rather than the belladonna. Clara did not miss the way Miss Pilkington in particular would stare at her at such events, wondering why Horatio now turned his attentions to Clara. The one time Miss Pilkington had angled for a dance with Horatio since, he'd stated quite clearly that he was courting Clara and took her to the dance floor instead. Never have I been so happy. Clara dealt out the cards for the next hand of whist as Horatio looked around the room. His eyes seemed to dance across their parents, who after their dinner together were in a deep conversation, and Daniel on the distant side of the room, who had fallen asleep in his chair with an empty glass of port beside him. Do you think we can have a minute of peace? Horatio whispered, for there is something I'd very much like to ask you. Relative peace. Clara nodded at their mothers. Those two seem to watch us like eagles these days. That they do. Horatio chuckled in agreement and moved his leg subtly under the table so that it was hidden from the eagle eyes of their mothers. When his calf brushed her own under the table, Clara felt a shiver of delight pass up her spine. Each touch with Horatio now seemed to be full of this same excitement and anticipation. She could feel her blush creeping across her cheeks, even as she raised her eyes to meet his again. My question is about tomorrow, when we go to Corfe Castle. What of it? Clara asked, picking up her cards and trying to focus on them. Do you think there's a chance we could lose our chaperones en route? His question made her drop one or two of the cards. She eyed him carefully as he chuckled and passed some of the cards back into her hand their fingers brushing with the action. Scandalous, she teased him at the idea. 
I do not think James and Betchy will mind the extra time alone, and I like the idea of the two of us being alone up there for a while, for there is another, much more particular question I wish to ask you when we are up there. He paused and smiled at her, that smile so full that her breath caught in her throat for a minute. Does he mean? No, surely not. We have only been courting a few weeks. She dismissed the idea he might ask her to marry him at once, reminding herself that this was the gentleman who once danced with nearly every lady at a ball. He was also the gentleman who had barely left her side these last couple of weeks, always took her hand, and frequently had to be urged to leave the house by her father when he forgot to go home and stayed too late into the night. Do you mean... She cleared her throat, finding she couldn't utter the words. Glass of port? he asked, and reached behind him to the carafe on a separate table and poured out a glass for her. She as good as downed the glass in front of him, glad for the soft burn in the back of her throat to soften her shock. So, what do you say? I'm sorry, she stuttered, now confused as to what he was asking her. Can we lose our chaperones tomorrow, so that I can ask you a great question? He poured out a second glass for himself and topped up her own. Clara smiled as she lifted her glass to her lips, knowing she couldn't resist the idea. Yes, I'm sure we could manage that, she whispered, taking a small sip of her port this time. Thank God for that. He chinked glasses with her before taking a sip of his own. What are you two talking of? Eleonora called across the room, prompting Horatio to roll his eyes. Clara had to stifle her laugh at his reaction. Nothing, mother, Horatio assured her. You two are a courting couple now. You do know we have to watch you closely, she called to them. Like a hawk, Horatio teased in a whisper. They truly do, Clara nodded in agreement. Well, at least no one will be with us tomorrow, he said, offering her a soft wink. We need to be alone for that question. Clara felt her heart thud in her chest as she grew confident that maybe she was right in her hope. If Horatio did intend to ask her to marry him, there wasn't a doubt in her mind as to what her answer would be. Yes. Epilogue Betchy two months later You're singing again. I could hear you from the front path. Lady Clara's voice came from the doorway, urging Betchy to turn in a circle and look to her mistress. Oh, I cannot help it, Lady Clara. I'm all a dither. Oh, will my heartbeat ever be calm again? Betchy turned in a circle, fluttering her hands in front of her face as if they were butterflies. Ha! Come here, my friend. I will help you be calm. Lady Clara walked toward her and caught her hands. Breathe with me. In time, they took three deep breaths together. Now, isn't that better? I am not sure what James would say if you hyperventilated just walking into that church, she smiled, showing she was being mischievous. He might think you didn't want to be there at all. He can hardly doubt what I wish for. Betchy laughed as she released her mistress's hand and looked down at the gown she was wearing. I have been so excited for this. I know it. Lady Clara continued to smile. Our house has been full of your singing for the last two months. I will miss the singing this next month. It will not be long before we are together again, Betchy assured her mistress, watching as Lady Clara waved away the concern. Do not worry for me. No other lady's maid will be as good as you, but it is only a short departure after all. Lady Clara began to play with Betchy's skirt, fanning it out so there were no creases in it. Within a month, Horatio and I shall be married. Then we shall all be under the same roof again. Betty could not wait for the day. Now she was to be married to James. She was to live with him at the Adlington estate for the next month, up until Mr Fitzroy and Lady Clara married, where they were to take a house of their own in the county, and James and Betty would come to live with them both, as their valet and lady's maid. Betty, you look quite stunning. Lady Clara gushed with a deep sigh. She took Betchy's shoulders and turned her to face the mirror, running her fingers through Betchy's fair hair so that the few curls that strayed down from her updo sprung to life. 
Poor James will be rushing through his vows, eager to get them done. Betsy giggled and covered her blushing cheeks. Here, I have something for you. Lady Clara walked round her, lifting the reticule she carried at her wrist. She delved inside and pulled out a small chain bracelet made of gold interlocking links. What is this? Betsy asked. It is for you, a gift on your wedding day. Lady Clara fastened the bracelet around Betsy's wrist. My lady, I couldn't accept. Yes, you could, Lady Clara insisted, finishing fastening the bracelet with her eyes lit up. It's my thank you to you, Betsy, for your friendship. I hope it gives you luck in your married life together. You're so kind to me, my lady, Betsy said, looking down at the bracelet and admiring its beauty. It was finer than any other jewellery she owned, for she could not afford much finery as a lady's maid. She supposed not many ladies and daughters of dukes would give such gifts to their maids, but Lady Clara was different. She had always been different, and a true friend to Betsy. Thank you. She stepped forward and embraced her mistress, who held her back. Now I could stay here and talk of excitement for ages, but I am needed at the church, Lady Clara stepped back. The organist has sore fingers and says she shall struggle to play and the vicar keeps sneezing for all the flowers we have brought into the church. So much to do. I shall see you soon, my friend. Lady Clara waved her goodbye before she hurried out of the room and the small house. Betsy moved to the window of her parents' home, looking out as Lady Clara met Mr Fitzroy at the end of the lane. He must have teased her about running late, for he was waving his pocket watch in the air. In punishment, she grabbed the watch from him, and he began to chase her down the street to get it back, both of them running in the direction of the church. Betty laughed as she watched the two of them go, truly touched by the gift her friend had given to her. Looking down at the bracelet, she began to play with the golden locks, turning them round and round. Soon it will be Lady Clara's wedding too. Betty knew that would be a grand affair indeed, for the Duke would not allow his daughter to marry at any occasion that was less than grand. There was to be a vast wedding breakfast at the house afterwards, and to Betsy's amazement, she and James had been invited as guests, rather than as staff, to attend the wedding breakfast. They are true friends indeed. The gate at the end of the garden path swinging open caught Betsy's attention and she looked up. For a second, she thought it might have been James. So often over the last couple of months she had associated that sound with James coming to see her. He will be at the church. The thought struck her, just as her eyes found the real person that was coming to see her. Stepping through that gate was a young woman, not dissimilar in age to Betsy. Her bonnet was pulled low over her head, masking most of the auburn hair that was beneath. As she lifted her head toward the house, the bright sunlight of the summer morning revealed her full lips and a heart-shaped face. Arabella, Betsy said her name aloud and hurried to wave to Arabella, beckoning her to come inside. Arabella was let in a few minutes later by Betsy's mother and then shown into the room. Arabella, it is so good to see you. Betsy reached out and grasped her friend's hand. Or should I call you by your other name? Pray do not. Arabella laughed off the idea as she took off her bonnet, revealing the full extent of her auburn curls. It's odd enough to see you writing your letters addressing me as Bonadea. Pray do not start to do it in person. Arabella smiled with the words. Bet she knew the truth for all of the good humour that Arabella would show her. She was secretly glad of the pseudonym, for it meant she was allowed to do much of her work unknown to others her identity kept secret. In a world where everyone could be judged so quickly, Arabella had always been keen on secrecy. I am so delighted for you, Arabella said, and clasped Betsy's hand, turning her in a circle so she could admire her gown. You look quite beautiful. Oh, what is this? She halted and admired the bracelet at Betsy's wrist. That is something precious indeed. That is a gift from an old customer of yours, Betsy said with a giggle and held up the bracelet. It is from Lady Clara to wish me well in my betrothal. She is kind. Arabella smiled with the words and admired the bracelet, staring down at it. 
You know, I'm convinced you two would be great friends. You are both fond of good humour and a jest. I wish you would let me introduce you to her some day. Betsy longed to ask the question outright, for she knew how grateful Lady Clara was for Arabella's help. It pains me to keep this secret for one friend and yet lie to another. It was something that often pulled at Betsy's heartstrings. She would never betray Arabella's trust, for she had asked for the secrecy for a reason, but at the same time it was a lie to tell Lady Clara that she had no idea who Bonadea was. The truth was that Betsy and Arabella had grown up knowing each other very well. Arabella was born to a wealthy man, though that fortune had long since vanished. From when Arabella was young, she had wandered out to see those who lived on her father's land, and Betsy was one such tenant with her parents. They had become good friends over the years. Lady Clara would love the opportunity to thank you in person for all your help, Betsy explained, watching as Arabella brushed off the idea. She turned away and picked up Betsy's bouquet from where it rested on a sideboard. I know she is grateful, and that is all that matters. I will admit, when she and Mr Fitzroy wed, I will be sneaking a glimpse from the end of our estate road, a chance to glimpse the couple together. Arabella smiled as she admired the bouquet. Yet secrecy is important. It always will be. That smile took on a sad note, and once more Betsy felt sorry for her friend. Maybe she doesn't have to stay a secret forever. Maybe someday her healing knowledge will help others. It's a shame, for I think you would be great friends, Betsy said as she flattened out the skirt of her gown and turned to the mirror, checking there were no creases, for she was growing near to the time she would have to depart. Maybe someday we will have chance to meet properly, Arabella declared, lifting the bouquet and carrying it to Betsy. Until then, I'll be a silent friend, a quiet one. She winked in the reflection of the mirror so Betsy could see her. Speaking of which, this silent friend of yours best wave you off so you can get to the church. What will your husband-to-be think if you are late to your own wedding? Betsy laughed at the idea, knowing what James's reaction would be. He'd already told her he would wait forever at that altar, if it came to it. She'd laughed at his foolishness and warned him he'd get hungry eventually. He'd joked about eating the wafer and drinking the communion wine then. Yes, I should go, but please tell me you will come to the ceremony, Betsy said, as she held the bouquet out in front of her and moved toward the door. Oh, I... Arabella looked uncomfortable, fidgeting constantly. Please, no one knows who you are. Betsy reached toward her, taking her friend's hand in a plea. If anyone asks who you are, you give your real name, not Bonadea. You can't hide indoors forever, my friend. Please, come to the wedding. When you plead with me so much, how can I possibly say no? Betsy was delighted as she left the room to meet her parents, who were both waiting in their hallway. Her mother was in a fluster, worried they'd be late and her father calmly took her arm and drew her toward the carriage. Betsy waved at Arabella as she left, hurrying toward the church. By the time Betsy had arrived, after she'd calmed down her mother's fluttering nerves, she was in a state of excitement herself, unable to stand still and forever bobbing on her toes at the church door. When the door opened and the organ music began, Betsy's eyes first shot toward her friends in the room. She went to Lady Clara who was smiling back at her ridiculously, with Mr Fitzroy at her side, the two hand in hand. Then her eyes moved to Arabella's, toward the back of the church. Perhaps someday Arabella can find happiness of her own. With this thought, Betsy looked to the altar, where James waited for her. Clara and Horatio found love and happiness. But what about Betsy's wish? Will Arabella find happiness of her own? Read now about Arabella's story by scanning the QR code or click on the link in the first comment. Scan the QR code or click on the link in the description to read the next book in the series. Share this video with your friend or watch on of the following videos. Subscribe to our channel, like this video and hit the notification bell to not miss any new audiobooks. Thank you for watching.